all the delegates and faculty who are here from across the globe. And uh, we started our journey in the year 2014. Each year we kept on hyperfocus. In 2014, it was foot and ankle surgery. This year, our hyperfocus is on London osteotomy course. Uh, we continued our journey except during the period of COVID. And uh, apart from London osteotomy course, we have also arthroscopy session and arthroplasty session. Uh, I hope that this conference would be a grand success and at the end of conference, we will learn something new. And without further delay, I would like to start our scientific program. I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Obisek Das, who would be the moderator for the first session. And also Dr. Ananda Mantel. May I request Adrian to start the program? Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to run this course today and take from the basics right the way through a little bit on history. And we'll have indications, planning, some cases. Uh, we're going to be joined by um, Ronald Rags uh, and uh, Matt Olivier. And Bushan should be here in a minute as well to make up the, the sort of the, the, the talks for today. And when I was putting the slides together uh, last night, I was thinking about all my trips to uh, to India, and I've been here many times now over the last decade, um, and had just the most fantastic experiences in Mumbai uh, with Anant Joshi, um, and um, I went to Delhi. We did some live surgery there. Bushan and myself managed to escape and go and see the Taj Mahal, which was amazing. Um, I even went to Nag Nagpur one of, for one of the meetings. Uh, and then very strange invitation to come to speak at one of the Indian Arthroscopy Society meetings. And it was actually in Thailand. And uh, so we went over there um, to Pattaya. And obviously Sachin, who I think is coming um, tomorrow or the next day, runs that amazing course in Pune. And more recently, we had the, uh, the, the Indian Society meeting down in Coimbatore, which is absolutely fantastic. And what is really interesting about having seen what's evolved over the last decade in India is how osteotomy has really been taken up uh, by you. Uh, uh, and you've taken it to such a high level that all the talks um, and presentations are now at the highest level um, and we don't see that even in the UK. I think you're, you're more advanced than we are in the UK uh, with many of the surgeons mm -hmm. in the UK still behind you and behind the curve. So myself and Ronald and Christian worked together and we f formed a, a center together in London. And uh, Christian comes over. In fact, we were operating yesterday, uh, day, Wednesday together. Um, and um, we do complex and basic cases on a very regular basis, which has really turned out to be um, fantastic for all of us, for our education. And I'm sure many of you will have seen these educational videos that we've, we've run over the years, uh, that we've been running now for quite a few years. This is a, an HTO. It's, it's outdated, but it's still, when I look back in, uh, that was in 2013. Look how many people had, had looked at it and the DFO video. And actually, it was, it was this guy, Neil Thomas, who really said to me, he was a ESCA president and he worked at my hospital in Basingstoke. And he said to me, we have to go and see this guy because he's doing something really strange. And that's Ronald in 2005. And we went to visit him. And from that, we started up the Basingstoke course. Um, we started a course with Matt Dawson in, in, in the northern part of the UK, up in Newcastle. And then we, st we moved to London and we ran our London osteotomy course, which of course, we're sort of bringing here today. Um, so it's myself, Bushan, who's obviously slept in, and hopefully we'll be we with us soon. Um, and it's these guys, really. Rags, uh, who I work with very closely in London full time. He works at Guy's and St. Thomas's. Obviously, Christian beside me here. 
and this man uh, going, this is us in Washington in November, and we travel a lot, and Matt, who will be speaking in a few minutes, he's, he's uh, extremely young to be a full professor in Marseille, he receives people all the time, so if you want to go and see someone doing some really interesting osteotomy work, very academic, um, Matt's um, someone that you should go and visit. So during the pandemic, we thought, how can we, um, how can we make things interesting and interactive with the virtual courses? And we ran this course from the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, and it was logistically interesting to have, uh, I think there was 40 or 50 of us all joining in, Zooming to um, answer questions. And I think education has really moved on now using these uh, virtual formats. But of course, nothing beats face-to-face -face meetings. So osteotomy now, it's standing room only outside the ICLs. Uh, people are really, really interested. And they're interested because it's the absolute key to what we do in the knee. And obviously, mainly we're treating arthritis, but we can use osteotomy to treat ligament instability, and we can use it to improve movement, and we can use it when we're doing our fancy cartilage, meniscus, and other procedures. And in the algorithm of treatment, it's, it's the first thing you should consider. So we need to become experts in this before we become experts in, in anything else. Um, and we really sunk our teeth into osteotomy, and we were all invited to join in this uh, special edition of the KISTA, uh, which won a prize actually at the ESCO in 2014. And we looked at the history of osteotomy, and we broke it down into these three periods. And what's really interesting is, um, if you look back in time, even as far back as Hippocrates, he had this stretching device, this Hippocratic scanum. Um, and we have this gentleman here, who was the father of, uh, of orthopedics in Scotland. Um, and he worked for Lister. He learned about asepsis. And then he went on to do all sorts of things, neurosurgery. But he really enjoyed his osteotomies to the point where in, in, in the late 19th century, he did 1,800 cases, which he wrote up in a book. And you can download that book as a PDF from the internet. It's really, really interesting. So obviously, in that early period, uh, we saw the first of the um, uh, uh, closing wedge osteotomy on the lateral side coming in, popularized by Mark Coventry at the Mayo Clinic with his step staple. But these were quite rudimentary techniques and the indications were really quite wide. There was a high complication rate, and the results were really fairly poor. Um, it then took this gentleman, Giancarlo Pudu, professor from Rome, to invent his fixation plate, the first of the um, angle-stable devices. And then Professor Staubli, together with Ronald and Professor Lobenhofer, went to popularize the Tomafix and really took osteotomy forward. Now, um, one of the problems that we've got uh, with, with what we offer our patients at the moment is this is a common operation, total knee replacement. But there is a low satisfaction rate um, compared to other procedures that we do, with only 80% being satisfied and quite a high number being unhappy with their knee replacements, perhaps as high as 20%. And a paper that myself and Christian uh, uh, always quote, and it's one that I think you need to make your patients aware of, is this paper from Bayliss. This is based on the UK Joint Registry, which has 65,000 patients in this paper, minimum follow-up 10 years. And, and what they found was, if you were over the age of 65, your knee replacement lasted for 20 years, and people did fairly well. If you were under the age of 60, and particularly when you get to 55, the revision rate becomes exponential. And actually, in the under 55s, 35% need a revision within seven years in these massive numbers. And the mean time to revision was four years. So this is something that you really need to tell your patients if you're going down the route of, um, of knee replacement in a younger patient. So osteotomy has really evolved, and it's moved from these very basic techniques to these more sophisticated techniques, and now we have these third generation plates. And the company that we work with most closely now is Nuclip, and they have this um, uh, scientific advisory board, which uh, Sachin's a part of, and the rest of us. 
And together now we have worked on building a family of plates uh, for um, osteotomy, both closing, opening, we have for the ACL, we have for rotation. And so this is the first company really that has embraced um, osteotomy to the point now where they are making tools to make everything um, easier. This will be coming out shortly. This is a little clip-on guide that will allow you to fix your um, osteotomy plate to the bone. It allows you to drill, it allows you to fix, um, and then uh, all in one so that you're not um, having to do some of the temporary steps. And again, all we're trying to do with these devices is make this an easier and quicker operation for everyone. So it's little innovations like this that, that make us work with this uh, company. Now, for many years, um, we've been looking for some guidance. When should we operate? Who should we operate on? And there have been two really important consensus documents in the last two years, one from the UK and one a much bigger consensus from um, ESCA. And this had, uh, uh, was represented from um, all of these countries and really it was Matt and Matt together with RAGS who made this happen. So Matt Dawson, president of the Osteotomy Committee together with RAGS, who um, with Matt went on to build this consensus that really guides you now on what are the indications, who should we do this on. So what we can now say is age and gender are not relevant. It doesn't matter if you're 80, if you're active, you have isolated disease, you have metaphyseal varus, this procedure works extremely well. In fact, Professor Takeuchi from Japan showed in the over 80s a better outcome than in the under 80s in a paper that he, he, he published quite a few years ago now. And actually having a high BMI, obviously technically it's a, it's a little bit more difficult, but this isn't actually um, something that would uh, prohibit you from having an osteotomy. Smoking is not an absolute contraindication. It's a relative contraindication and the patients need to be counseled. Having some disease in the lateral compartment is not a, con a, a contraindication. There was high agreement about this. So if we look at the indications, obviously osteotomy is not for everyone. But in, 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 in individuals where we want to go for a joint preservation procedure, like in this 42-year-old orthotist, um, we know for the isolated disease, for varus or valgus, where the uh, MPT or the LDFA is out and we can correct those um, uh, extra-articular deformities, we can do this operation safely with good results. And we can do it for the slope and we can do it for instability. Now, where do we correct to? And uh, I think still the, the jury is out and we need better answers for this. We currently are aiming to go just beyond the 50% mark. So we're not pushing people into significant valgus anymore. And in fact, in a young patient with very severe varus, where the Michelitz is completely missing, Leaving them very slightly undercorrected may be the way to go. But we're aiming for the midline most of the time now. Um, planning, which we're obviously going to focus on with, with the talks, is absolutely key to determine these two angles, how much metaphyseal varus there is um, and how much of a kink there is in the femur. And it's absolutely imperative that the x-rays are taken appropriately and we have a calibrated long leg x-ray to plan off. And we use the software which is evolving all the time. This is a really old video, this is old software. But it does allow us to use these tools to plan out and work out uh, what the patient's um, lateral distal femoral angle is and what the patient's uh, medial proximal tibial angle is. And this is key to deciding on who should have an osteotomy. And in terms of how we've advanced, we're going to be showing these techniques um, during the live surgery. We've moved from the opening wedge on the femur to the much more stable closing wedge where we're creating an e equilateral triangle, bringing the cortices to bone on bone and that allows us uh, for our patients to have a completely different experience. And many of these patients are healed up within three to four months uh, because of the bone on bone cortical um, fixation. We do a biplane procedure both in the femur and the tibia and again we'll be showing you that later on today. Um, and there's a lovely little drawing from Christian um, showing uh, um, what we're aiming for, which is to find the midpoint. We want to be just above the owl's eye on the, uh, this is a medial approach on the lateral side. We want to have a centimeter or so of hinge, which we protect with a wire. We want to create two um, identical lengths 
that will allow us to get bone on bone cortical contact. It's critical. And we'll go through the steps of that. And we're also going to take you through uh, the steps of, of, of an HTO, particularly focusing on the MCL, avoiding a neurovascular injury, um, and carrying out the cuts, and, um, and where we've evolved to with our practice. And Christian Bushan will be showing that later. So what we don't want to do, and the reason why we're showing a double level osteotomy, is we don't want to say, we're correcting the tibia for varus, we're correcting the femur for valgus, and create huge joint line obliquity in our patients. That will leave you with a bad result. And in fact, here's a patient, these are Christian slides, where they've gone and done an opening wedge, they've created huge amounts of joint line obliquity, MPTA is completely off the charts. We just wouldn't accept that. And we can talk about what we would accept. And this poor patient went on to have an early total knee replacement. So it's really important that we plan properly, we pick out the patients properly, and execute the surgery. Otherwise, they end up with this, and they end up with a bad result. And if you look at double-level osteotomy, the best paper actually ever for results for osteotomy came from Babis. And this double-level paper from a long time ago and they had a 98% survivorship in that paper at 10 years. 96%, uh, sorry, at, at seven years in this paper. Best, but, and again, one of Christian's papers, but it just shows you a typical chap, 38 Varus. Um, he really was struggling, couldn't do any sports. He's gone on to have his double level, which we can do now in 45 minutes, uh, this procedure. Um, and he's back running and enjoying life. Uh, and here's the other extreme a lady struggling to walk, and she's gone on, and she's had her double level. Um, and uh, we're going to show you um, the technique. I don't want to be late for the course. I'm just going to run on because we're going to show you all that in the surgery. I think these cryotherapy devices are absolutely critical because swelling is the thing that drives the pain, um, and it's something that we want to avoid. So with these plates now, you can have faith that you can allow your patient immediate full weight bearing from day one. We encourage people to take it easy for the first two weeks and use a cryotherapy device. And in fact, this is something that we'll be focusing on in the ISACOS meeting in, uh, in, in June, is robotics. And again, um, Christian uh, sent me this lovely video of a, of a robot in action taking over from, uh, from a, a, a barman. And now we have a robotic barman doing something pretty clever. But in fact, at the moment, with osteotomy, the human touch is still something that is driving uh, success. We haven't got there yet uh, with, um, with um, robotics. I think it will come uh, very soon, and I think the robots will be doing the surgery. But for now, uh, it's that human touch that allows us to achieve um, great results. I always like to show Mark Ferguson, who many of you know. He, he ran the education for Arthrex for the last three or four years. He was a very well-known surgeon. And we've just actually taken that plate out. He had some osteophytes catching. I think we did the surgery three or four weeks ago. Mark flew up uh, from Singapore. We took the plate out, and we were thinking about whether he needs something else. But actually, since we took his osteophytes out, he's perfect again. Um, and uh, obviously, we all know this gentleman who amazingly had his osteo osteotomy done as part of live surgery um, in the, in, uh, about 18 years ago. He had, his, um, he had his osteotomy done by Paley as part of a live surgical procedure. And we have Zayed from Jordan, who um, also went for the surgery. So we have, we'll talk today about the indications, the planning, the surgical technique, how we've made it reproducible. Christian's going to talk about the follow-up uh, and the results. Um, and um, yeah, that's the secret source, really. And just to finish off, we now run these cadaveric labs with Nuclip. You should all come to the new facility in Nantes and come and, and do, these, do, do some of these courses with us or come and visit us. You're all welcome in London um, anytime. Thank you very much. Right. So is Bushan here? All right. Okay, so in which uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for your wonderful deliberation. Uh, now, may I request Dr. Bhushan Sabnemi Sabnes to kindly.
Has anyone got any questions? Just whilst we, obviously that was a bit of a intro talk. Any? How much of uh, joint line obligatory you accept? M suppose there is an a MPTA which is going up to 90, then you can accept the only one level osteotomy, or when you will uh, decide that it's required a patient of double level osteotomy. I mean, you're, are you doing the planning lecture? Yeah. So uh, that doesn't work. Okay. So um, yeah, for the ones I haven't seen, a uh, warm welcome from my side as well. Obviously, my name is uh, Christian Klei and. Um, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I have the privilege to work with uh, Professor Wilson in, uh, in London as well um, and I have a, quite, quite a big practice in Hanover, Germany. So I'm commuting from Hanover to London, which is uh, somewhat as convenient as like here from Mumbai to, uh, to Kolkata. So anyhow, um, the question on joint line obliquity is often asked and uh, what we try to teach today with osteotomy is that we want to recreate something more natural. So this is why we refer to the MPTA and MLDFA to have some certain idea what nature actually created and why it did it. So usually we have an incline of the joint line to the medial side because we have for gait when we try to walk we have to medialize our feet to gain a center of balance, to basically bring it down in the middle under our pelvis. So when we medialize our feet, our, uh, in the bipedal stance, oblique joint line turns out to be horizontal when it counts, when we walk, when we jump, when we are under dynamic conditions. So we need an oblique joint line. Yes, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is scientifically, biomechanically proven, and you can even see that, uh, for example, the skeleton of Lucy, if you look for the evolution of mankind, it has been like that. So since we are walking uh, as bipedals, we have an oblique joint line. This joint line obliquity, therefore, shall not be destroyed because there is a biomechanical reason for that. And if we, um, on purpose, destroy it, we create shear forces for our patients that lead to early degeneration and therefore rapid failure of our osteotomy. So, um, Bushan, I tried to fill the gap, you know, so everything is fine. So, um, so therefore, we want to recreate something natural. Well, obviously, there is a compromise in everything. So, when you have a, a malalignment, let's say a varus deformity, and you start with a medial open wedge high tibial osteotomy in order to bring the load from the medial to the lateral side, which is equally scientifically proven that this is possible, well, then you need to pay a price. But we try to keep that price as, as low as possible. So the price is that you sometimes have to overdo the HTO and bring the MPTA to non-anatomical -anat uh, values. What is anatomical? 87. So it's not 90. So in fact, when you do prosthetics, total knee endoprosthetics, and, and put in a joint replacement and aim for 90 as normal, this is not normal. So and when Bellemans came up with his study that a little bit of varus deformity in the tibia is good, then he is looking at it from the perspective of a total knee surgeon. A bit of varus, maybe 3 degrees, ending up at 87 from the perspective of an osteotomist that is normal. So we need to shift our mindset here and say, well, 87 is normal. And as this is normal, we don't want to destroy it. So we bring it to 90, that's okay. This is within the normal range because it's not just one, one value, it's a, it's a bell curve of distribution. And this is the mean, 87. So, but it varies from like 90 till 85. So shall we overdo it over 90 MPTA? And that's the good question now. Well, we try to be very critical here because now we have a tool in our hands called double level osteotomy. And whatever we cannot reach at the tibia, then probably is because there is another deformity somewhere else. So let's correct the deformity where it is. And we do a double level. Then there is a third subgroup of patients where the deformity is 
in either of those bones plus in the joint. So obviously, to compensate for that joint, you have to overdo some of the bony correction. And that's what you can do. You can overdo it, and we have a threshold of three degrees. So we don't like to do uh, and, and overdo the, uh, the tibia uh, to more than 93 degrees post-operative MPTA, which is already a compromise, a big compromise. And we call this a palliative surgery because it destroys normal anatomy and is rather something that we do in order to keep going, but not to with the intention of restitutio ad integrum. We don't, cannot restore natural function with this. So this is why it's a palliative surgery. Long answer to bridge the gap. Good to see you. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? I have a question. Yeah. Is it always necessary to do a two-level osteotomy? If not, when do you do a single level and when do you do a two-level osteotomy? So whenever we, so first at hand, obviously, we don't want to overdo it because we can. So it's not, it's not a self-fulfilling practice. We, we do it because we think it's favorable for our patient. So when we put more surgical load onto our patient, more burden, well, then it has to be meaningful. Has, there needs to be a, a, a biomechanical, logical sense in that. So whenever we reach a normal alignment with a single-level osteotomy, everything is fine. We perform a single-level osteotomy. Whenever we see that a single-level osteotomy is not able to, to bring our patient to biomechanically acceptable values, we have to do something else. And this is then a double-level osteotomy. So if you have a patient with a gross varus deformity and you perform an HTO, and in your planning you see that even to make it straight, your post-operative MPTA is 97, then you created a deformity for the patient within this tibia, which is probably worse than the one that the patient started with. Let's take concrete, uh, exact values, okay? Let's say you start at 82. That's a quite low MPTA. And the patient has a Mikulic line just inside of the knee joint, okay? And to bring it to some obscure Fujisawa point, let's say to the lateral spine, maybe even a bit further, you need to open it some 15 millimeters, and then you end up starting at 85, maybe at 97. So the initial deformity, 85, uh, 82 till 85, was three degrees. I mean, it was a varus, but the deformity of the MPTA itself to reach normal values was th uh, three degrees. Now, post-operatively, you're at 97, which is seven of normal. So the deformity you created is worse than the one that the patient came with, and he will hate it because it's against normal biomechanics and natural, natural movement. So for these patients, probably, it's the way smarter approach to say, well, hold on. Our deformity seems to have a different source. It's not just the tibia. It may be somewhere else. So, and then you re-measure everything, go back to your drawing board and see, well, the MPTA is equally not at 80, uh, the MLDFA is equally not at 88, but maybe at 93. So why don't we just take the first five, six, seven degrees out of the femur, help the tibia to be the smaller correction, and then correct on both levels. And these patients love it. Well, it is uh, uh, preoperatively. So you, you, I advocate everyone. So it's, it's a great question. It's a great question because it comes down to the essence of everything. So what you do is, obviously, every one of you, you have a practice and you observe your patients. So patients coming in into your outpatient clinics, you assess them, various deformity, might be a case for an osteotomy. So you, the next thing you do is, obviously, you x-ray your patient. I mean, after the physical examination. You have a long leg standing film, x-ray of your patient. The next thing you have to do, each and every case, is like a, it's like a, a dogma. You have to analyze the deformity. Because if you don't analyze the deformity, which is part of this planning process, then you don't know where to correct. 
A various deformity, obviously, you can correct at the tibia, at the femur, within the joint. You can correct it at multiple levels, but you can never find the answer unless you have analyzed where the deformity is really originated. So you need to analyze. That's the first thing. If you have analyzed already and measured everything, well, your planning is half the way done. So then you plan in terms of calibration and millimeters to bring angles to metrics because inside of the OR you cannot measure angles because the hinge is away from you and in order to find and, and measure angles inside of the OR you would be having to reach out to the hinge. So the only thing that you can see during the surgery is the wedge base height or the gap that you measure. So it's metrics and when you have your metrics you have done your planning. And it's way safer for you to go into the OR and have your planning ready, obviously. I mean, you feel prepared. It's just, and, and for your patient as well. If you just go in and say, well, let's do an HTO, keep it open till it's somewhat straight, huh? eyeballed, well, you've corrected the limb, right? But you have maybe destroyed anatomy. That's why you need to analyze and plan. You have a uh, question. Good morning, thank you. Hey. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is the, the normal value after correction. Does it differ geographically, like the Asian population, like the, the Japanese, Korean, Nepalese, and the European? The second question is like, uh, we are uh, measuring and calculating on a standing leg x-ray. And while we're operating, we're doing on a supine position. So how do you balance that? Those are my two yeah. questions. Thank you. So, so um, two questions. One is, um, um, about uh, um, regional aspects, maybe changes of anatomy in different populations. First question. Second question, I repeat those questions just for you that you get them all. Uh, second question is how to determine um, the weight uh, bearing or loading during surgery because obviously this is a problem. We try to create something dynamic yet have something during the surgery on our table which is static. And, and that even without weight. So, first question, well, I have my experience in Hanover and mostly with white Caucasian people, patients, um, but obviously we have an international work group and we see what others do in other countries, like you mentioned in Far East Asia, um, China, Japan, Korea, big countries for uh, osteotomies. So, um, things are slightly different there, or it seems as if. So we see from Japan, for example, different concepts like Chiba osteotomy, uh, um, intra-articular osteotomies to encounter a different shape of proximal tibia where you have these pagoda type tibia. So there is answers to that, yet we cannot, we cannot give lots of ex expertise on these kind of surgeries. We've done quite some, but this is rather for patients having a blount disease or something alike. So um, we should refer to our Asian colleagues who have more experience there. Rio Haitake Uchi is one of the guys who's really into that. Um, but there is different surgical answers to different problems, anatomical problems, you're right. And the next thing is assessment of the weight bearing during surgery, um, well, I have, I have uh, developed my, my workflow a way that my patient um, overhangs with the foot some five centimeters over the edge of the table, of the operating table, and my assistant is always standing at the distal side, and for two reasons. So he can put his, the foot on the belly to actually lock the rotation of the limb, so you always have it in true AP. You, you maneuver it once and then you have it locked. And then by just pressing the belly press technique, you can simulate a bit of weight bearing. Maybe not fully, but at least some sort of dynamic compression that you get that may simulate a a, uh, uh, some, some application of load. Okay, so and the next thing the assistant can do by just having both hands free because the foot is just locked on the belly, you can move the knee with your hands and apply some various valgus stress. So it's a sort of dynamic examination during the surgery. Is it completely real? Well, for sure not. For sure not. Is it better than nothing? Yeah, surely. 
Will we have everything for that planning? Well, I don't know. I cannot give you the answer. You know, I'm a narrow-minded surgeon. I just try to find my best answers to this. Now, I, um, I used to cut um, uh, and prepare and, and do the uh, preparation, the, the soft tissue approach in flexion. And there is a reason for that, because you, get, uh, you have way better access to the proximal tibia when you release um, the, the flexors of the knee. So you need to go to the pes tendons, and the pes tendons in full extension are quite tight and cover your medial collateral. So when you want to tackle your MCL, and we have some good techniques, yeah, I know we need to proceed, so we have some good techniques for that, then um, you need to bend your knee. That makes things easier for the soft tissue approach. We come to that. Uh, we, we will jump into the surgery anyhow and there. Well, we we have a whole you. day to discuss all these things. So. <laughs> If you ask, if you keep on asking questions to Christian, he'll continue talking the whole day. Um, I'm Bhushan Sabnis. Good morning. Uh, for some reason, my driver decided to take me to Tata Consultancy Services in the morning, rather than to the convention center. So, I was going to say that he, he thought I looked like uh, some kind of consultant who is not interested in surgery. So, uh, anyway, uh, let's go back to basics a bit. I think Adrian gave a brilliant talk on uh, <coughs> history of osteotomy. Let's talk about alignment and osteoarthritis of the knee joint. So we know about the articular cartilage anatomy, that's too basic for all of us, I think. So the, the type 2 collagen, which is very important part of the cartilage, the proteoglycan mass, and uh, the moment you get a break in the subchondral bone, you start getting fibrocartilage, because type 1 collagen actually forms uh, the fibrocartilage instead of type 2, which is part of the hyaline cartilage. That's simplifying matters very easily. But what we need to know is article <coughs> sorry articular cartilage once in a <laughs> once in a lifetime event so once it's injured it gets damaged the fibro cartilage that you get from microfracture or any other technique is not as strong as uh, or not as smooth as a highline cartilage and a lot of other factors also uh, decide how a joint is going to be, be, uh, be going to behave so you need to want you want to stay in the green not want to go in the yellow or the red zones which are irreversible so anything in which your joint homeostasis is maintained either by bracing or by osteotomy, you are able to save the joint or salvage the situation and not going to the zone of arthroplasty. Um, we all know about this image. This will be showed multiple times today. This is from Dror Pele's book about uh, deformities <coughs> and uh, uh, deformity correction. So we need to know the main angle that we are looking at is the MPTA and the LDFA. Uh, ALDFA is not the one you are looking at, it is the MLDFA, which is the counterpart of MPTA on the femoral side. So both are around 87, with a range from 84 to uh, 88 or 85 to 90. So we need to be great believers in alignment, because we do get a lot of patients like this, who need to be planned properly for surgery. Now, just taking uh, the leaf of what uh, Christian was saying, it's, it's imperative that surgery has to be planned before uh, the surgeon enters the theater. So it has to be on paper how much correction you're going to do, what fixation you're going to do, whether you're going to put bone graft or not. It all has to be planned properly to get a decent result such as this. And for those of uh, you who know me or have uh, seen me talk before, this is how my desktop looks. So it's all full of scanograms of uh, every possible variety and uh, various plans that we do. <coughs> um, so essentially what we're trying to do is get the alignment back to normal. Uh, the old Miniachi technique works really well, but what we need to understand is we don't want to get the joint line oblique, otherwise you are going to get a good looking wall which is really well painted in a building such as this. So it's essentially unlivable. So you want to be very clever in what you do. A lot of us talk a lot about cartilage regeneration procedures, meniscal repairs, ligament reconstructions, but our weapons of choice need to be the saw first and after that the painting brush. So we need to make sure your uh, alignment comes perfect before anything else is addressed. So there's a very good debate whether you want to be a structural engineer or an interior decorator. The structural engineer comes first, the interior decorator comes next. So we want to make sure that a plain wallpaper is not the, not the real answer for covering up a defect in the wall but a proper repair of the wall or getting the align alignment perfect is more important. So anytime you're faced with an arthritic situation such as this, the first thing you have to see 
is whether that person needs a realignment rather than thinking of a AC or a Macy or a uh, third or eighth or 19th generation cartilage regeneration procedure that you are planning. So a lot of the debate focuses on various newer techniques but very less is focused on getting the alignment right. So let's not harp on that uh, any longer. What we need to understand is any damage in the joint will not heal. Any meniscal repair, any cartilage repair, any ligament reconstruction will not work unless the mal alignment is corrected. So the, the primary focus of any surgery for any joint problem in the knee joint is to get the alignment right. So before you think of anything else, the alignment has to be the key. We get a lot of patients referred to us for meniscal repair or for cartilage regeneration procedures without even doing a single x-ray or a weight bearing x-ray or a scanogram just relying on MRI. So we need to make sure that any time you are dealing with any kind of arthritis in the knee joint, any kind of chondral lesions in the knee joint, the primary focus has to be the alignment before you head down this algorithm uh, about anything else that needs to be done. It's been proven beyond doubt <coughs> that if you get the alignment proper, you might not need anything done. You will get good cartilage regeneration. I agree it's not a real hyaline cartilage. It's more of a, a fibro cartilage, hyaline cartilage mix. But two years post-op re-arthroscopy has shown real good cartilage regeneration. What if the deformity is minor? Quite a few times I'm asked if there's only three or four degrees varus, would you still correct it? Of course, it's been proven beyond doubt that even a small deformity of less than five degrees also, if, uh, if you do a, a, a proper realignment osteotomy and get the weight bearing axis in the lateral compartment, offloading the medial side, there's a very good chance that you will uh, get good result even without doing any cartilage regeneration. So uh, you may or may not need to do a cartilage regeneration for patients who have localized defect on the medial compartment just by realigning them properly. So same thing has been proven more and more times again. Uh, Condal resurfacing actually has been questioned. So condal regeneration procedures have been questioned if they are done by themselves. But with, uh, along with an osteotomy, it seems to work really well. So this is the vicious circle of a varus osteoarthritis. So you are getting varus malalignment that will lead to high knee adduction moment. That will lead to loss of cartilage thickness, which will lead to increased varus. So it's a self-fueling engine or a vicious circle as we call it. And we need to make sure this is broken by changing the alignment as such. Does it all work? Is it actually proven to work? So there are a lot of papers which have looked at the gait pattern uh, post osteotomy to see if it comes back to normal. And you can see the pre-op and post-op difference. And you can see the difference between the post-op and control which is very minimal. That means you are almost getting back to normal by changing the alignment both in coronal plane as well as in sagittal plane. So realignment is essential for every patient who has uh, a deformity, may it be for a chondral degeneration, for medial compartment arthritis, for management of osteochondritis desiccans, to protect your meniscal repairs, uh, transplant and implants, and also for ligament reconstructions. So there are a few contentious issues. This is always asked in any conference that we talk on. Would you do a realignment osteotomy for someone who's asymptomatic? Would you do a prophylactic surgery? No, but maybe I will discuss it with patient that he's heading towards something and that needs to be sorted. Would you correct a minor deformity? Yes, even a 5 millimeter correction also is a good correction. Would you do a, a 20 year old patient uh, who has various arth various uh, with let's say medial meniscal tear? Yes, I would do an osteotomy, but I won't bring him more beyond 60. I'll bring, maybe bring him back to neutral of 53-55%. So Fujisawa point as Christian mentioned is a slight misnomer. You want to go almost to the center, but not beyond the center, not go to 60, 65%. We are now saying the best possible alignment is between 53 and 57%. But again, it depends on the status of your cartilage on the medial side. If you got grade 4, you can err towards caution and go to 60. But if you got decent cartilage, it's better to stay in 55% zone. So this gentleman was advised ACL reconstruction and a PLC reconstruction because of his varus thrust. You can see how bad his knee is and is finding it almost impossible to walk. And all he needed was a good HTO. Uh, there was no deformity in the femur. So he just had HTO. No PLC reconstruction was required. I played with the slope a bit, low demand uh, patient. So if I flatten the slope, even ACL reconstruction is not required in these patients. So this patient did really well. Um, so 
again, a uh, few senior guys uh, of you might be doing a closing variation to nothing like it. But the locking plate technique has revolutionized the concept of a opening wedge HTO. A lot of patients who have uh, a, a various systems of HTO, so there's a new clip plate, there's a OTC plate, there's a Tomofix plate, there's a peak power plate. So all of these are really good options to get a good correction. I will not go much into closing wedge. We are not uh, talking much of closing wedge, but that is an operation which works well in some hands. I prefer the opening wedge because it gives a real excellent stability with early mobilization like a closing wedge where weight, <coughs> where weight bearing is no problem. You can play with slope a lot so you can break the hinge and purposely change the slope according to your requirement mm. and it preserves the anatomy for a future uh, TKR so it makes it quite easy to do the surgery as such. So that leaning tower of PISA can be corrected really well by either opening wedge or a closing wedge but that needs to be done before. <coughs> any any repainting is done. Now, when would I still think of a closing wedge osteotomy? For smokers, I've burnt my fingers multiple times in smokers where patients reassure you that they have stopped smoking for six months, but later to uh, when you confront them, tell that no, I've been smoking only ten a day or five a day, and you end up having a, a very delayed union, non-union. I've grafted two of my HTOs because they didn't stop smoking. And one of them went to Frank non-union requiring an Elizabeth fixator. So that's a known problem. Another problem is a contralateral shortening. So if a, a, the contralateral leg is already short, so you don't see that in Western world that much, but we still get patients who have post polio residual paralysis on one side and they get arthritis on the other side. And any lengthening of a normal side will uh, lead to uh, difficulty in walking for these patients. So you need to be careful about using appropriate uh, 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 type of osteotomy. Excel fixator, we will not go into details of that, but uh, any patient who has significant damage to the skin or soft tissues, you might want to think of uh, doing a, a closing wedge or excel fixator osteotomy as such. Um, I think the uh, bell is ringing for me, so I'll probably stop at that level. Actually, uh, and Dr. Ronald is uh, online. Okay, so I think He's the next... for the virtually. Okay, okay, so I'll stop now. So this is uh, all I wanted to say, uh, important bit is to understand that uh, don't get in a don't get in a situation like this where you don't know what you are dealing with. Get your alignment right, get your osteotomy to get your deformity corrected, and you'll get a happy patient uh, who's jumping around like that about three months from surgery. We all need to get fit, and we all need to get your alignment sorted to get the knees functioning properly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savnish. Hello. Part of this uh, prestigious meeting. Now, I sense that there is some delay in my voice. Uh, because of the long distance, uh, probably, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, indications, and I will share my screen now. Yes. Uh, uh, it will be visualized. Okay. Let's see. So here we are. The former speakers already have shown beautiful cases, but. Um, we now come to consensus approach of the indications for osteotomy. These are my disclosures. I've been involved in development of the Tomofix system. I've been involved in AO, Smith and Nephew initiative on joint preservation, and now I'm a consultant for new clips techniques. In 2005, the ISACOS meeting was on the management of osteoarthritis of the knee prior to total knee replacement. So this was the first consensus on what to do with um, uh, osteoarthritis, specifically monocompartmental osteoarthritis in the case of uh, uh, patients you want to make a choice for which is the best treatment. So they, these were the objectives. And the conclusions should be considered as a guideline to patient selection. Ideal candidates were um, chosen for uh, osteotomies. And these are a little bit 
outdated these days, and I will come back to that later. They said age 40 to 60 years old. Well, the former speaker, Bushan, told uh, you can do an osteotomy in a 20-year-old also, and that's often in my practice an indication. BMI less than 30, well, that may be still applicable in your country, but we have very much high BMI patients these days, and we do osteotomies in high BMI patients too. High demand activity, but no running or jumping. Many of our patients do athletic activities up to uh, triathlon, which involves marathon running after their osteotomies. Alignment less than 15 degrees. These days we do much larger, larger corrections, specifically double level corrections for these patients. And you will be uh, learning about these uh, patients later on. And metaphysial varus, that's a very important thing to notice because that will um, tell you which is the best patient to do an osteotomy. And that's here, this is from the French literature. If you have a, you want to do a lateral closing wedge osteotomy, and you have a varus tibia, then the tibia turns to normal after your osteotomy. However, if the tibia is normal to begin with, and then you do a uh, uh, lateral closing wedge osteotomy, you create abnormal anatomy, and that's not good. Ideal candidates for osteotomy continued, full range of motion. You can correct the range of motion to some extent with your osteotomy. Normal contralateral and patellofemoral compartment. I will tell you in the next consensus that there are no, not many restrictions these days anymore. And the arthritis classification, of course, this is IKGC, but you have uh, all kind of other arthritis classifications. And of course, the bone-on-bone -bone patients are not the ideal patients for osteotomies. But any stage before that could be considered an osteotomy patient in the presence of a deformity. No not justified normal ligament balance, I will come to that later on. And smoking is not a good uh, situation around osteotomies, but sometimes you have no choice. Then they defined in this committee possible candidates and no candidates. And again, these data is a little bit outdated. So recently in the UK, there was a new consensus statement on osteotomies around the knee by a UK committee. 29 specialist knee surgeons regularly performing osteotomies set together and uh, performed this, uh, made this consensus. Amongst them, there was my good friend and colleague in the uh, orthopedic specialist group in London, Rugby Kaka, who will be talking to you also in this meeting. So the main indication for osteotomy, they concluded, is when there is unicompartmental overload or unicompartmental disease. And these were some other statements. It recommends that the physiological age not to consider there's an upper age limit. Personally, my eldest patient was 94 years old. And I did an osteotomy in this patient because of a malunited fracture. Calgary Lawrence grade four bone on bone is not considered to be a contraindication. Some of these cases do well, specifically when they're young. BMI more than 30, not a contraindication. It's not essential to perform a concurrent arthroscopy. That's something that differs between countries and in patients grade four degeneration with patellofemoral joint disease, there may still be an indication for an osteotomy varus or valgus. So it's extending, the indications are extending and this consensus uh, statement um, tells us that. So ligament insufficiency in osteotomy, we're going to talk about that in this meeting also, but patients who have various primary ACL deficiency and medial compartment OA, no contraindication. You can play around with the ligaments and help the ligaments that are insufficient with your osteotomy. More talk about that later in this meeting. Then recently and the publications will follow, so we'll, I will not go in that very deep. There was a formal consensus project from ESCA of osteotomy around the painful degenerative varus knee. 
So this is only for various medial compartment osteoarthritis. And there are all kind of statements of a large, a much larger group here of osteotomy experts that say that at any age you can do an osteotomy, male or female, no evidence that it uh, causes less favorable outcomes. Again, papers will come out this year on this new consensus. So we have three consensus papers you can refer to when you are doing osteotomies and you are trying to find a reference for that. Then we, of course, we have cultural demands of knee function which favor osteotomies over joint replacements. On the left side, a person from probably your country which needs very high knee flexion. This is a, on the right side from Japan, this is a picture from Professor Takeuchi, a well-known osteotomy expert and a good friend, who says, well, in my country, patients are not asking for total joint replacement, they are asking for osteotomy because they want to have a deep knee flexion. Then other indications. Before you put in a joint replacement in this knee, you probably want to realign that knee um, and then put the joint replacement in. So here it was a large closing wedge before that um, uh, stemmed uh, replacement was put in. Other indications, restoring the joint balance. This was a young lady, sorry the video will not run, but she has a gross instability of the knee during walking because she had a meningococcal sepsis and that left her with an incomplete development of her medial part of the proximal tibia. A small uh, high tibial osteotomy open wedge uh, made her knee stable again. Just realigning the weight bearing line gives stability and you should take care of that in such a patient. This is also an instability, a hyperextension, but you have different types of persons. So the left gentleman has a bony deformity and you can do a flexion osteotomy and we will come back to that later on in the meeting and then you have a fully extended knee. This is a post-polio leg. This is normal anatomy in the bones, but it's the capsule and the soft tissue structures that are stretching and causing hyperextension. So that's not a good indication, and we would brace such a patient. Then there are other planes, the sagittal planes, as mentioned before, and we also have the transverse planes. And I will come to, back to you with this lady later on in the planning but this is the examination you should perform, a so-called rotational profile examination, to find an indication for an osteotomy. And then we have published papers on when you have a rotational malformation, so a transverse plane deformities, when is the cutoff point to do a osteotomy. Tomorrow I will talk about this topic. Then you should also consider alternative for osteotomies. So some patients, you cannot do an osteotomy because of their general health problem. Activity modification, physiotherapy, medication, injections may also help such a patient. So that's an alternative to osteotomies. Loading, unloading partially with a brace is also a good treatment. In those patients, you cannot do osteotomies. And you and that has been shown by the former speaker, Bushan, you can return gait almost to normal with a brace treatment, even only for six weeks. Indications for osteotomies, and I'm almost done with this presentation, you should talk with the patient about the expectations. If the patient doesn't expect to end up with a slight valgus lag, and that's a big problem, you have forgotten to talk about the cosmetic appearance. There's a need for immobilization. There is a time for hospitalization. And you should consider the ease of revision. Lateral closing wedge HTO, if you want to put in a knee prosthesis tibial component later on, you better be aware of the deformity you create of the proximal tibia. Then, from indication to OR, 
If you do have deformities that need a gradual correction with X-Fix, you should find these patients and you should not treat them with acute corrections. That may put them into danger. The ease of uh, surgery should be one factor also as an orthopedic surgeon you should consider. Also the duration of the procedure as well as the blood loss. And then there are indications like this. This is a shepherd herding his cattle and he wanted to have uh, his fracture of the tibia treated but the surgeon didn't realize putting in the plate that after a few hours he left the hospital because he needed to take care of the sheep so of course he comes back with a bended plate because he's weight bearing way too early on that plate after the fracture fixation so then when you do a correction of shotomy you better put in a very thick rod to stabilize him because this patient indeed left the hospital after a few hours to take care of his sheep again. And then finally he ended up with a well healed and corrected leg with this steel rod inside. So take home messages for indications. Guidelines can be found in the literature and please look at these recent developed consensus uh, papers increasing amount of indications and you will hear much more about this during this this meeting modern day deformity analysis and planning and we're going to talk about that later on uh, and fixations technique enable the right procedure for the right patients and there are alternative as well as factors to be considered so it's not only I see a patient let's do an osteotomy you should consider um, and do a proper preparation for each and every patient and I'm sure you know all about that. Thank you for your attention <coughs> for this presentation. Thank you sir. <coughs> Can you continue your next lecture that is the planning for osteotomic surgery? Ronald? I, di I, I didn't fully get that. I'm sorry. Ronald, uh, can you continue your next lecture? There is the planning for osteotomy surgery. Or you uh, have completed? The, you, you were asking about external fixator or? Sorry. Ronald, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Adrian. Good morning. Good morning, Ronald. Sorry we got you up so early this morning. We actually, we have just a few minutes before we move into the next talk, which is at 10 past. Can we ask you a few questions? Of course you can. Has anyone got, I mean, this is the absolute key lecture, or one of the key lectures is who to do the surgery on. And Ronald was uh, instrumental in that consensus document. So we must have some questions about the indications. Uh, so one question was uh, basically what Bhushan was talking about, uh, that depending on the cartilage damage, you shift your axis. So how do you judge preoperatively what is the status of cartilage? So either a preoperative orthroscopy, I mean just, just uh, intraoperative orthroscopy or getting a good MRI done in all cases where you are planning a high cable osteotomy. Okay, That's so did you get yeah, that, Ronald? Well, the question is how I, do you... I got it. Okay, okay. I got it. I got it. Thank you. It's a very good question, of course. Um, I think it depends on your, your practice. If you're a sports medicine surgeon, you're most of the time confronted already with uh, an arthroscopy picture when the patient is referred or you will do an MRI scan because you want to know not only the cartilage but also the ligament status. In my practice it's a little bit different. 80 to 90 percent of my patients are referrals and I am in the possession of uh, recent arthroscopic pictures or MRI scans or CT scans, whatever kind of uh, additional examination comes with the patient that's referred. But if you have a new patient, probably you work up. Uh, most important is, of course, weight-bearing x-rays. Please do not accept any non-weight-bearing x-rays, whether it's knee only or uh, the full leg weight-bearing x-rays with two legs standing. These are the most important. And from that, you can uh, add with MRI scans, preferably, or arthroscopies. And if it's allowed in your country, and there's a difficulty in my country, you can always do an arthroscopy preceding your correction. But 
Before that, of course, you have already made your indication for us, Shotter. Okay. So I have a question. So you said uh, that bone-to-bone -bone medial arthritis is not a contraindication to do these osteotomies. So how should we counsel the patients? Because there are many questions with the patient asked, how long will it last? And uh, in your experience, uh, what are the results? And after how much time do they go for knee replacement? I did not fully so, get so Ronald, the, the question. Yeah, yes. the, the question is, um, if we do this in bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, um, mm -hmm. and we're telling our patients, we think this is a good option for you, how long can they expect to get benefit for? What sort of long-term dates do we have? Yes, uh, I was very uh, lucky uh, to be a resident of the, f the late Professor Marty, and you may be aware that we edited a book on osteotomies for post-traumatic deformities. In it are cases of 30 years follow-up after um, uh, post-traumatic or after fracture surgery um, and corrections. What I learned from that, being a young resident under his hands, is if you just realign the leg in the most horrible osteoarthritic or post-traumatic deformities knees, you will have less of a complaint in the patient. And even bone-on-bone -bone patients, sometimes it's just like that. And they have a very big varus or valgus. If you just realign them, they will have less pain. And it enables them to have good gait. And whether it helps them for one year, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, before you put in a joint replacement, you preserve the joint. And I think that's the most important. So even grade four bone-on-bone, -bone, specifically in younger patients, they deserve a joint preservation procedure before you would consider a joint replacement. Thank you. Uh, a fantastic talk, Ronald. Uh, Thank you. When we are discussing the indications, so is there any gender bias, or especially when we are considering osteotomy in osteoarthritic patients? Are the outcomes similar in males and females? Well, in these days, we keep adding genders because we have all kind of uh, communities these days, not only male and female, but uh, that's another discussion. Um, no, in the consensus statements, it says there is no gender bias. However, in my practice, I tend to see a group of female between, let's say, 50 and 60 years old, where sometimes I have a disappointing result of the osteotomy. So biomechanically, I've done everything right, but there is another factor, and I think it's hormonal, where the osteoarthritis of the lateral compartment starts after an open wedge high tibial osteotomy, where it normally would never start after such a procedure in any other patient. So there are factors we still are not aware of in the osteoarthritis uh, development. And probably if we, <clears throat> if we know that in the near future, we can make a better indication for this specific group of patients. Otherwise, uh, I see no difference in gender. Uh, good morning. Now, uh, uh, you said that it's mainly for the mono, uh, unicompartmental disease, but you know, uh, in patellofemoral way, we also we can do it. Thus, how much patellofemoral arthritis is okay for uh, doing uh, osteotomy, and how do you judge that? Do you do MR to see the patella? No, I'm not doing uh, MR. This is a very good question, by the way. In the consensus, even up to grade four is accepted. Why? It is all about the complaints. We have patients who have grade four, and you know that if you are treating degenerative knee disease, where you are amazed that uh, the patient has no patellofemoral pain, and there is a grade four present. It's all about the quadriceps and hamstrings balance, and how much load the patient puts on his patellofemoral joint. So through the years, whatever 
uh, patellofemoral just, uh, joint disease grading is there, I accept it if they have no specific complaints of the patellofemoral joint. Uh, okay, last one. Yeah. So, I don't know. so we have a case like young patient is having medial joint line pain, but uh, weight bearing axis scanogram is good, normal. Then how do you treat this patient? So well, an MRI is normal, but uh, isotope bone scan they may show uh, increased uptake in medial compartment. MRI scan is normal. It's an interesting case because we see it much uh, often. Um, you should see the patient walking. Some of these patients have a dynamic varus, and if you have make an X-ray, that's a standing position. So maybe this patient has some lateral laxity, and in walking, there's an overloading of the medial compartment because of opening up the lateral side of the joint line. Then there are diseases like osteonecrosis, which can, can just happen in a medial compartment. That's a totally different disease, but still causing pain in and you see, you see abnormal findings in the beginning, beginning of osteonecrosis in the medial compartment. Unloading that medial compartment then is key and will help these patients. It's not like I'm doing osteotomies in each and every patient. In your patient, I would always test with a valgarization brace whether or not unloading that medial compartment does a good job. If it doesn't, I probably have to, to, to rethink my plan and find anything, go deeper into what is going on in this patient. My planning starts with a physical, my planning starts with a physical examination. So I'm not even thinking of drawing lines on pictures when I see the patient first or when I'm confronted with the pictures. I first do a proper physical examination. I look at gait, I look at stance, I look at leg length, I look at balance, I look at muscle atrophy, I look at range of motions. So also look at neurovascular examination specifically in your country, and I've been there a couple of times at some of the meetings that did some surgeries. I know uh, post-polio or polio legs are there, and if you are not doing a proper neurovascular examination, also in post-traumatic patients, you may be fooled by what you see, and the patient's not benefiting optimally of your osteotomy. And then, after your phys physical exam examination, document it. Specifically, if you're in a hospital with residents, uh, if it's not well documented and you are confronted with the patient for the first time in the OR, you will not appreciate that there is additional laxity in one of the directions and you will not perform a good osteotomy. So physical examination is the first step in planning for me. So look at this young lady and you will see her back in the rotation uh, uh, lecture of tomorrow. She was sent in because of valgus, but she doesn't have valgus at all. Look at this leg alignment. This is Stan's leg alignment view. So this is the importance of gait. I wouldn't have had a clue why this young lady shows valgus dynamically in gait only from this picture. This is a fully straight leg. She has a rotation deformity and I will go into that more detail tomorrow and show her treatment. Then, second step, radiological deformity analysis. So before pl planning always comes deformity analysis. And the best investment you can do if you are starting with osteotomies is one walk to the radiology department, sit there with the radiology assistant and radiologist and ask about the way they make the x-rays. And please understand how you make your x-rays properly. A two-legged, full-leg weight-bearing x-ray is the key for planning. And talk to your radiology department and make an optimal situation for making these x-rays because these are keys in planning. 
check for the lag length difference, use the simple block method to correct lag length to make an optimal picture. And also have something to calibrate your picture, whether it's a ruler or a ball you can track. Otherwise, the later stage of planning where you want to convert great degrees into uh, millimeters, you cannot do that properly if you do not have a calibrated x-ray. This, this is a very important step in investing uh, in your practice for a good planning, the radiological deformity analysis. And then we have principles. And whether you like it or not, there is a Bible on this, and we, as osteotomists, talk about the uh, definitions that has been described in this book, The Principles of Deformity Correction. At least we have an, a language which everyone who's doing osteotomy understands. And if you want to talk to us or have a consultation and we ask you about angles, we will always ask you about the angles in the frontal sagittal plane and the transversal plane. We would probably ask you for a CT scan. Otherwise, we cannot help you. Multiplane deformities is another different cookie, and there uh, you probably need a referral to a specialty center. But radiological deformity analysis, the definitions and the angles come from this book. So here we have such an analysis, and here we go with lines. And drawing these lines and measuring these angles, that's a, a course which can take two to three days to, to learn that properly. Anyhow, if you're looking at the literature, you will find these angles. Around the knee, the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is the key angle to measure, to find out whether the femur bone is normal, normal aligned in the deformity analysis. The medial proximal tibial angle is the angle at the, at the tibia where we're looking at. Normal value is around 87. Then the lateral distal tibia angle. Do not forget the ankle joint when you, uh, when you look at a limb. The ankle joint is also important because if the ankle joint is already in valgus and you would perform an open wedge high tibial osteotomy, the valgus loading at the ankle joint increases. And that may cause that the patient cannot walk properly after your osteotomy. So also have a quick look at the ankle joint. Is it about normal? Then you do not have to worry. And then, of course, the mechanical tibiofemoral angle and the joint line convergence angle will be an issue, specifically also in double level osteotomies and ligament laxities. So you have to do these measurements. You have to measure each and every case and do a deformity analysis, and only then you will know which bone to treat and how to treat it. So out of that come various deformities, valgus deformities, and also the other plane deformities, normal values and um, the designation, whether it's a femoral varus, a tibial varus, or in both bones, or a femoral valgus, or a tibial valgus. So here, look at this patient. This is from the Abu Dhabi practice. This is on the importance of deformity analysis. This is big varus. So where is the varus localized? This is a, this is a weight bearing line outside of the joint. And if you just draw these simple lines, you see that on the lateral distal femoral side, mechanical exercise, that's an angle bigger than 90. And 88 is normal. So this is varus in the femur. And if you look at the tibia, that's an angle that's much less than 87. So we have a tibial and a femoral varus. And you should treat them both. This is a lateral closing wedge and a medial open wedge. And the wedge taken out of the femur is put in the open gap in the proximal tibia. And this is the post-operative x-rays, and this is the post-operative lag alignment. So there's also something else important, the joint line orientation. What do we mean by that? Well, looking at this x-ray, you see there's gross valgus in this lag. But if you look at the horizontal, 
and that line has been changed. I'm very sorry for that. That line is horizontal and parallel to the ground. So we have a horizontal joint line of the knee, but we have a gross valgus. Now, valgus, we, you may be tempted to always correct valgus in the femur. If we do that, look at this. We create a perfectly straight leg after the correction. But look at the knee joint line. The joint line orientation is very much off in valgus. And that's not a good situation for your patient. That will create shifting forces which lead to a very rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. So you can do a femoral correction but create a very abnormal joint line. And the patient will not be happy with the result. So what do we do? In this patient, a femoral and a tibial correction should be performed. Known if we would have measured and do, done a proper deformity analysis, because then we would have found that the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is far off from normal here. This is, this is far short of 88 degrees. And this medial proximal tibial angle is larger than 87 degrees. So there is, in the deformity analysis already, knowledge that this is a femoral and a tibial valgus deformity. So we should correct the femur as well as the tibia. And this is the result. We have the same post-operative alignment, which is a straight leg. However, Look at the joint line orientation, which is now horizontal, as uh, it's, it's uh, in comparison to the previous situation where we only did a femoral correction. There it was very oblique. This will create a happy patient if you do it like this. The third step in planning is correlation of your physical examination and your radiological deformity analysis. So if, for example, you have a a leg which is in varus and you did a, uh, a physical examination and you have found that you have a lateral collateral ligament laxity you know already that part of the varus is is caused by that lateral collateral ligament laxity and probably you should correct less in the bone then or maybe you should first do a lateral collateral ligament reconstruction or do it together with your osteotomy. Because part of it is opening of the joint because of that lateral collateral ligament laxity. The same in the sagittal plane and the axial plane. Uh, if you uh, have documented your physical examination properly, you will not uh, find yourself in surprise after your correction. So correlate these findings and then you go to the next step and you define the deformity and your aim of correction. There are different aims of correction. Sometimes you have a case you want to correct only to varus. So keep in varus because it's a post-traumatic situation and the other leg, the uninjured leg, is in slight varus. That's the normal for that patient. If the cartilage is not damaged and it's kind of a metaphysical or a shaft deformity, correct to normal, and the normal may be varus. So that's an aim of correction. If you have a grade 4 osteoarthritis and you want to treat it with an, oste with an osteotomy, you probably will correct some more towards the Fujisawa point because of the extent of the osteoarthritis as compared to an osteoarthritis grade 1 or 2. So, aim of correction should be defined, um, and then that you only can do if you describe a deformity. And this is one of the books uh, I published in a chapter on the aim of correction. Now, planning of correction, and I was very uh, lucky as a youngster, so not a gray hair yet, to meet this gentleman. This is Mr. Fujisawi. So Fujisawa, and he's from the famous paper where we uh, denominated after that the Fujisawa point. Planning of correction these days, and it has been mentioned by former speakers already, is not predominantly passing through the Fujisawa point. However, planning, as 
step number five, where we are playing with weight-bearing lines, you should define where you want to have that weight-bearing line passed after your correction. So this is before overloading the medial joint, and this is after. That weight-bearing line positioning, where it passes the knee, is key in making the first step of your plan. And then it goes all the way from there, and this is just step by step how we do that. We measure the angle, and before that we define whether we want to do an open wedge correction, like in this patient. Open wedge, the hinge point is in a lateral proximal tibia. Closing wedge, the hinge point is in the medial proximal tibia. Works also very well, lateral closing wedge, if you're an expert in that. But you have a different planning, because your hinge point is differently. So here we have an open wedge planning, and if we go from there, you have your hinge point here. We have measured already eight degrees from these two lines. That's the correction. Now we want to go to from eight degrees. We want to project that in the proximal tibia. And if you have a calibrated picture, then you can end up your planning with the amount of millimeters. You have to open the bone to correct eight degrees. And that's not eight millimeter in this patient. Why is that? Because this is a very wide proximal tibia. So the rule of thumb from the past, the traditional rule of thumb, one millimeter is one degree, and I was trained as a resident by that, even by the former uh, very famous Professor Marty. It is only true if you have a bone diameter of 56 millimeter and you do not have these patients frequently specifically in India because the bone diameter will be less than that so all so forget this rule one millimeter is not one degree of correction you always should properly plan and then you will find that with so many degrees of correction the amount of millimeters is less or more you need calibrated pictures for that then, how do we plan? We plan according to Miniacci. This is, for example, a femoral, a valgus deformity planning. You create a new hip center because you are not uh, creating a new ankle center because you are correcting in the femur. And from there, you can choose your hinge point for a closing wedge distal femoral osteotomy just above the lateral femoral condyle or for an open wedge distal femoral osteotomy just above the medial condyle. From there, you make your plannings. Here you see a 10 degrees of correction, and then you project your correction angle at the distal femur. You will see and hear much more about this in ideal uh, distal femoral osteotomy uh, planning. And here it's a 10 millimeter for 10 degrees. So now it's a match. And that 10 millimeter wedge we will take out on the medial side. So these are just digital planning. This is the artwork of Ragbir Kaka, my, my friend and colleague from the uh, uh, London Osteotomy Center. And he makes the perfect planning for us in preparation of surgery with digital planning trauma cat. Look at this. This is an open wedge planning and we are just presented with the amount of millimeters and with that amount we go to the OR. And here there's the same for ephemeral planning digitally. Planning in the sagittal plane, you have different factors to take care of. First factor is, what's the position of the patella? Do we have a patella alta, yes or no? If you want to plan a sagittal correction, you want to know where you want to make your osteotomy cut. Where is it related to the tuberosity? And you may consider taking off the tuberosity, and that's a biological plating technique we will probably also demonstrate in your course, but you will see that in other lectures. So planning for sagittal plane corrections is also key before you start your surgery. Here's another deformity. This is a post-traumatic deformity. Look at these x-rays. This is normal. This is an angle how you measure the sagittal plane in the femur, this is abnormal. This is a malunited femur. That is causing a flexion deformity and causing 
an extension loss in this patient. Extension loss of the knee because of a, a malunited fracture of the distal femur. You can plan this. This is planning including the plate size and the, the, or, or the, the size of the plate included in the planning. And here we found that we need a 10 millimeter anterior closing wedge uh, to take out um, and then we correct the leg and we fix the plate and uh, an additional staple and then we correct in here it's 80 after the surgery and a fully extended leg. Here we go for step number six, we're almost there. Hardware you select only after you have done all these other things. Some of these uh, corrections need plates and screws. Some are better off with external fixators. Some are better off with intramedullary nails. And some are better off with custom-made implants. You only know that after you have made a proper one to five steps in your planning process. And then the description of the surgical tactic. So you have prepared everything, but do you consider the site and the scar tissue on that site? This patient survived a bomb blasting um, in one of the uh, rather unsafe countries of this world. And you will not go in correcting that femoral ferrous with a lateral opening wedge in this patient. I wouldn't even consider that because this is all the soft tissue scarred to the bone and you will get into big trouble if you want to open there on the lateral side. And I'm sorry, not a lateral open wedge, but a lateral closing wedge, of course. So you probably would choose a medial open wedge correction in this patient to avoid the lateral side to correct the varus. So you can ask these questions, question one to five, and the, the fifth question is very important too. Can the soft tissues withstand my bony correction? This whole workup comes to what we call a surgical plan, including the questions of the surgical tactic. And for me, this is preoperative planning. Consider step one to seven and then you're fully prepared to make your best surgery. If you want to read more about this, you have some referral, of course, the Bible of Dror Paley. We've published on the, and you can find it from the ESCA newsletter and also in this book on the surgical plan. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, so we're going to go for questions again. Uh, while make, doing the pre-operative planning, if your MPTA is normal, LDF is normal, TBL bone varus angle is normal, and Mikulus line is in varus, so how will you approach uh, that patient? I think that's a unique patient because Mikulus line in varus uh, will then be caused by a uh, large or a less large lateral joint line opening because if the bone is normal, if the bone is anatomical in the femur and the tibia and you still have varus, it will be caused by a varus um, uh, caused by a ligament laxity on the lateral side. The other um, thing that may cause it, but then you would, would have a abnormal uh, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle to maybe a very uh, various alignment of the proximal femur. However, you have to you have to realize that the bigger abnormalities in the, in in alignment are caused by deformities around the knee. You can have a deformity which is major at the hip or at the ankle joint, specifically at the ankle joint, you can have a major deformity not causing a varus or a valgus loading of the knee. Um, so in your situation, I would only expect a Mikulic line to be off in varus. 
if you have a ligament laxity causing R the... Ronald, uh, Ronald can I just... Because it is a really important point. What about uh, where you have no extra-articular and just intra-articular yeah. issues intra due to osteoarthritis? Yeah, of course, that's the other, uh, the, the other cause. Well, you probably then have a patient which is not the best patient for an osteotomy. You have to realize that intra-articular deformities, apart from the deformities I'm going to talk about tomorrow, which are malunited or through uh, very rare um, growth disturbances, um, these deformities in the joint itself may cause uh, varus or valgus, um, but these are the rare patients um, and intra-articular wear only, well, there you have the best indication, for example, if you have bone on bone for a uni knee. These patients are, uh, have no deformity and are probably not the best candidates yeah, for an osteotomy. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, yeah, it is known that the full length x-ray is very important, sir. Many of us has been doing stis scanogram. How does it replace or can it uh, be uh, relied upon while planning this surgery? So where, where you don't have access to a long leg, can you mm -hmm. rely on the CT scanogram, Ronald? No, not CT scan, it's stis scanogram. The C three x-rays are taken, then they're stised by this uh, software, then scanogram is prepared. Okay. Yeah, these stitched pictures, as we did it in former times, and probably even still now, if these are pictures stitched together in a weight-bearing situation, I don't have a problem with it. So if the knee x-ray is weight-bearing, I don't see a problem. If it's a non-weight-bearing uh, situation, as also a scanogram in a lying patient, you do a CT scan, you probably are inaccurate because it's a non-weight-bearing situation. And I know it's... In, in, in some of your hospitals, it's difficult. It's very difficult to organize that. And then I refer, there are some, although the, they are methodologically, they're not the best papers, but there are some papers out there where they do planning just based on knee x-rays, AP weight-bearing x-rays. But the weight-bearing aspect is most important in any x-ray you do deformity analysis on. Great. Is there, is there any <clears throat> you know, manipulation you do in calculation when there is a constitutional virus in patients? Is, is there any alteration yeah, like in ma ma um, ma Manipulation meaning what? Doing stress Alter action? Alteration, so alteration in calculation of how much degree you need to correct when the patient has constitutional virus. Well, constitutional virus is in my, in, 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 in my definition is that the patient has a deformity uh, caused by uh, growth and it is in the bone. So that's the first one. These are my patients. They have bone deformities. So I do not add or, or change anything in the planning. However, if it's no constitutional virus, there is no deformity in the bone per se, and there is intra-articular wear, then you should be careful. Because when you do a correction then, or you plan a correction then, you create an abnormal deformity uh, of the bone, a new deformity. If you are in the possession of a planning program, you will immediately realize that if you make a preoperative planning, because afterwards you get the values of a MPTA, which is abnormal, or you see a joint line which is oblique after your planning. Remember the case I showed you after planning of a femoral correction in a double level deformity. So I hope that kind of answers that question. Well, one, one point that I think is really worth making is the upper limit of the MPTA and the lower limit of the LDFA, Ronald. What do you think are a good numbers to really work to as a guide in terms of what you'd accept? Yeah, well, that will come back in double-level talks. But if I make a planning, 
and I've seen that I have, for example, a, a small femoral deformity, which I want to ignore because in that patient it's not beneficial to do a femoral osteotomy because of age or any, any other factor. And I want to come get away with only a tibial correction in a femoral and a tibial deformity. So I only want to correct in the tibia. I will not correct to an MPTA which is higher than 95 degrees. If you go above 95 degrees MPTA, after your correction, you will create shear forces. And there's a, there are two key papers there. One paper of Babis, which is also from the past decade, uh, or two decades ago already, and one paper recently by the group of Andrew Amis and Andy Williams was involved in that paper too, which clearly state that if you have a joint line obliquity of four degrees, the stopping four degrees, more than four degrees after your correction, you create shear forces. And that's bad for menisci, that's bad for cartilage, that's just bad for your patient. So one question more. So how much of error, like when you're doing a radio, radiological uh, x-rays and all, there always will be some error which we have to take care of. So how do you really consider that error postoperatively, like on interop table? How much error, how do you like um, calculate that error? My second question is that, do you take a shoes view or a Rosenberg view before taking an osteotomy planning, for the osteotomy planning? Um, I will first answer your first question and then you have to repeat or further explain your second question. But the first question is this, it's a very important one. Um, the best thing you can do, because it's dependent on the accuracy of your radiology department together with your accuracy. So here we go. You make, you start your practice in a new hospital. You make x-rays full leg weight bearing of each and every patient you want to do an osteotomy and you make full leg weight bearing x-rays after each procedure and out of that together with your planning you know your aim of planning you become more and more accurate and my accuracy in the different hospitals I work is within two degrees I cannot be more accurate I found out, that's my personal preference, and I'm doing hundreds of osteotomies a year. But that is, normally, it's, it's the best I can get, and it works for my patient. I know that because I've done so consistently in evaluating the accuracy of my radiology department, together with my planning, with the planning tools I use. I mean, you can evaluate that personally. Can I just jump in, right? It was interesting, we looked at, we looked at everyone's results in the UK with the UCOR, and one of the things that we saw was quite a big variation in terms of uh, uh, planned and executed osteotomies. There was quite a big spread um, uh, in terms of the results. But we've got those lovely papers now from Marseille, from Matt Olivier, and actually the, um, the, the, the most accurate way uh, to, to, to carry out your osteotomy is with PSI. And they have extremely accurate results using the PSI system, patient specific. Mm -hmm. PSI means? Oh, specific. Okay. So, so in intraoperatively, do you do anything to reduce this error? Like, yeah. So, so, that, so that was the second question. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, I, I work in different places around the world. One of the practices is in Abu Dhabi, and they have a radio lucent table. That's the only place where I make use of an alignment rod. And an alignment rod is a stiff stick. It's not your cautery uh, wire. Your cautery wire is inconsistent and is not a straight line. However you tension it. So use an alignment rod. I only use the alignment rod there and I take care of the rotation of the leg in a radiolucent setting. In any other setting I work, I just rely on my planning. If you do a proper planning following the seven steps I taught you about, you can be very accurate. And don't compromise any of these steps 
um, just go over it again and again to make your, your best preoperative planning. And intraoperatively, no, I'm not adapting according to alignment rods of the, or these things. I just stick to my plan. And do you use a shoes view or a Rosenberg view for a planning? Yes, in some of these cases, and we've described that in one of in, 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 in several of the books, you have to correct for some ligament laxity causing the um, deformity. There are different ways to to, to work with. I use Rosenberg views to do these rather complex plannings with, with corrections of plannings. It's a, it's a difficult topic to talk about. Rosenberg views or shoes views I also use when I have to do a diagnosis of the knee. We all, we all know that lateral osteoarthritis is in the posterolateral part of the knee. You will not find it in your full extended knee x-rays, but you will find it in a Rosenberg view. So these x-rays can be very important for that reason. Okay, great. What we're going to do now, thank you so much, Ronald. That was brilliant. Really fantastic lecture. So we're going we're gonna to we're gonna show some case, case examples uh, that Rags has prepared. If we could get those slides up now and show that video, if that's okay. And I think we're seeing you later for some, some gems on femoral osteotomy. Oh, 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 okay, okay. I'll see you later on that. I'll have to go back to that presentation. Then. Thank you very much. Cheers, Ronald. Cheers. So hopefully what we're going to have now is um, examples of uh, HTO, a DFO, and a double level. And hopefully we've got a video of that. We actually, can we go to his second lecture, the one, not that one, can we get the, the second video that he sent us? Okay, okay definitely. Second. Yeah, the second one, which is titled Case Examples for Planning, just so we... Definitely, we will be on the same. Yeah, that was quite impressive. It's obviously quite early in the morning in the Netherlands, and I think an hour earlier in the UK. So Ronald was obviously up very early this morning to join us. of uh, knee osteotomy surgery, including planning, surgical strategy, and rehabilitation. So some of the papers that I'm presenting today were used as part of our um, ESCA consensus statement. So I've been asked to talk about um, uh, the meniscus and, it, and its involvement with osteotomy surgery. So I'm gonna specifically look at degenerative meniscus tears. We're gonna talk a little bit about root repair and then we're going to talk about meniscus transplant. So let's dive straight into the degenerative medial meniscus. There's a lot of good papers out there looking at combined surgery together with high tibial osteotomy surgery. This was a paper published looking at the five-year results and essentially it showed that it's a safe procedure to do. So from a safety perspective, one can expect the patient to um, do well from surgery and without any significant complications. When we put this question to a UK expert panel to see who does this and who doesn't, as you can see from this graph, it was quite a mixed response. So in some cases, um, uh, the surgeons never performed it. However, as you can see, a lot of surgeons were selective 
and uh, and sometimes performed arthroscopic surgery as part of their um, osteotomy procedure to deal with either a meniscus, normally a meniscus tear or a cartilage lesion. But do we need to do it? This is a fantastic paper where Ronald Van Heerwarden is part of the um, the group that um, published this. And in fact, this was led by uh, a group of rheumatologists um, looking at the outcomes following knee distraction or high tibial osteotomy surgery uh, based in the Netherlands. And they came up with a clever algorithm using um, very good MRI scanners following high tibial osteotomy or joint distraction surgery. And just by doing the procedure alone, you can see there's a significant improvement in the cartilage thickness with um, significant clinical benefit. The uh, um, other papers looking at the effectiveness of concurrent procedures during high tibial osteotomy, um, including this systematic review and meta-analysis, found that there was little effect on clinical outcomes as well as x-ray outcomes um, if you did a arthroscopic procedure together with the osteotomy. They did see, however, some improvements um, when repeat arthroscopy was, was performed during plate removal, some evidence of histological improvement if a um, microfracture had been performed, and also in MRI findings. So in, in our uh, practice, we no longer perform routine uh, arthroscopic surgery. Um, we find that it helps with a um, reduced tourniquet time with less pain from, from the surgery itself. And we've found that, that in our practice, anecdotally, it's not affected our clinical outcomes. And we only really consider doing arthroscopic surgery if the patient's complaining of mechanical, um, significant mechanical symptoms. So uh, it's no longer a major feature of our practice. How about combining it with root repair? Well, it's certainly possible. Let's firstly go dive into how we perform um, a root repair. So this, these are some arthroscopic images of a procedure that myself and um, Prof did. And you can see there's a root tear and we've used a knee scorpion to pass some tape uh, into the uh, root. Uh, we've passed it twice in a luggage tag fashion. And this is an arthroscopic root guide with the arthrex set that allows us to pass a flip cutter into the knee joint, use a shaver to clear the area, to make sure there's no cartilage and that we're fixing directly onto bone. We then make a tibial tunnel and we pull these uh, repair sutures into the tunnel. And as you can see, while, when we cinch the um, sutures uh, right down, that the, um, the root uh, is repaired uh, nicely and we can have a centralization of the medial meniscus um, uh, and we then fix this on the tibia uh, using a swivel lock. So it's a combination of uh, tapes. And you can also put in some biological um, augmentation, uh, whether that's a BMAC or PRP. The other technical tip is to perform the osteotomy at a lower level compared to where you would normally um, perform your osteotomy and then fix above uh, the level of your um, of your plate and screws. The advantages are that you avoid conflict with your proximal drill holes, but of course the disadvantage is you're going into more of a diaphyseal region and therefore the osteotomy may take longer to heal. The question is, does it need to be done? So having um, gone through the literature, um, we've I found um, uh, lots of info, uh, data suggesting that actually the most important thing is still the osteotomy and that uh, whether you're looking at systematic reviews or meta-analyses, the effective repair of medial root is not the essential part of the procedure and that may not necessarily need to uh, a clinically uh, beneficial outcome. Let's finish off the third uh, portion of this um, talk and this is looking at meniscus transplant. Now, the, the group that's um, synonymous with meniscus transplant surgery is a good friend of the group, and that's the, um, the Vedonks. Now, we work with Peter Vedonk, and as you know, René Vedonk is, um, is one of the pioneers of a meniscus transplant um, surgery. And essentially, what they found was that if you were to combine a medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy with a meniscus um, allograft, you can see from this um, table in the top right if you did a medial meniscus allograft on its own, survivorship at um, 14 years was 52.8%, and 
However, uh, combined with a high tubal osteotomy, it was higher as 83.3%. So there's a clear benefit in combining it with the um, tubal osteotomy. And once again, this is a survivorship um, graph um, demonstrating that actually the survivorship um, is greater. Uh, however, the functional outcomes, interestingly, were, were similar uh, with or without the osteotomy. So how do you perform an osteotomy together with a medial meniscus transplant? Well, th some of the manufacturers have developed some very clever techniques on, on how to do this. And this was a nice technical tip um, which demonstrated the new clip uh, technique on uh, performing osteotomy and uh, meniscus uh, transplant. Now, I'm, I'm aware that the, this is not um, readily available to everybody. But however, if it is, it's a fantastic way of planning your osteotomy and planning your uh, tunnels for your roots, your anterior and posterior roots, and the planning software provided by the um, group at Nuclip can make this a very um, a much more straightforward procedure. So the setup is as per standard. Um, the, the, this is our typical wound as one we, we would also do. Um, ours is more of an oblique incision, but this is a longitudinal inc incision along the, uh, over the hamstrings and the standard portals you would perform for a meniscus transplant. The uh, meniscus transplant in this uh, um, situation being used has bone blocks anterior and posteriorly. And at the initial um, phase of the procedure is to apply the 3D printed cutting block and positioning it um, uh, on the um, anteromedial surface of the tibia. And this fits like a jigsaw puzzle because it is uh, planned on a CT scan and you pre-drill the drill holes for your tibial osteotomy. And as you can, at the front here, as you can see in my arrow, uh, these are the uh, drill holes for the um, uh, anterior root and the posterior root. So more or less, this is all positioned nicely for you. You prepare the uh, medial side of the knee as per standard fashion, removing the uh, previous medial meniscus. And you can see in this instance, the lateral compartment is pristine. The different guides are passed in a standard fashion and a flip cutter is deployed to make your um, tibial sockets for the bone plugs in the meniscus transplant. Um, and um, the, um, the meniscus is then brought into the knee joint and using a combination of your posterior medial uh, portal as well as outside in and inside out um, suturing, you can uh, fix your meniscus in place. And then you perform the osteotomy using the slot on the um, on the guide here. Um, these wires are there to protect the hinge, and I know there'll be some talk about protecting the hinge a bit later on. And once you've done your osteotomy, you simply open simply open up the osteotomy. Your drill holes are already drilled in. You put the plate on and fill in the uh, drill holes. So this can be a very straightforward way of performing this particular procedure. What are the results? Well, the results are quite um, are really good. Um, in fact, you're looking at the return to work following this combined procedure by um, Brian, Brian Cole's group. Um, he demonstrated that um, there's a high return uh, to work with 100% at um, just under 10 months and 87.5% uh, returning to sports uh, with a significant improvement in pain and function. Of course, the downside is in this particular study, there was no control group, but nonetheless, these are encouraging results. So in summary, medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy surgery in isolation is an incredibly effective procedure in the right patient. Combined surgery can be technically challenging, and I, was always, I would always advise seeing other surgeons um, before undertaking this type of procedure just for some help and guidance. And no matter what procedure you're thinking of doing, always consider the alignment first. My take home message is, um, number one, always think of osteotomy because um, getting the alignment right will make all your other procedures are more likely to be successful. Next, you think about ligament reconstruction, third place meniscus transplant, fourth place articular cartilage repair. And, and then the final thing, which is equal, equally important as the procedure itself is the rehabilitation. And this was a, the message given at one of the ESCA meeting by um, Hirschman and his team. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found that useful. Um, we would love to welcome you at the London Osteotomy Centre and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and, to you today uh, about the role of osteotomy and its connection with uh, meniscus. Thank you, all the faculties, and uh, this is the last lecture of this session. And and uh, you can ask questions. The our fac um, faculty will answer that questions. So my question is regarding planning again. Uh, many times when there is severe uh, various deformity, what happens is the points to plot are not clearly visible. The, the, the high, highest point of the uh, femoral condyle and deepest part of the tibial plate are not well demarcated. So at that point, how to mark those points? <coughs> the, the, the software programs that are available make it much easier because you can expand your x-ray. So what they all do is you do a preliminary, very rough, middle of the, middle of, middle of the hip, great trochanter, femur, femur, middle of the femur, tibia, tibia, middle of the tibia, middle of the ankle. And then it allows you to zoom in. So you can actually make a proper circle around the hip and make sure you're in the middle. You can blow up the great trochanter. You go across the tip. You go down to the knee. It allows you to take it right out. You're right, when there are osteophytes, it makes it more difficult. But actually, normally, it's fairly straightforward to pick out where the extremities are of the femur and the tibia and the middle and so on. There's a very good service that Nuclip will be launching very soon, and they'll be doing a free planning service. So you can say, I want to do an osteotomy for someone in Varus. I want to take them to 55%, 53%, whatever you want. They will take the long leg x-ray and the CT if you have it, but long leg will be fine. And they will then do the planning for you and tell you what all the figures are and give you a surgical plan based on what you want. And I think that service is going to be available this year. This question is, sir, uh, many times we find patients in their 40s with uh, severe medial compartment osteoarthritis with uh, deformity, various deformity. and. When we do MRI or uh, do some other investment, we find some arthritis in lateral and even PF joint. So uh, considering their age, are they good candidate for osteotomy or uh, we should directly go on for uh, TKR? So one of the things that the consensus looked at was, that was lateral osteoarthritis and do we accept it? And everyone in the consensus group had to vote and score and there was a very high level of agreement that if you've got medial symptoms, medial problems, you can accept grade two lateral compartment OA. So don't worry about it. Obviously, if there's advanced osteoarthritis and then it starts to become very tenuous as to whether or not you're going to go ahead with an osteotomy. But yes, you can do an osteotomy where there's lateral disease up to grade two. Uh, does our MPT and LDFA changes whether uh, we are taking the measurement in supine position or in st standing position? For the uh, MPT, LDFA value will remain same whether you do it in a supine or a standing position. So why we are focusing on getting a standing uh, long weight bearing X-rays? Yeah, so it makes an enormous difference if you do it standing or lying. So if you take out the weight bearing, then you don't have an accurate um, answer. Another really interesting thing, recently there's been some good papers published um, showing accuracy of short leg versus long leg. And short leg is really quite inaccurate. You really have to have a full length x-ray and it has to be weight bearing. In uh, pre-op uh, planning, we are not discussing the joint line convergence angle. So if there is an increased JLC, you have to subtract it basically. So uh, are you focusing on JLC or uh, we can ignore it? Well, it's one of the most important things to look at is, is how much um, joint line convergence angle you have, particularly in a ligament deficient patient where you might have an enormous opening. So you compare it to the other side and use the other side as a guide to give you an idea on what would be normal for someone who's got a ligament problem. And yeah, we have to calculate the joint line convergence angle. Is, is there any standardized formula to calculate? like? If JLC is say around seven degrees, so how do you subtract and what is yeah, the Yeah, there baseline? is. It is a, it, there's a really complex paper by Noise, and he gives you the trigonometry for it. But basically, you, you, you measure what the patient has. If they have nine, 
um, then you um, divide it by two and you compare it with the other side. So you, you don't want to accept more than five degrees of joint line um, um, uh, uh, convergence. Thank you. So one question from me regarding complications of opening wedge osteotomy. Uh, I also had a couple of them. So especially in obese ladies, uh, putting a medial side plate, there's a wound dehiscence a lot of times and a lot of time fat necrosis kind of thing. So how to avoid that complication and what do you do if something like that happens? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, uh, it, it's a real problem when we have a soft tissue issue with an osteotomy. And it all comes down to, um, uh, I mean, touch wood, we haven't had a major problem now in our, in our hands um, for a number of years. We've seen some infection, but, but, but um, not what you've just described. And I think when we see Christian doing the procedure and also in, the, in my lecture, we'll talk a little bit about how we manage the soft tissues. Because like all these operations, it's the same with the trauma cases. If you strip everything away so you can see the bare bones, so you can fix the fractures, they don't do so well as a minimally invasive technique. So it's about handling the soft tissues. One of the things is the management of the MCL, which we're going to talk about. How can we do that in a really good way that doesn't disturb the soft tissue and the vascular supply and so on? But yeah, it's a nightmare. One thing that I've learned from Ronald since I've been working with him for the last three or four years is before he was super aggressive with infection. So if someone had a deep infection, we would go back, we would take the plate out, we would take all the bone graft out, we would put in some cerement uh, packed with uh, uh, vancomycin, a bone substitute, and then we would, re and then we would replate, and then we would put them on antibiotics. What he does, and I think it's a very good thing, is he just suppresses the infection until we have union and then we take the plate out and then uh, it's the end of the infection. <coughs> so my question is regarding pl uh, preoperative planning. When there is various deformity, we are told as classically that any AP scanogram should be taken with 15 degree internal rotation so that pattern looks forward. But when there is malrotation, so in that situation, uh, to take the, how do we plan? Because uh, we cannot make the foot AP and that alters it greatly. So there is rotation plus virus. So how do you preoperatively plan? So, yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that one. So there preoperative planning. Yeah. So, Usually, we are told classically for AP scanogram with patella looking forward, yeah. as told by drawer pally, right? Yeah. Now, if there is rotation, patella say looking medially with malunited, malrotated yeah. distal femoral fracture, then how do you going to plan, uh, take the preoperative X-ray and so that you can plan? So I think the absolute key is that the patella is forward and it doesn't when you take in the long leg x-ray is that what you're asking oh the proximal part of the femur remains a little lateral rotated yeah yeah, yeah. so how do you tackle that if you've got if you previously had a fracture and you've yeah. got a rotational so yeah. in that situation sorry you have to do a rotational ct so that you can look at the femur at the top and at the bottom, calculate where and how much rotation there is, same in the tibia, and then as part of your surgical planning, you will um, have to work out what you're going to need to do um, to, to correct that. What you can't do is a rotational correction and a significant varus or valgus correction at the same time. You right. can do a bit, but you can't do much. So normally, it's a two-stage affair. First, we correct the rotation, we let it heal, and then we bring them back, and then we correct varus valgus if we need to. Okay. And okay. okay. Thank you. Sir, uh, I have one question. Sir, do you think, uh, do you always take the into account the coxa vera is there or not? Because if there is a coxa vera, then MLDFA, if you draw the uh, femur, his head is a little more medially. So the MLDFA will be slightly higher. 
So, do you take the first the medial, uh, proximal medial femoral angle and if it is normal then only you take the MLDFA, I mean distal uh, lateral femoral angle? Yeah, uh, I mean I think, I think the top and the bottom angle is important but the real focus for us is the, is the angles at the knee. Okay. So, um, I, th I, I mean obviously Paley has taught us to look in every plane from the top down, rotation, sagittal, coronal and so on. But I think it's complex enough and I think if you are looking at the joint line convergence and the lateral distal femoral angle and the, and the medial proximal tibial angle, those are the three key factors in planning an osteotomy. I think key, that's, diff, more, that's complicated enough yeah. for people. Yeah. Okay. And uh, regarding, sir, I mean, uh, end on view in for the, drawing the joint line, so the uh, tibia uh, lateral angle is, I think, 83 uh, or 81 degree, um, uh, there is a 9 degree posterior slope. Normal slope. So, if you take the complete extension, so there will not be an end on view of the tibial plateau. So, the, uh, uh, does that make a joint line uh, drawing a little more difficult? No, uh, but uh, intraoperatively, you, when you're doing, when you're placing your hinge wire, it's important that you can see straight through the joint. So, usually, we need to flex the knee slightly yeah. when we're placing our wires and before we make the saw cut, so we can get the saw into exactly the right position. And in that situation, we usually have to flex the knee slightly for, for those steps. But when we're planning, no, it doesn't, we don't worry about that. We don't make the knee, we don't make the patients yeah, flex slightly, yeah. no. Okay, okay so last, so last one, then we'll have yeah, some questions. The common scenario in India is bilateral knee varus. Sorry? Uh, in India, the common scenario is patient is having varus on both the side, but symptomatic only on one side. So you do a correction on one side, whether due to chondral damage, meniscus or ACL, so one side get corrected, second side is not symptomatic. So there is a lot of get disturbances which is there postoperatively. So he's not a happy patient even after high tibial osteotomy. So what's the solution on that? So if someone's got bilateral severe varus and you correct one side and le you leave the other side, usually they come back and, and they ask to have their other side corrected because they just don't like the varus. And also if they've got extreme varus, there's a very high um, possibility of developing meniscal and chondral pathology in the future. But actually most people, the, the corrections are quite subtle. So you, you do a unilateral correction and they're still varus on one side and then they're neutral, slightly valgus on the other and their gait's fine and they're happy with their appearance. Is, is that answer your question? Yeah, so uh, yeah. the yeah. same question Dr. Amit was asking, the bilateral constitutional varus patient yeah. presented to you. So will you like to keep the uh, symptomatic side a little bit in the virus? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question there. I mean, I think, I think in the future we're going to be tailoring it to the patient. We'll be doing gait analysis and we'll be working out where their weight-bearing um, Michelitz line is and we'll be tailoring it. I think to be safe, you go to the midline. And if you're slightly under, these patients are happy. If you're slightly over, these patients are happy. But I think these big... Um, uh, valgus corrections, I don't think the patients are happy and we don't do that anymore. So we're aiming for the midline. A really interesting thing is the patient that has had an osteotomy, like Mark Ferguson, the surgeon, he's very slightly valgus. Now, as his next step, he's a very fit guy, he's 58, he doesn't want a total knee. If he does need a partial knee replacement, should we take him from valgus back into slight varus again? and we've been talking to him about it in the future. At the moment, he's happy. So there's, but, but to answer your question, I think you go for the midline. So last question, and we'll have some coffee. Yeah, so suppose you're doing an HTO in a patient with a bit of patellofemoral osteoarthritis. So do you plan the biplanar cut, like in the preoperative stage, do you plan the biplanar cut to be superior or inferior based, based on the patellofemoral and the patellar height? Do you take that into consideration preoperatively? Yeah, I mean, I think for big, we, we used to do quite big corrections in the tibia. It was not that uncommon to do 12, 13, 14, 15 millimeter corrections. Now we're doing so many more double level osteotomies, we very rarely go above 12 millimeters. It's really uncommon. Sometimes the patients have isolated disease just in the tibia and a big 15, 17 millimeter is, is appropriate, but it's really uncommon. So the corrections are quite small. So we don't do, descend, we don't do a, um, a, a descending biplane anymore. We always do an ascending biplane because it doesn't really change the patella height. Um, it's a good question though. Should we do a, a, a descending biplane and should we change the height of the patella slightly to improve the patellofemoral arthritis? 
But I mean, we, we, we ignore patellofemoral arthritis if the patient's not complaining of that as a problem and we focus on the, on the medial or lateral disease. All right, so we have a coffee and then maybe we'll reconvene in, uh, in 15 minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. We had a wonderful morning session. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to make sure this is still working. Hello. Hello. The audio to the Hello. 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 Okay. 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 Amasun to watch is the way to Mike to Badi the Wahoo. Mike to Bara? You have a Mike to the Chishkin. Dada. I because because I can a Ball ball. About a Sundach is Poriska? Huh? Poriska Hello, 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 Hello. 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 Hello, <laughs>
tips, some tricks, some of the some of the the, the new concepts that we've developed over the last few years, and then we're going to see that in action with the live surgery uh, with Bushan and Christian in a bit. So um, I've already showed you. Yeah, wait one minute. I would like to call the chairperson, Dr. Pratyu Chatterjee, sir, and Sorry. Dr. Ranji, sir, to please join us on the stage. Sorry. Sure, we are a couple of minutes late, sure, minute late Adrian. Never mind, you, you can carry on, start, please. Thank you very much. So, um, See, we talked about this evolution and, and of course, the, the, the technique has evolved a lot. And um, I want to talk about that and talk about some of the subtle but very important new developments that we've made um, in, in the last few years. And, and one of them actually has come from, from Greg. He's absolutely obsessed with osteotomy. He's the CEO of Nuclip. And it, it was his idea to actually um, in introduce this concept of a, of a hinge wire. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and about the hinge um, in this talk. So we're working closely with their engineers. You can see Ronald Sachin. Um, you've got uh, JP, who uh, is, the, is the lead engineer. He's co-owner with Greg of this company. And we get together on a regular basis to talk about innovations. So when Neil Thomas, uh, who, who was the mentor to me, when he first went to the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, uh, this, uh, Carl Nissen was doing osteotomy surgery by placing an osteotome against the, the skin. And without even making an incision, he was hitting the osteotome through the skin and into the bone um, and was doing it without making a skin incision. And then we went to these really big incisions so we could really see what we were doing when we first started the osteotomy. Here we were doing something in the knee as well at the same time. And this is not a good situation for the patient. So we went then to an oblique incision with a second window for the big Tomafix plate. And now with these small plates, we use a, a small longitudinal incision. I think, I think these ConMed have also got a system similar to Stryker. I think these precision saw blades are very good because they make the surgery safer, because you can cut down onto your finger. And you've all seen me showing this video numerous times before, but I, I don't feel particularly happy doing osteotomy surgery without this tool in my hand. So um, again, this is a bit historic here. And the question that everyone says to us is, what do you do with the PES? And what do you do with the MCL? Now here you can see me making an incision. And this is pretty old school. I'm making a, a, a slight L shape and I would peel the whole thing back and, and peel the whole MCL back. And we're going to show you in the live surgery and in this talk how we can actually preserve the MCL. And look how I'm fighting with this Homan to go round the back because I'm tensing the MCL. And we're going to show you the two window technique so we can avoid uh, doing this and make things safer. So we've got this small plate. We use this for under 10 millimeters. We use this for over 10 millimeters um, corrections. And they have these ACL plates. And they even have a, um, a, a two hole, a very short now um, medial closing wedge plate. And they've also developed with Ronald some new rotation plates. OK, so let's, let's look at the MCL. Um, here's, the, here's, here's a, a, a drawing. So. We used to make, there's the joint line. And what we want to be is in the middle of the tibia. So it's, it's an oblique incision, one centimeter below the joint line, and traveling for five to six centimeters distally so we can get the plate in. So this is a, um, a, a new idea that I developed with Christian. Um, and you can see, you'll, you'll see it in action in the video. So we've marked out uh, the distal femur and the joint line. This is the skin incision, back of the tibia, front of the tibia. And then you can see, as we go through the video, we're going to cut through the skin. And then obviously, that l takes us down through Scarpa's fascia um, to the um, superficial MCL. And then what we're doing, which is different, and we ha is 
um, and you'll see this in the live surgery, is we're making two windows. So we're going to leave the MCL alone and we're going to find the back of the tibia. So here, coming into the pes, we've opened the, the pes up just as we would do to find the hamstrings during an ACL reconstruction and we open up the pes and here you can see un underneath the MCL, this is the traditional way of trying to pull back the MCL to allow us access. But what we want to do now is make a separate window at the back. Don't peel the MCL off. Make this separate window at the back. Scratch up the back of the tibia. Feel it all the way to the fibula head. And then we can place our homen and we know we're completely safe. So we can put this in. It's in the right orientation from the back, working slightly uphill, and we're not fighting against the MCL. And then we've developed this new retractor and it's, it's got some metal in it so you can see it on x-ray and we can touch the fibula head which gives us a really nice um, initial guide to where we are and now we can start to pull back the MCL and we can release the MCL we can identify the patella tendon at the front but we can release the MCL and here what we're doing is fixing this retractor and fixing the MCL with um, some, some uh, K wires. So this physically gets locked into the bone. And obviously we take an X-ray and make sure that we're in the right place. Now it's got a slot running down the middle of it that accepts the saw blade. So you can actually cut this piece of bone here. You often get caught on because you actually go deeper into the slot. So you can cut very, very safely right the way down, from th uh, cutting the tibia into the slot so we can cut the whole of the back of the tibia very, very safely. We can feel the retractor and feel ourselves going into the slot from this retractor. It leaves the patient with less swelling at the end because uh, we have hemostasis as we go. So here's where the retractor is being placed physically on the bone and we're locking it into, into position. And then we can take the x-ray, we can make sure that the slot is actually where we want it to be based on the x-ray and then we can make the saw cut. Now what we do is we've, we've, we've made the dissection down the back of the tibia. Now we're releasing the front of the MCL. So this is the MCL release. We, we do it after we've placed the retractor. So here now we're releasing the MCL using a periosteal but keeping the MCL intact and we're just working our way down with a cob or with a, with a, um, a periosteal elevator and then taking it out of the way and then we're making our saw cut. So we've made two windows, one at the back of the tibia, placed the retractor and then we found the front of the superficial MCL, we've peeled it back by releasing it, getting it to the tension that we want and then we hold it back with a small home and, and then we make the saw cut. So um, this is what it looks like and I really like this slot because it means that when we make the cut we can, we can, we can go beyond. Now what we want to avoid, this is cadaveric, is we don't want to see this and this is obviously not a real patient, this is all cadaveric specimens. And so, um, let me just see. This was the original thought processes and we printed this metal off. We wanted something that would go around the back. That we thought maybe we'd, we'd lock it into the, um, into, the, into the fibula head. So again, let's just go through this. So we've got the, uh, we've got the pes anserinus, the joint line. We've got the distal femur. And you can see we've marked out um, uh, the tendons. So if we look at the surgical approach, we're marking out an oblique incision because we want to be in the middle of the tibia, one centimeter below the joint line. And in the, in, initially in this cadaveric um, uh, 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 dissection, we're making a skin incision and we could do the osteotomy very safely through a nice small incision like that. But of course, when you're starting out uh, and when you're less experienced, you make a bigger incision so that you can see things more clearly. So then for this cadaveric, um, and that might be the incision that you, that you work with. So now if we go to a deeper dissection to look at the, those structures. So we've cut the skin away and we've got the patella tendon at the front here. 
and we've, we're marking out the ascending biplane if we were going to make it. Just to show everyone the uh, anatomy, there it is there. And now, this is the, these are the, the bits that everybody gets hung up on. So here's the hamstrings, and all you need to do is go into the bursa and open up your clip as wide as you can, and the hamstrings fall away. And then, and in a big osteotomy, you might release them a little bit, but otherwise, we leave them alone. So that's all you need to do for the hamstrings, is put a clip inside the bursa and open like that. And then you've protected them. You have them for, for function. You have them for an ACL if you need them. But most importantly, the patient does their hamstrings for function. So here's the superficial MCL. Now, normally, what I showed in those first videos was we would come in from the front, and we would get underneath the MCL, and we would start to dissect it, and we would peel it off like we would in a knee replacement. And we all know from Pudu's work and from many different surgeons, you can cut the superficial MCL at this point if you want to, but equally it's quite nice to preserve it. Now this is completely the wrong angle for your retractor because you're aiming posteriorly because you're coming from the front. So the really clever thing is to make a second window behind the MCL here. And we just use the tip of a clip to do this normally, not a knife. And then we can put a periosteal, a cob, a nice small spinal cob retractor, and we can scratch, scratch, scratch all the way under popliteus, all the way to the back, and avoid the neurovascular structures, particularly the aberrant branch of the popliteal artery, which can sometimes be deep to the popliteus. So you can cut that with a saw. And that's why these patients sometimes get severe pain afterwards. It's because of the swelling that comes from damaging that. Now we release the MCL. We've done the posterior dissection, now we release the MCL. We do that in, down the longitudinal aspects of the MCL. We place a second retractor, and now we can place the wire, and then we can cut the bone. So that's the new way of managing the neurovascular structures and the MCL. So I hope that makes sense, and we're obviously going to get Christian to show us that. And we've seen that video already. So the, the next thing that always gets asked is, what about the hinge? How can we, how can we protect the hinge? And here's um, Professor Takuchi with Christian. And we're all familiar with his classification system for hinge fractures. Type 1, which is an inevitable part of an osteotomy. So if you do a CT scan, everybody has a Takuchi 1 on a CT scan. And it's not a problem. Takuchi 2 is where the where the fracture goes down into the proximal tib fib joint. And this is a problem. These patients have persisting pain, and they're inherently unstable as a result of this. And of course, a type 3, which we don't want to see, where the fracture goes up into the joint. And when we do see this, 99% of the time, it's because we haven't gone far enough with our osteotomy. Our hinge point is too close to the midline. So when we open, we propagate a fracture. And we'll talk about how to manage that. So what we've developed is a new concept to place a screw here. And we've, all, we, all we're using is a, um, a, a um, threaded screw that has got a differential pitch, like a, a compression screw, uh, Accutrac, Herbert, whatever. And we, a new clip have now developed a system for this. When we see this situation, and this is standard for us now, standard practice is to make this more stable, stabilize this fracture with a hinge screw. If you have a type 2, you really should just get in there and put a plate on because these can go on to a non-union. They can take months to settle down. So if you see a type 2, probably this is what you should be doing. Definitely intraoperatively. Often you pick these up postoperatively, and this is the solution if you want to go for um, rapid solution. If you have a type 3, you, you undo the osteotomy, you put the osteotomy back where it came from, and then you place a palisade of screws as you would for any uh, tibial plateau fracture, and then you go back, you open up the osteotomy, and you fix it in the, in the, in the usual way. So Takuchi 1 is not a complication. Now, for those of you that use the, the Tomafix plate, you're familiar with the fact that it's a flexible plate, and there was this concept of the, um, of the golden screw. In fact, it wasn't golden, it was, um, I think it was, yeah, well, anyway. So by placing this screw, you can compress the hinge. And this is a very nice idea 
and a very clever thing that we all liked about the Toma fixed plate. But what it was doing was, it was, this is an, let me just go back to that, this is an indirect fixation of a fracture. So it's not direct fixation, and that is not how we treat fractures. It worked, and it pulled the uh, fracture back nicely, but that is not standard practice for orthopedic surgeons. So Greg, uh, together with Matt, and, uh, and together with, um, with uh, um, Seb Perra, they, they developed this hinge wire concept, and they showed that the maximum load to breakage, if you used a hinge wire, went up by 900% just by placing a simple wire across at the, level of the, at the level of the hinge. Now, because this could be incorporated into a PSI guide, this is, this is the way they placed it, from, from low and medial to high and proximal, um, which is not the way we're doing it currently. Uh, intraoperatively, but you can get these massive openings because of this protection of the hinge wire. So this was their concept, uh, and it really is something that everybody should do for every osteotomy because it's so simple to place a hinge wire. So what we do actually is we place this hinge wire intraoperatively um, uh, from out from above and coming down for the typical medial opening wedge, and in the femur we would go from low and we would come across and do exactly the same thing. And what we do now is, and you'll see Christian doing this, we place this by hand. We place it midway between the fibular head and the Gerdes tubercle. And so you're in the middle of the tibia, you place it by hand and you find the edge of the joint, screen it, you pop it fairly horizontally to get purchase. And then you go into a more oblique, um, and you only need to come to here. This is doesn't need to be down here, it just needs to be to here, and you tap it in with a mallet. Really simple, takes a few minutes, and it gives you an 800% increase in your, in your hinge. So here's an example, uh, this guy has, here's the wire coming in, um, and again, easy to do that um, uh, by hand, and we've swapped it for a hinge screw, and this is what the post-operative pictures look like. And this guy actually was interesting because we'd done one side two months earlier without, and we did the hinge screw side with, and he, he did feel much more comfortable. This is him the day after surgery, taking weight and rocking between the two legs without pain. Um, and in the future, once we have the biomechanical answers to this, and we're getting some nice preliminary data from Washington, from Wimmy and his group, maybe it will be two. But at the moment, it's one screw for us. And here's a example, that's an example of a femur, sorry, the pictures haven't come through. This guy's had his DFO, and this is him walking. And now, we're, when we have an intact hinge, and we use a hinge screw, we let these patients mobilize immediately full weight bearing, with, fe with the femoral osteotomies as well. So we developed this kit, and it comes with everything that you need in the box. Uh, so it's got this little um, packaging that's also part and parcel of the of the kit from, from Nuclip. Uh, obviously, you don't need to use this. You can just use any um, compression screw that you've got in the hospital. This just happens to be an easy way of doing it. This is a multi-purpose screwdriver, and it has a tissue, soft tissue guide. There's a drill bit in the kit. There is, there is the hinge wire, and there's a guide wire for the screw. So it's all there. The, this bone is so soft that um, uh, you don't need to tap the screws uh, at that level. There's the screw they've developed. It's 50 millimeters long, which is plenty. Um, and this screwdriver is also a depth gauge. So it's got a, a way of measuring um, if you want to be more precise about um, how um, deep you're going with the, um, there it is, that's the depth gauge bit. And this is a Takuchi 2 to show you that this patient has got a, um, a, a Takuchi 2, and in this situation, we would put a second plate on uh, like that, and they, they immediately feel more comfortable, and it's the end. If you don't, the worrying is that these are gonna go on and on, and they're gonna complain of pain, they're gonna be miserable, and they're gonna end up with a non-union potentially. And then Takuchi 3, you just put a palisade of screws. So there you have it, so that's the, the management of the MCL, protecting the neurovascular structures and, um, and the new hinge screw idea. So I think we're well and truly on time, so let's 
see if they're ready in the operating thing. Oh, any questions? Sorry. Thank you, Adrian. Is there any question from the audience? Yes. So this MCL release technique, sir, we have also tried to do this, but when we release it all and put our home in, uh, what happens is the MCL tends to peel off from inferior side. So any tricks not to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just familiarizing yourself with the technique. The biggest problem is hitting it with the saw. So even when you put the second retractor in and you put the saw, you actually damage it with the saw. It doesn't really make a massive difference because we know we can cut it at that level. But it is really nice to see the MCL still preserved at the end of the procedure. And I think you just, it's, a, it's a practice thing. You release it with the cob. You feel the tension digitally as you're opening the osteotomy. If you, if you can't open the osteotomy, you need to check the biplane and make sure the biplane is complete. You need to check the back. Put a metal ruler, thin metal ruler. Make sure you've cut the back and you've gone far enough um, to your hinge. And the most common thing by far is not releasing the MCL, and that's why you can't open your osteotomy, because you haven't released your MCL. And the other thing that we've learned is we worry so much about changing the slope in an opening wedge osteotomy. We've been talking about it for years. We've been having debates, and everyone says the problem with an opening wedge osteotomy is it tends to increase slope. Sure. And we always focused on the trigonometry of the bone, the fact that it's a triangular bone, and you therefore have to, as you're opening the osteotomy, you have to take into account the fact that the distance at the anterior aspect of the bone is less than the distance at the back of the bone. And you therefore need to open right at the back. Actually, what causes a change in the slope with an opening wedge osteotomy is not releasing the MCL and it pulls the, um, pulls the tibial slope because the MCL isn't released. So I think that's the biggest single cause of an increased slope in an opening wedge osteotomy is not adequately releasing the MCL. So a few of the cases where MCL didn't peel off, those patients complained of medial side, this side had pain after surgery. So is that because of tight MCL, because that was... Uh, the, the, the MCL stressed afterwards because of osteotomy. Is it the possibility? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the biggest cause of ongoing pain on the medial side after an osteotomy is usually the plate. So you take the plate out, but if you don't adequately release the MCL, then they have pain, definitely. Okay. Thank you so much. So, just, a uh, minute, just a minute, gentlemen. Before you, yes, you, please. It's me. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, it's a hinge fracture while doing open wedge high tibial osteotomy. If it is more than 15 degrees, it's very uh, often. So uh, using this long strut plate like Tomofix or Power <laughs> Peak, uh, this plate. So is it necessary to fix all the time this hinge fracture, or in some cases like if the gap is too much or something like that, then you fix it? So. Yeah, so just to summarize on the hinge fracture, so type 1, if you do a CT scan, you always see it, and it's not a problem. If you have a type 1 fracture and you see translocation of the bone, that's a problem, and you need to do something about it. And you need to reduce the tibia, and you need to hold it with a hinge screw or one of the other techniques that we've, that we've developed. The most important thing is your, is your care with your hinge. So you stop. You don't go all the way. You stop a centimeter, maybe 12 millimeters before. You don't have to fix those fractures with a hinge screw, um, type 1. But we think, and we need to prove it now, and anecdotally it does seem to make a difference, if you place a screw, it's very helpful. If you see a type 2 intraoperatively, you should fix it with a plate. If you see a type 3 intraoperatively, you should fix it with screws. And in the femur, if you break the hinge, you have to fix it with a small plate. Even if you get it absolutely perfect and you fix with your medial um, plate and you, your, your hinge fracture is not a problem anymore because you can't see it, you have to open the, the other side and you have to put a small plate on if you have a hinge fracture in a femur. So uh, for, for type 3 hinge fracture, any way your proximal screw of the plate is traveling to the fracture towards the opposite side. So is it necessary to put another screw, separate screw, 
No. Or the screw from the proximal hole of your plate does the work. No, so in a type 3, you just place two or three screws. You don't need a plate. And then you um, do your osteotomy. So, uh, last question about the tips. Is it necessary to cut the tibia with the saw completely toward the lateral part before the point where you want to? Or it's just uh, some part of the tibia, then you cut with the help of chisel? In this way, you will be more protective for so your what vascular yeah, I mean, whatever I think, you just need to go nice and slow. You could do the whole thing with chisels. We saw Dinshaw in Coimbatore, did most of his osteotomy live in, uh, in, in October at the meeting, or November. He did it live, and he did 99% of it was with a saw, very, very slowly and precisely. Or you can use a saw, and you can use a traditional saw, or you can use one of these modern um, uh, saws like the precision saw. But you have to be careful and not go too far. But the hinge wire should stop you from going too far. It's one of the other functions. It physically will stop the saw from, prog from progressing. Thank you. Uh, can I? I? I just wanted to ask, if I understood this correctly, um, uh, the second window behind the, uh, behind the MCL, is, is the function of it uh, to create, to basically dissect away the vascular struct neurovascular structures safely is is that the only for because we are we are yeah. going to introduce a, a homen yeah. in front of the M MCL anyway yeah so the problem with the one coming from the front is you release the MCL but you still have some some tension in it so your homen is always aiming from front to back what you want is your homen to be aiming from back to front so we did this technique we make to make the window to go across and to place the homen. So the homen is not tensioned against the MCL. It's sitting independent of the MCL. It makes a big difference because one of the problems, one of the reasons why people have a neurovascular injury is their homen actually isn't on the bone. It's either underneath, um, on top of popliteus or it's on top of the vessel. Right. And the main cause of bleeding in an osteotomy is, an, is the aberrant branch of the popliteal artery. And instead of that being on top of popliteus, deep posterior, it's actually sitting behind popliteus, yeah. anteriorly, on the bone. So when you cut the bone, this artery is quite big, yeah. and it comes at you like a hose. It's not the main artery, but it's enough to cause lots of pain and swelling afterwards for the patient. So the reason for making the window at the back is because of the angulation of the movement of your hand as you're clearing the Popliteal soft tissue soft and then placing your home. Right, thank you. Okay, just because it's going to be much more interesting, should we, should we go to the live surgery? <laughs> Tell me again. Should we? <laughs> should. Ten more minutes. So, okay. So, he, regarding hinge fracture again, sir, what if you discovered those hinge fracture in post-operative x-ray? How common is this scenario? On table, it looks every, on, in CM, everything looks okay. There is no hinge fracture. And in check x-ray, there is hinge fracture. So, how common are hinge fractures detected afterwards? Yeah. So, that most of the type 2 fractures occur in the first month or two. You don't see it intraoperatively. The patient comes in, you take an x-ray, Post-op, it's fine. At six weeks, you see a fracture. And in that situation, you have two choices. One is crutches for two or three months, and, or six weeks, eight weeks, and take it easy. Or take them to theater and put a plate. And I think, actually, from my experience, I mean, we don't see too many of these. It's better to take them to theater and put a plate. I think we now move on to the life surgery session, right? So we end this session and move on to the live surgery. Perfect. Uh, I mean correction. So we can um, uh, show that and discuss uh, about that patient as well. So next slide, please. Think, uh, this is the uh, history we actually prepared. I think. The patient is a 52-year female, so bilateral left side uh, patient is having the left side pain is more and than the right side for five years. And he is having difficulty in walking for uh, two years. Conservative uh, methods were tried uh, by physiotherapy and quadriceps training exercise. 
but those are not working so i think that's why the patient has been taken for the ot and decided uh, for the uh, investigation further this was the i mean weight bearing ap access probably uh, the lateral view can uh, assess the slope as well the patellofemoral arthritis a little bit may be there and this is the weight bearing and uh, x-ray i think um, and this is the clinical picture of that patient left side a little varus this is what i think they have sent it to the christian there was another uh, weight bearing x-ray was done with the calibration but the the orientation was much better in this uh, without calibrated x-ray so he take the uh, measurement from the calibrated one and then put it on this one for a better assessment can you just um, show us the what are the corrections sir Uh, required so he as uh, as per the christian he said that say mpta was uh, i mean 85 so he thought uh, to correct it a little more uh, around 91% yes so that will be uh, good and for that i think you can see on the x ray that 6 mm of correction will be required so probably that's the whole planning about that patient perfect and i think you know uh, this is a this is actually a very typical amount of opening for us So this is you have to add for the thickness of the saw blade, which is normally 1.2, 1.3 millimeters. So this is a 7.2 millimeter osteotomy, and that's pretty typical for what we would be doing in the UK. So this is a small correction, but it's actually one of the most common osteotomies that we would be carrying out. Okay, and uh, so the line of passing is uh, probably from the 53 percent, or what you uh, prefer on these uh, sort of cases? Where do you want to put the uh, line? weight bearing line yeah so the, the so for us we go to just beyond midline so what we're aiming for is between 50 and 55 that's as accurate as we can really be okay. without psi and um for me if i see it in the midline at the end straight leg and straight on the long leg then i'm very happy okay okay i think that's about the uh, patient i think if anyone has some question then probably we can discuss it further because we still have some time uh, before the surgery starts sir. Uh, one question regarding the hinge you got a two part of the hinge anterolateral and the posterolateral so to manage your slope would you ever do a deliberate posterolateral hinge fracture or anterolateral to manage the slope Yes yeah, so read it's a very good question so you can't change the slope really unless if you're doing it without psi unless you break the hinge so you have to break the hinge and then you can change the slope if you use psi or if you use a, a robot which we don't have at the moment then you can say exactly where your hinge is going to be so if you want the hinge to be at the front so that when you're opening you're flattening the slope and then then the psi can do that for you if you want the hinge to be at the back so that you're hinging at more opening at the front and you're increasing the slope then again the psi will do that for you and a robot will do that for you but for us to be able to pick out a hinge point at the front as opposed to just being in the middle is is extremely difficult so we aim for the middle of the bone and we open the osteotomy and if you want to do a meaningful slope change you you have to break the hinge and so what we do now is we don't try and change the slope from a correction like this for us it's become very very standard to change the slope if that's what we want to do we do it from the front so we take uh christian likes to leave the tibial tubercle on ronald likes to take the tubercle off and ronald does so many of these now we do we do a lot in london that we take the tibial tubercle off completely and then we're looking at the front of the bone we place two wires and we cut the bone and we can either open or we can place four wires and we can remove a wedge of bone and it sounds like a massive operation a slope changing osteotomy you have to get yourself as with all these things familiar with the more basic stuff but that's the way to change slope is, is get a psi so now we need the plate guys that's great one is enough um can you can christian can you hear us Yeah, we hear you well. Can you hear us as well? Perfect. So, are you all set ready to go? You're standing very still. We can't hear you now though.
see if we can get the volume going and whilst we're doing that Christian start to draw out the landmarks for us we sorted we so uh, uh, a small one please this is a small lady let's take a small plate so let's take the anatomical landmarks so the first thing we palpate obviously here is the tibial tubercle okay and from this tubercle we go to here and this is the the level of joint so that's what we see from here now here we can palpate the posterior medial aspect of the tibia which is here and here is the posterior border of the tibia so that goes down to here so this is approximately the surrounding of the tibia if you can see that can you see that? Yeah, we get that, get that very nicely. Okay, perfect. So, traditionally we started here and ended up somewhere here because of a potential revision. So we did not want to be um, completely in line with a, a potential scar resulting after total knee arthroplasty in order not to have two parallel incisions. So this was the preferred choice. We then came rather to the front and said, well, if you're very tiny and minimally invasive approaches, that's no issue. So whenever you are under four centimeters of incision, everything works. You can cut whatever you want. So there is enough vascularity. Well, this one was good enough to go to the front and cut everything from the front. So what we now do, we bring our incision a bit further to the back, rather in the center of this proximal curve of the tibia, like this, in order to, to gain access to the back of the joint as well, and to the back of the medial collateral ligament. So that's the condyle of the femur, going all the way here. So, and as this is going here, this is the epicondyle and now let's pretend that this is our medial collateral all the way here these are the hamstrings going all the way here we want to get rid of those hamstrings peel them back and then we want to gain access to the to the medial collateral here because we want to dive underneath the medial collateral for op uh, multiple reasons but one is the protection of the neurovascular structures so we are not we are not really well equipped up and so far. Do we have the plate now? Perfect. Okay. Do we have a sleeve limiter for this one for the tower? Just a little tube that goes inside to fix it with a temporarily fix it with a um, with a K wire. Okay. It's not existing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, allow us, allow us one more minute of silence just to, to find everything here. No, that's okay. So we don't have that, so we uh, have to fix it with a drill. No, yeah, that's great. That's what we also need. We need two of those for the, for the double level. Two of those for the double level later on. Anyhow, now we have what we need. Guys, we are, we are there. We are there. Okay, let's start the game. I guess uh, we, the next thing we need is two swaps. One for here to place the bovi. This one goes here. That's for you. Can you see everything? I have not... Sorry, the sorry, Christian. We're, I'm having a discussion about opening wedge osteotomy here. Sorry. Yeah, no, we, we see you perfectly. Have you, got, have you got everything? Are you good to go? You got the plate? Yeah. Do we have another hand camera that can be coming from here then? Okay, guys, we just want to, we don't start until you have the perfect view, okay? Yeah, we're a bit, we've got a, a slightly oblique view at the moment. Yeah, this is what we uh, saw um, right now, so that you have two camera views. Yeah, we want someone to look over your shoulder, don't we? Right 
So Christian, just whilst we're waiting, give us some tips on setup. What have you done with the other side? Is the leg just sitting on the table or is it been lowered out of the way? Where are you standing at the moment? It's been, uh, can I have another surgical marker again? Or, uh, where's the surgical marker gone to? Okay, so the other side is uh, lowered a bit. So uh, this table gives us the uh, capability of bringing the contralateral limb down, which is great, obviously. Perfect. This is what we have done, just a couple of degrees in order to gain good access from that side so that the other limb doesn't hinder us in our approach. So um, I'm in the last step of preparation. Perfect. Good. So what about the next camera image? Do, uh, can we see, can we see that it's all in our back? Yeah, that's can, better. Okay, that's great. Now you're talking. I know you're talking. Okay, shall we start? Yes, please. Perfect. Okay, so the first thing obviously is we perform our approach. This is not typically what I would cut. It's a little longer than normal, but you uh, ought to see everything. So we just go inside, and as you see, it starts to bleed. So the reason for that is, obviously, we do this without tonique. Okay? So there is no tonique on, and as there is no on, there is nothing to be protected. But the advantage of that is when it bleeds, then we see it. So I want to know when there is a bleeding. So the first thing we do is we cauterize. And this is what I also don't do in my normal setting. I just do it now for you that you see better. So let's go in. Okay. That's where we are now. So now we need some retractors also for the audience to show something. And we do some blunt dissection. So having done this now, we palpate the, um, the tibial tubercle here in the front. Christine, can we have the other view again, do you think? It was much nicer. Uh, we're back, to, we're back to looking from the top again. It would be in my back, but you just say what you want to see, okay? Because I, I, I have the camera directly in my back. Oh, okay. What do you have? The upside view? Yeah, that's a better view. It just needs to come up. Cameraman needs to just come slightly higher, so he's looking down over your hand. Can we adjust the camera alike, like Adrian was saying? If not, you're going to have to take your hand away and then point out things as you go, because it's a little bit low, the camera. So can we take this? I, I need to see what they see, because otherwise uh, I, I cannot see whether my hand is in the... So this, this needs to be there, actually. I need another image, sorry. Not to worry. Christian, just whilst we're getting that perfect image, can you show us that nice ridge on the tibial tubercle that we use, we use as a very important landmark. I hope that you can see it, so because I don't know if the camera instructs that, but it's, 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 this is the tibial tubercle, this no. is the patella tendon. Can you see this? Not really, no, we, now we can, yeah. Okay, so this is the interval behind the patella tendon and in front of the tibia. So we just use this as a landmark to guide down and follow this little groove which is naturally there. So this is our ascending cut for the biplanar. Okay? And we lead this down a couple of centimeters. And the next thing we do is we try to find the past tendons. Okay? Perfect. So for this, we just elevate them like this. Everyone who does who does uh, ligament surgery knows how to do that and dive in, usually with a curved clip. We take the scissors and I just go for blunt dissection by spreading the branches. Let's lift up this one a bit. Yeah, perfect. So here is the upper border of these paste tendons. Can you see that? Yeah, we see it clearly. Okay, so when we open that, we take the retractor and go into this base that we just created just by blunt dissection and traction. So we release that a bit and what becomes presented then is the medial collateral ligament. Can you see that? No, we're going to need to go to the other view. Can we have the other view please? 
Well, we can tell you it's really nicely there. Yeah, the problem is that the camera is just slightly low, so it's it needs to be raised up higher, so it's looking down over I your. Adrian, can we have this camera, please? Right, this camera, because what they see is the head camera right now. Yeah. But I can, we can see you're inside the. And it would be great if, the, if wh why don't you do deliver to them a picture in picture so that they can see both images at the, at a time. Show us the maneuver from where you are, Christian, with the clip, because we'll get a very nice view of that. Oh, I want, I want, do you see this now? Yeah, this is they changed it. Perfect. So now you see the medial collateral ligament very clearly. Okay, so that's great. So it goes all the way from the front here, where our ascending cut has been, to the back here. And here you have some fatty, flimsy tissue, okay? Yep. What I do now is I go there, go in with my, with my uh, um, periosteal elevator and touch the tibia at its back. Just come out with that again and show that very, just show that going in slowly so we can just see back. where you, Back yeah. of, the, of the medial collateral ligament. Yeah. yeah. And there is the posterior border of the tibia. Yeah. Elevator goes in and scratches at the posterior tibia now. And I want to hear this scratch because I want to free it. Because the, I mean, you've been speaking about neurovascular problems there, I guess. Yeah. So from here on, I can go to the contralateral side and I'm now touching the head of the fibula. Okay? Can even, even, take my finger and follow this way, take my finger and put it here and go to the fibula head. See that? Yeah, we see it. Huh? So having done this now, the back should be protected. So now I take this... Chris, can, can we just, can we rewind and can you just show the PEZ maneuver one more time because we've got such a nice view now. Okay. Not, so not the PEZ maneuver is... Um, the pez has been here, okay? I lifted up the upper border of yeah. the pez just by touching it gently, yeah. lift it up, yeah. and then I, take, I, I usually take a curved clip or an yeah. overhaul. Here, a screw does it as well, uh, uh, scissors do it as well. So I dive behind the uh, elevated pez yeah. and just spread the branches. Great, great. So that auto dissects by itself. Great. That's, that's really important. That's really important to show that. And then, just again, if you could take the cob or the periosteal and just very slowly, because it just goes a bit dark as it goes close to the tibia, just show everyone. There you go. Stop there for a second, Christian. So show us, the, show us the tip of that. There you go. And look at the angle that he's putting it in now from the back, right the way across. Scratch, scratch, scratch. That's, it's such a small thing, you think, but that is so crucial to delivering a safe osteotomy. We really think this is a big sort of breakthrough for the technique. Fantastic, Krishna. It's an amazing view. Perfect. Good. Now we go here with our retractor and with the tip of the retractor, I can palpate the fibula head. Touch the fibula head here. Touch it. Feel it? So I can really move the head of the fibula. And I'm, now I'm on the fibula head, now I'm above it. So yeah. this is approximately the direction of my, of my osteotomy then. Okay. Great. Great. So having done this, we can go once again to the front because we need to find the anterior border of the medial collateral ligament as well. Yeah. And that's where we go now and in a sharp way... Christian, can we just rewind and can you show the tibial tubercle and the patella tendon from where you are at the moment? If we go back to that view again... I can. Here. Yeah, go back to the same view. Get the cameraman to go back to the nice view that we had. Not the top view again, that's not so good. View. I don't know what we want to call it, but back to the alternative view. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Well, no, we're getting the top head view at the moment. We want to go back to the other view. If you could just Can we, we, have, we need this camera now. It's not this camera, it cannot be. Can we change the cameras? From, from the top. Yeah, the top, we have got a picture, but it's tiny in the top of our screen. It just would be really nice to show the audience um, that, that important landmark where for the ascending bike. There we go. Great. Oh, no, we've lost it again. There we go. Great. 
Yeah. So if we could just, if you could show where the tibial tubercle is. Here? Yeah. And where's that ridge, Christian, that, that sort coming of... coming directly here. Perfect. And everyone has paid it at, its, at his own knee. Yeah. Just the tibial tubercle to the medial side and feel that ridge. You feel it's, that ridge. And then you take the, the bovi and just follow that ridge, okay? Brilliant. And then go to the back. Perfect. Open everything at the back. And then you go to the front again. And here at the front, you just dive with a sharp elevator underneath the medial collateral. See that I have the medial collateral on my elevator now. Yeah, we've gone back to that funny view again. Oh, give us the this. Camera, the camera really likes... There you go. There's the one. There we go. So... Uh, so everyone can see that very clearly. That's it. Okay? So that goes to the back. Yeah? Yeah. Just want to dive underneath this little portion as well. Not the best tool for that. Perfect. How much do we release that by Christian? How do we know when we've got it adequately I released? I just have the retractor now inside and I move it like this. Yeah. I, do, I don't do anything to it now. I just remove it like this. And now I take the um, a little home man out of a foot and ankle set. See that? Yeah. Put it in and replace this and just bring it to the back. That's all I'm doing. That's the whole release. Okay? Great. So now we have full access. Um, now we have full access to the... Let's just clean that up a bit so that you see better. We have full access to the uh, tibia and the back is completely protected. Okay, okay. Great. perfect. Good. So now um, Bushan is holding these. Just you, you could combine them actually with a sticky tape. Now yeah. we go to full extension, and we see everything as we want to see it. Okay. Now the uh, intensifier can come in, and we need to readjust our image, obviously our cameras, and put some light on here. Perfect. And the next thing, because I know. Where the retractor is, I take a K-wire now and start approximately where the, where the um, Holman retractor sits. Some one and a half centimeters front and shoot an initial K-wire. I don't know where I am right now. I will just control it in a bit. A nice thing to use if you can get your hands on them with little drill pins. Arthrex make them and they, and they actually allow you to guide that K-wire more easily in the bone. Yeah, now put the pedal right. So, great. So now let's have the first X-ray. Uh, you guys need to be protected, you know that. I maybe, maybe, maybe we could have the head camera pointing can we have that top camera pointing at the x-ray machine so we could see at the same time? Fluoro aborted. I don't have a fluoro, so we need to perform this surgery without fluoro. Good. So I need, I need the, uh, the wire driver again. Because as you see, my insertion, my starting point wasn't too bad. But the point where I ended is too low. Yeah, a little bit too low. We rotated it a bit so we see it even better so I incline it a bit further and go a bit higher that's not bad so yeah. I, I, I will do it I will do that so this is too much of internal rotation that's great nice okay. I like it okay so um, give me a mallet, please, or take this one, a wire driver, it's okay, we'll do it. So now I'm tapping at the contralateral cortex, yeah, or a bit over it. So I take a wire of the same length, stick it against the K wire coming out, and measure the overhang. Okay? Perfect. And that is some 60 mils, a bit more, but we have protruded through the other cortex, so let's say it's a 60, okay? Great. So if we have 55 now, it should be fine, yeah? So we take this wire that we've just taken to measure everything and palpate the fibular head on the other side. And now anterior to the fibular head, I just touch the skin with this K-wire 
and see that I'm a bit too low, so I go a bit higher a centimeter. Can we, Christian, do you think we can get the camera to show externally what you're doing on the lateral side there? We can see it really uh, nice I on the fluoro. You, maybe you can, can you zoom out with this one? Yeah, that's good. Great. Can you see my hand? A little bit, little bit. Bushan, pick up the plastic on the floor. That's it. Pick that up. Okay. So I'm touching the fibula head here. Yeah, we can see that just. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, anterior to the fibula head, I place my K-wire. Yeah. Where I am on the fluoro. And then right. I go slightly up. Yeah. Will I reach that corner? Yeah. Then I poke through the skin. See that? Yeah. I'm a bit too far. Don't see it here. Uh, okay. We will be there in a bit. Can just palpate it now. That's nice. Great. Okay. And now just tapping with the mallet, yeah? I'm tapping with the mallet which is difficult because she's quite short and there is no space as the lateral support hinders me. But that's okay. So that's where we are now. Looks that's great. Our See that? Perfect. Good. So now we need to adjust the, the slope. And that is, I guess, ideal. So by just putting the foot on his belly that he doesn't have, yeah? He's very <clears> slim. Bushan already just got it right. So the next thing we need is obviously the right trajectory. So we need to be in, in line with this K-wire, with our posterior retractor. And to the front, we just take this one. Okay? So okay. as we know, the intensifier goes A to P. We just hold the saw blade now A to P. Okay? And we can perform... Christian, can I just stop you? Can you just talk about the... Uh, how we get a perfect AP through the knee again because obviously you've done that yeah. little maneuver with Bush and he knew what to normal, do. In a normal position, we had a slight, slight recurvatum here. So what Bush did, he just pressed it against his belly and then maneuvered it to go to slight flexion. Uh, and the flexion here is some five degrees now and that creates a perfect AP tibia. So yeah, we, we see, see that really nicely. Uh, yeah. See, we see the uh, subchondral sclerosis as one thin line. So now I toggle the saw blade around my starting wire. And when it's just a one millimeter thin line, I know about the position that it recreates. Christ the Christian, Christian, before you do that, place the wire above the retractor, in, out of the bone, because we, we can't see it. And just do that maneuver again so we can see the, the saw blade above the home and retractor. Above? Yes, yeah, stick, stick it above it. Take it out and stick it above it so everyone can see oh, how the saw blade the changes because the homan's blocking it. But it's a really, really important point. Show it against the bone and, and away from the homan retractor. That's it. Have you seen that? Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, w w what he's doing is he's making, the, he's making the saw blade as thin as he possibly can and then it's in the perfect plane. So he's rotating it. And by rotating it, he's making it as narrow as you possibly can. When it's as narrow as it possibly can be, it's perfect, then he'll go. That's great. Thanks, Christian. Nice and blunt. So I know now that in, to the back, I cannot damage the MCL as the whole man is there. And from, the, from my tibia, I cannot go any further because the other whole man is there. What's, so the, now what's, the up, what's the upper limit of where you want to go? Where do you want to, how can you avoid uh, being too posterior and not too anterior with that saw blade? Well, um, I, just start, I just start somewhere in the middle, work my way to the back, yep. uh, knowing that I've just my bony surrounding in front of my saw blade, sure. and the, and the, and the uh, ligament is just held to, to the back. That's it. So you see that I now slightly diverge off from my initial K-wire, but now I'm here at the lateral side. Fluoro is not really very following me. 
So you see that I now touch my... Um, can you lift up my mask a bit? Let's see a, a bigger fluoro picture. Okay, just take a look. Thank you so much. Take a look at the fluoro image. Yeah, great. Do you have it? Do we have do we have a metal ruler? One million oh that's good. That's plastic but good. Guys, can you hear us? It's in yeah, it's in line with exactly it's in line with yeah. So we just removed it now. We wait for you to see the floral image because that so looks Christian, great. So Christian, just because just it's so important, you made the joint. Just talk us through what what angle is the saw blade relative to the to the to the angle of the of the joint. Well, uh, hopefully zero. I want to recreate something which is parallel to the slope. So the steps are: you flex the knee slightly, as Bushan did. You get a perfect AP. You yeah. then you then make the saw blade as thin as you possibly can. Then you are cutting in the plane of the joint. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So now we've removed the posterior retractor because we thought we are safe to the back and have cut everything there. This is now to be confirmed with quite a sturdy um, ruler. And this one here is not like these shitty paper rulers, Adrian, that we have back in UK. It's made of plastic. That's ideal. So you can use these ones. Perfect. We have a metal ruler for that particular purpose, but that would do the job as well. And I tell Kate now, all the back has been cut. So the posterior cortex has been safely cut without any risk for neurovascular structures. So that was a safe goal. As this is now cut, let's remove the posterior homan. Okay? So the next thing we need is we need to cut till we reach our ascending osteotomy. And we are almost there because she's so tiny that the thickness of the saw blade was good enough to cut all the way to the front or the, uh, not the thickness, but the width of the saw blade, okay? So we just have one further millimeter, maybe, that we need to cut, and we are there. That's it. Do you do or, anything on the lateral side with your hand to feel that saw blade, Christian? No, not, not right now, but in a bit. Good question. So I dive now into the tibia, and as I'm not going to the back anymore, underneath my ascending cut, I just go through to the contralateral side and I put my finger, do you have this view there, you can see it? Yeah, we see now. My finger goes into the direction of Gerdi's tubercle, okay? So I slightly come from the back and where I exit the tibia, I want to feel the saw blade coming out there, okay? I can palpate through the skin that I, in the anterolateral portion, destabilized my tibia. And I'm there, here. Touch, your, touch it, touch it. Yeah? So the saw blade's coming out. Got it. So by this maneuver to the back and to the front, you've completely protected the medial collateral ligament. Let us show you that. That's the MCL. See it here? That's the MCL. That is the PES. That is the front. And is a complete cut in the back and in the front of the tibia in this oblique osteotomy. The last thing which is missing is the ascending osteotomy, the biplanar. Now we take the saw again. And this works now as a retractor to the back. So we just need one retractor to the front. I need the saw. No, the saw. So we just need this one now. Take it, put it to the frontal plane, follow our ridge that we have here, Move it like two millimeters off from the bone, let it run quickly and dive into the bone. Just move your head so we can see what you're doing with the saw blade. Ah, got it, perfect. And again, palpating. I'm touching it now on the lateral side of the tibial tubercle. Yeah. I know that I'm done. I don't have to dive downwards. I just have to follow with this inferior um, uh, margin of the saw blade, our osteotomy. What, okay? plane, what plane are you making that cut in, Christian? Also. How do, you, how, how, do you get, how do you get that? What tips would you give the audience to... Well, I, I, just, I know that my rotation uh, for everything now is that I look AP. So what I've had was AP. And I know that the frontal plane stands 90 degrees to AP. 
So I just tilt it to a 90 degree horizontal to the floor with a slight incline so that I exit it. So Following the what about foot position and bush and what's your assistant doing? Yeah, he's keeping it controlled, let's say. The foot position is, is not really that important. It's important that it maintains in this position. Exactly. So foot no. at 90, right. and as long as you know where the foot is, you can externally rotate to make it a little bit easy to make the cut. No. What you we want, want to show you here now, Bushan, hold this for me, is, is something very interesting. So when you look at this now, try to find the osteotomy here. I don't know if you, can we zoom onto this and we try to find the osteotomy. Can you see the osteotomy here? Not that clearly. No, and the same counts for us. Because it's closed, it collapsed as we destabilized it with the anterior uh, ascending cut. So what we have performed here now is a perfect one millimeter medial closing wedge. Okay, can you lift up my mask again? Getting on my nerves, I need to fix it the next time. Okay. So one millimeter medial closing wedge osteotomy. If we wanted to achieve that, then now we just have to fix it. But that was not the plan, so we wanted to open it some six mils. So and just by fixing it at the distal side, which is just holding it here, and I'm moving it here, see what happens. Yeah, nice and mobile. Okay. Now a bit more of external rotation would do it better this way. Perfect. So usually now we just have to spread it, and traditionally we use chisels for that, okay? Quite easy, just a chisel and gradually open it up. Not a bad thing. Here we have now, once again, our medial collateral ligament, okay? So the suction now held the pads to the back, and the MCL is all the way in the front. Can you see that? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So what I now do is, I take scissors, uh, these here, for example, just the tools that you have, okay? Nothing extra fancy, put them inside, and then you can move it. Can you see that? We see it, yep. Okay, perfect. Now I want some space in the back, I guess, and I have marked on these forceps, they are a bit broad here, so there are better ones. We will see if we can manage. So I've marked, the scissors at a de uh, the, the forceps at a depth which generates a width of six millimeters. Can you see that? Can you see this? Mm, sort of, yeah. Bit blurry. Another, yeah. Mm. So they are marked here from yeah. either side, and that's six millimeters. Uh, thick. Okay, we got it. We got it. Yeah. Perfect. So what I'm now doing is I just go to the back of the tibia where I want to assess that height, go in and turn it 90 degrees. Because I always was in search for a good wedge that generates a quite easy opening. Yeah? And if you rotate forceps by 90 degrees, well, in general, this is a wedge. I need a forceps now. And the great thing here is that the two arms of these forceps, you can spread them a bit. That makes it even easier. Just spread them a bit. So the wedge becomes more stable in the gap. Now we take the mallet, and we have our markings on, on, the, on, the, on our wedge. And I just go inside till I reach my marks. So by definition, I know this is now six millimeters open. Without any chisel inside, no nothing. And the next great thing is, this can snap out. Give me a needle holder, please, or this one, or wire driver. And the next great thing is now, um, if I wanted to introduce a, a, an allograft, I don't have this osteotomy spreader, this one here, in the front of my medial collateral. And the next thing is, if you spread in front of your medial collateral, you will always have this, this, this staple, st uh, uh, tense structure of the MCL in the back. But when you open in the front of the MCL, you change the slope. Yeah, we yeah. talked about that. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're doing it in the back of the MCL. Once again, my mask is really, really nasty mask because I'm talking the whole time. Can you stick it there? Perfect. Guys, we just need some adjustment because I'm constantly breathing into my sterile peers and I don't want to have that. 
Okay, nice one. Thank you so much. So can you see that? This is very important because this is a novelty and it's actually, it made things easier. Huh? So right. now it's, everything is very stable, calm, lying in, ahead of us. We don't have to do anything and we just do another x-ray now. Huh? Shouldn't we? Yes, have a look. Nice one. So, I would love to have an x-ray, but it doesn't work. Hmm. We don't have no x-rays anymore. What kind of plate are you going to use, Christian, just whilst they're getting the x-ray ready? So, anyhow, as they are getting the x-ray ready, we can start to discuss and we can place the plate. Um, that's the next thing we're going to do. So let's say this is now a calm situation and the osteotomy gap is ideal and we want to have it this way. We can place the plate. We could equally say um, we take now the alignment rod and check it again. Yeah. So why don't we do that? We just mount the alignment rod in the meantime. Have we got a bone wedge at all today? Hmm? What did you say? Uh, any allograft. No, not, not here, I guess. Huh? Bush? We don't have allografts here. No allografts today. Yeah, it's really tiny. It's six mils. So we can debate on probably uh, the need of allografts from which height. But anyhow, since we're doing double levels, whenever the height is weird, um, I guess uh, it's not really that much of a demand for big corrections anymore. Let's go uh, with the... Uh, let's now. Let's first try to... See if it's well. They, uh, it's 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 rebooting. Uh, it's rebooting. So give us a couple of seconds. We place as you may see the uh, alignment rod now. Christian, what what what? Tell the audience um, what you would do. Uh, not that you've ever had to do this, but if you did see a v vessel injury, what what? This is a good good time to sort of talk about the maneuver in terms of dealing with that. So let's just say we saw some bleeding and we were worried. But you cut, obviously, huh? So if you cut this aberrant branch uh, of uh, the, the popliteal artery, you can be very quick with your osteotomy. Just have a good friend that presses in the back of the knee, so uh, just to stop the popliteal bleeding. And then you perform the surgery very quickly and spread the osteotomy to maybe 20 mils so that yep. you the bleeding part and cauterize or ligate it. So that's the point. So if you do see bleeding, the, the, the maneuver is to open the osteotomy to say two centimeters big, and then you'll see the vessel and you can deal with it. And if it is the aberrant branch, you can just put a you know, ligger clip or something on it. So now is the time to see the x-ray again. That's it. So let's go to the, to the hip now. Let's come to the hip. Let's drive up. Um, place the, yeah, place it square and leave it square, leave it square. Go up, 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 higher, higher, higher. That's where we want to stay. No, that's moving. Fix that, please. Fix it and, and open the other one, right. Come in further. Overall, perfect. Now square again. Ro rotate the wheels again, please. Rotate the wheels of the intent, no, the wheels, no, rotate the wheels of the, keep everything fixed, just rotate the wheels. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Sounds like you need to rotate the wheels. And lock on, on zero again, please. Okay, come, oops, oops. We're almost there, guys. So that's a nice one, passing through the center of the, of the hip. And now we go down to the ankle joint, please. Drive all the way down to the ankle joint. And do you do this as a routine uh, in your practice, Christian? Check with well, the floor. I did this for years, and we've abandoned that. So we believe in our planning now. OK, and now we go to the center. Right. We hold it, simulate a bit of of weight, and there we go. See it? Great. 
actually what we planned, so I didn't want to overdo her. She's on 91, like this, and, well, I would say that fits, looking at the joint. Yeah, that's nice. Christian, a, a really good tip um, for, for people that are perhaps, you know, less experienced. What, what, what manoeuvre can you do with a laminar spreader to close the biplane if it opens slightly? And rotate this. Yeah, that's, that's a good tip when you have the laminar spreader inside. Like with this forceps, when you rotate it to this direction, counterclockwise here, you open the ascending. When you rotate it to the other side, you close it, obviously. You bring these parts together. So by so mo moving your hand, you can open and close the, uh, the biplane. So the biplane is open. You take your laminar spread or the forceps, and by rotating it, it pulls the biplane closed. Physically rotates the bone back again. So you take the handle of the laminar spread, and as you move it, you'll see the biplane opening and closing. OK, thanks. Thanks, Christian. You're welcome. He's really tiny, huh? He collapsed. Wait a second. Now we fell out because we play around here too much. Well, that's okay. So this twisted now. Can you just hold it so that it does not twist? This one? Perfect. So now we take this one again. And you're just laying the plate on top of the soft tissues, yeah? I'm doing that. Okay, have it. And what plate is that? Is that a type 1 plate, type 2 plate? That's a, that's a short one, uh, type 1, just six screws, which is enough. And we place the osteotomy on the middle of the solid part here. Can you see that? We do, yeah, we can see that. Okay. So now we take the first drill, long drill, please. We could go a bit higher, but that's okay. So this plate's got three proximal and three distal, yeah? Nice. So, and that's, uh, uh, yes, well, it's, not, it's not laser marked, so we have to take this one and take the depth gorge and, and check it. So the drill is unfortunately not laser marked. That is something we have to bring to India then. So that is a proper 60. Let's go for 55. 55. Five. 55. 55 is exactly what's missing. So I would say we take, yeah? OK. Yeah, questions so far, because this is now the uh, boring part. Where I show you a trick how you can get the, give me the, give me this. Oh yeah. Perfect. Christian, yeah, good question. So what's the ideal position for the start of the wire and the stopping of the wire right at the very beginning of the procedure in terms of the height, height of the osteotomy from the joint line? That is, well, it's a bit of experience. It's a bit of, uh, related to the position of the, we need to take out this one first, the wire driver. To the, it's, it's also related to your plate, because some plates need more proximal space. I would say the better, the higher you can go, the better it is. But anyhow, um, the general recommendation is you need to go where convexity at the medial cortex meets concavity. So this is maybe some four centimeters under the joint line, but I don't like metrics as general recommendation, because the problem with that is the problem with that is that you may have Magic Johnson or you may have Madonna as a patient. And I guess they have different dimensions. Yeah. And what about the hinge? Where do you reckon the ideal hinge is for the saw? How far away from the lateral cortex? Yeah, 40. Uh, once again, please. How far from the lateral cortex do you want to stop the saw blade? How, okay. how big a hinge? Apart from the left, uh, uh, I would say, I, 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 as, you, as you heard, I try to basically stick to, stick to um, five millimeters away. So I reduce my saw cut uh, length, what, how I mark my saw blade. I reduce the measured overhang from these 2K wires by some five mils. So in that way... That's poly, just at the moment, you're in a 
directional screw there, aren't you? You can actually change the direction of that. Yeah, this is multi-angle. Yeah. Not, not really what I like because no. these boots don't tend to be very stable. Um, give me a 50 probably. Give me a 50. So these bushings are not very stable. So there is another type one that has six uh, holes that actually has no uh, multi-angle hole. For the time being, we just take that. Okay. So these are now all just hand warm. Let's just make it all safe because Bush is trying to hold our osteotomy open all the time. So we want to give him some relief. And these are bicortical, unicortical? Right. I, I, I like to have uh, five cortices at either side. So this is why I, uh, I tend to uh, go for, uh, in, a, in a type one plate, for two bicorticals. That's a, and I have an x-ray for 38. Do we have a 38? Way too long, you see. It's not, not really touching, I felt that. But, uh, that's how it works better. 32 or 30 would do as well. 30. 30. We have a 30. Give us the 30. So, um, uh, where were we stuck? What was the question? Bicortical. So, five cortices. So, this is the first bicortical distally. And then, if we go for the next one, monocortical, we just have, uh, we just have two cortices left. So, I'd like to have this one as well, bicortical. Can I have the other one? This is not really very nice. See, this is this is short. It's uh, it broke off. Broke. Off. This is for only for the multi angle. We need to take these ones. Okay. Good. So this is also bicortical. Therefore, probably a bit under. The drill is blunt like hell. So it's a 28, and then the last one, probably a 15 or so, very short. The shortest that you have for the last one. Give me the drill again, because it takes time to the screws there. Let's spare some time. Smallest one or shortest one that you have, because this is, and probably if, if you don't have a 13, because she's really tiny. If you don't have a 13, then probably uh, we will have do to go. Do we need any lateral view in, at any point of time? It's not required. The question was, do we need a lateral x-ray for an HTO? Well, not necessarily. I never perform these. But obviously, if you want it, we try to have one in a bit for you. No, no, we don't need it. We'll, we'll, we'll do it when we do the DFO. OK. We do get a lateral for the femoral osteotomies, but not for the tibial osteotomies. Right. And what do we have? What is the shortest? 24. 24? Then I need the drill again. Because so the lateral cortex. So, what is the lateral cortex. so in, this, in, this, uh, um, in this surgery now, we go for three bicorticals, but only because the last one is so, she's so tiny that we don't have a screw which is short enough to stay within the cortex. But normally that last screw is in the small plate, it's just a unicortical, yeah? Right. Yeah, so uh, the next thing is we take out our little placeholder here, the spacer, our forcep, which was a very cheap and affordable solution, I guess. So um, I would never have dreamt when I started this that it's possible to take to do all this without without um, chisels, spreader, right. without all the other kit, yeah. I think what would have been quite interesting with this live surgery, the fact that you, you mobilized the osteotomy without having to use any chisels. And right. You, and you did that because you cut the back cortex and you made sure of that. And you came through. Um, and we didn't have to fight with, uh, with the cortex here. So now yeah, we have, yeah. this is what you see here, when, when it all falls back and we have not changed the slope. So this is how an image looks. Um, when you cannot perform an osteotomy on it, because we are, we are in a bit recurvatum. So this is how you want to look at it. And that's why you change the, the, um, the bend of the knee in order to be parallel to the slope. 
That's great, Christian. Well, look, we're going we're gonna, to... I'm going to see if there are any questions from the audience. Any questions? Let's close it just like this, and it's done. And, and we close it in two layers. So it's just a soft tissue uh, uh, subcutaneous, and, and I tend to perform intracutaneous uh, resorbable sutures and put steri strips on top. Then I have a little wound dressing uh, um, with uh, some kind of a, um, honeycomb structured uh, um, uh, foamy uh, cover so that I can see and observe the wound, uh, wound dressing that stays on um, for 12 days. And after 12 days, it just comes off and there is no suture removal or anything. And, and what about weight bearing for this lady afterwards? What are you happy with? She's pain adapted, so she can weight bear if she's able to bear. Um, and if not, then she walks on crutches for two or three weeks, and um, and that's okay. So, uh, it, so weight bearing is tolerated, uh, up to full weight yeah. bearing. But we yeah. encourage them to take it easy for the first two weeks. Yeah, first two weeks is, is fine, uh, apart from the guys that just don't need to take it easy. So whoever can... So in, the, in the UK, we bone graft even the tiny osteotomies to the bigger osteotomies because we get that nice tamponade of bleeding. It gives them a little bit of extra immediate support so the patients feel more comfortable when they're walking. But the main reason for putting the bone graft in is actually just to tamponade bleeding, minimize bleeding, minimize swelling, more rapid rehab less pain, quicker recovery. Then we just stick it in and take out everything and then we slate it. We tried the TCP wedges but the, they don't go away. So 10 years later you still see the TCP wedges. So if, they, if anyone can invent something that really turns to bone, then of course we use that. But at the moment, there's nothing on the market that's 100% reliable. Obviously. So do we, do we have skin? Skin suture? Quite important for these patients as well as the anesthetic. So they get a spinal in our practice and they get a block, they get an adductor canal block. We do them all as day cases now. They all go home within 24 hours. And there's a, there's a really smart, new, it's expensive, um, uh, liposomal, long acting Marcane called Exparel. I don't know if you have it yet, but um, okay, it, it's quite expensive, but it, it hangs around for about five days. So that's another thing that we've added in recently. The single most important thing, though, is cryotherapy. It's so good for these patients to have um, Game Ready or Physiolab or something similar. Okay. Well, look, I think we're going to... Sorry, question. Um, about the technique of placing the KY. Running through this. So on the lateral side, it's from the... Most of the time, we take the tip of the fibula. But tip of the fibula varies uh, sometimes. It's maybe maybe just up to the joint or some um, maybe far from the joint. So in that situation, what you consider in that uh, height of from the joint line of this? So normally it's, it's he's, he likes to go 0.5, it's between one centimeter and, one and a half a centimeter from the lateral cortex, and it's one and a half centimeters minimum from the, from the joint and in that area. But if you've got someone with a low fibula, then you're gonna be lower down. If you've got someone with a high fibula, then you have to be a little bit careful. But basically, you want a centimeter, centimeter and a half to give yourself the, the, uh, the safety. The, the hinge wire placement, it's the fibula head and the Gerdes tubercle. Those are the two landmarks. And you palpate the joint line, and then you can place it. There has been publications around that, obviously, about the ideal height. But exactly as Adrian said, there is uh, hardly a thing in anatomy which is that variant, like the height of the of the uh, head of the fibula. So yeah. uh, I don't think that you can find a position where you say, well, this is the best idea or whatsoever in general for each and every patient. I mean, all these generalizations are usually wrong. So I would say you have to assess it uh, uh, just when watching at the head of of the head of the of the fibula, then you aim for this particular structure, and that may be two centimeters below um, the joint level. Yeah. It may be one centimeter, or it may be even higher than the joint level in a complete depression. So post-traumatic cases are different. Um, uh, then there is patients with hereditary exostosis, uh, osteochondrosis. They have actually 
they have actually sometimes the fibula had uh, seven centimeters below the joint level. So that varies, and I think a general recommendation is hard to give. So another With question. So there is a paper from Nakamura. So where the the direction of the KVR guiding KVR osteotomy should go, he tells that the best site, best place is within the joint length. If you do 50 degree internal rotation, but now, uh, if, you, now that you're if you, you attack at the head, at the tip of the fibula, then that becomes higher. So what is your take on this? In terms of where do you place the K wire yes. in relation to the fibula head, yes. I think you ignore it. What you want to be is in the metaphysis of the bone, and the fibula is a good guide. So you've got a high fibula, you're going to go close to the joint line, but you're not going to go up to the level of the joint line. You're always going to be at least a centimeter and a half from the joint line and a centimeter medial. So you have a nice hinge. But if you have a low fibula, you might be four centimeters from the joint line. You, you know, it varies according to the anatomy, high or low uh, fibula. Uh, sir, excellent presentation. Uh, in your series, uh, uh, when you consider for uh, bone grafting or uh, bone substitu substitute? Yes, so we, we, in the UK, they, they, there's a nice local bone bank from hip replacements. So we have access to Allograft. Everyone, if we open even three millimeters, four millimeters, they get a bone graft, every single one. Um, because, as I said before, we want to stop bleeding. And we don't like to put artificial in because artificial doesn't actually incorporate and become bone. So we always bone graft in the UK just because it, it, it minimizes swelling. What is your view about uh, bone graft substitutes, like stimulan and all these kind of... Yeah, I think if you've got an infection and it's really bad, I think cerement's very good to fill the, the void with something like cerement with vancomycin or whatever antibiotic you're going to put. But we don't use any bone substitutes anymore. We've stopped completely. Well done, guys. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> nice one. Um, we may break for lunch. So now it's easier to remove this one first, to remove the clamp. Perfect. And once
Check one, two. Check one, one check one, check one two, all oh, check. Check one two.
Hello, everyone. Moving forward to our post-lunch session, I would like to call Dr. Sandeep Ray, Dr. Arunangshu Bhattacharya, and Dr. Amya Bera to please chair the session. Good afternoon. Let's start the post lunch session. Uh, play with the video with Matthew Oliva. How to build a solid osteotomy practice from scratch. Hi everybody, so uh, this first talk today will be on how to build a practice from the start uh, if you want to start doing knee osteotomies. Um, I myself started my osteotomy practice in 2013 uh, uh, as a resident, uh, but at this time in my department it was like 10 to 15 cases uh, uh, maximum, mostly post-traumatic cases or associated with TKAs or UKAs. Uh, and it's something that we slightly but surely raised to a number which is nowadays around 150, uh, which, is, which is a fair number uh, that, that I'm doing alone. So um, I would say that we've succeed uh, creating it almost from the scratch. And I will show you uh, what you should do uh, after uh, getting through the Valley of Tears myself, I will show you uh, uh, what are the good things uh, to, to imagine if you want to start your osteotomy practice. So first you need to identify what are you doing today. Uh, I would say that you're probably a knee surgeon, potentially exclusive uh, or potentially a sports surgeon. You might be a recon surgeon doing TKAs and UKAs a lot uh, and potentially doing hips like THAs. You might be the conservative knee guys uh, doing only cartilage, uh, Vmax, stem cells, PRP, um, uh, meniscus sutures, and, and some ACLs too. Or you might be the trauma guys. So the question is on those four type of surgeon, where are the osteotomies? And they are everywhere if you think about it. Because if you're a sports surgeon first, um, if you're a sports surgeon, you will imagine you will you can start to focus on tibial slope, which is nowadays a major uh, subject of interest in ACL reconstruction surgery, specifically in revision. If you're a recon surgeon, and you will see that just like UKAs, neosteromies are nearby. I mean, you, if you do a lot of TKAs, you probably should do a lot of UKAs and, and osteotomies because uh, TKAs are not indicated uh, for some of your patients today. If you're a conservative knee, guys, you will see that you should do osteotomies in patients where there is 
uh, an, a deformity associated to your cartilage or meniscus issues. And finally, if you're a trauma guy, uh, you will face this kind of uh, patient with major uh, uh, problems in the knee that you should treat. Let's imagine you're an ACL guy. You do, 15 revi you do 100 ACL every year, and you do potentially 15 revisions. I would say that my, you, I would probably say that five of them need a knee osteotomies. If you uh, follow the tracks of this paper, just published in Kesta uh, today, uh, that I pretty like, 35% of ACL revised a revised ACL have a very big PTS and should be considered for neosteromies at the same time to decrease the rate of patient going to a second revision. In my experience, I will not recommend slope changing osteotomy before the second revision ACL because otherwise you probably treat a lot of those guys excessively because most of them will succeed. And specifically, I will not suggest you to do slope changing osteotomies in primaries. Because you change a lot of things when you do a tibial slope change, specifically the gate, the gate parameters. And this is, should be a surgery which is indicated for chronic knee instability, not acute knee instability. So chronic knee instabilities. This is the good indication for slope changing osteotomies. Then you do TKAs, so you do, let's say, 100 TKAs. The number, the fair number, are that you should do 10 UKAs and 10 neosteromies on, based on those ones. So you should probably, if you follow my track and, and analyze closely where the deformity is, you probably can do 10 neos and 10 UKAs on those guys because you need to analyze where is the main deformity. If you have a major extra-articular deformity, neosteromies would work better than TKAs or UPAs. If you have a major intra-articular deformity, you should do something intra-articular, which is probably a UKA or a TKA. Then you're the guy that treats the abnormal knee pains, the guy that is a conservative surgeon doing cartilage repairs and, and, and treating those guys how to, 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 how to start osteotomy then? Very easily. You just stop your clinic at 65 and you say, I'm not, I don't want to see people for this specific osteotomy clinic after 65 years old. I will ask them to have a long C6 race. And just like the TKA guys, you do a very clean analysis of deformity. And you know that after five degrees of extraarticular deformity in the joint, outside of the joint, in the femur, on the tibia, with no deformity in the joint, if the patients have knee pain, it will be help if you do an extraarticular correction, which can be a DFO, distal femoral osteotomy, or an HTO, high tibial osteotomy. Five degree is a very good threshold. If you have less than five degree deformity, forget about it, and those guys can have uh, your classics, uh, injections, stem cells, PRP, in cartilage issues, meniscus issue, ACL, whatever it is. But those guys with chronic pain, if they are more than five degrees of extraarticular deformity, they are a good candidate for a ceremony, and you need to do the following steps. Finally, you're the trauma guy, and you don't want to do that anymore because you get through that uh, diaphysal corrections with frames, and patient hates you, of course, because they spend six months with that. And you want to, to, to do it, take, take care of that. I mean, this is a, a let's say, distal metaphysal uh, uh, fracture in a patient which now have uh, uh, 15 degrees of virus deformity in the femur. Uh, and this is another case of, uh, you see, uh, um, on the last, left side, a posterior medial uh, tibial collapsed fracture that we elevate with an intra-articular osteotomy, a Shiba osteotomy. You can do osteotomies a lot, and if you want to forget about those frames and external fixator and so on and so on, there is tons of options to do internal fixator platings and osteotomies on those guys. And they will love you because of that, because, I mean, nobody wants to be in frames for six months, of course. So anyway, if you want to start new osteotomy practice, the only thing you need to know today is Metaphysal deformity is the main indication of neosteromies. There is not a single good indication based on diaphysal fracture. It's 
very complex to, to convert metaphysical uh, diaphysical deformity into a metaphysical correction. This is something for expert. And there is no real indication of osteotomy for intraarticular wear. No way. It's a borderline young, salvage, complex issues, young sports, guys, surgery, potentially. But it's not the main core. The main core is the 40s, 50 years old guys, active, pain in the knee, no big arthritis, uh, uh, let's say Calvin and Lawrence, two, three maximum, with big pains and a big deformity outside of the joint. He knows from the beginning of his life, this patient had been told, you got the X leg, you have a curved both leg, you have a big virus, big values, they already know. But of course, it was not there at the beginning because they were born with this deformity. And now the deformity is playing a game which act inside of the joint. And if you correct that, you relieve the pain. And they are happy because of that. How to start? You have this patient in front of you. You are the ACL guy. You are the trauma guy, the conservative guy, the TKA guy. You need to have a very good long axis. And this is, for example, not a good one because the knee is completely rotated inside. There is probably a problem of femoral version, which is another step of neosteromy that I will not take care of today because it's very, very high-level expert surgery, the derotation of sternum. So there is probably something. And you see here in bipedal stance that she's pointing in the in inward, so you cannot analyze anything because the femur and the tibia are completely rotated. So if you not succeeding explaining your x-ray specialist that they need to redo it if they have something like that because you cannot do anything has for monopedal stents and you will see that the, the patient correct his deformity quite slightly monopedal bipedal uh, bipedal monopedal and you have a better view it's not perfect but you have a better view to analyze your x-ray now if you really want to get into fight with your radiologist and the, and, the, and the guys that do the x-rays. You can ask them to have the patella centered in the middle of the two condyles. The two condyles doing flat lines and the tibioplatter doing flat lines with exactly the same amount of space in between. And finally, one third of the fibula hides be, be behind the, the proximal tibia. You need to do that and do that and do that to have your perfect x-ray all the time. Otherwise, you just you are just losing your time and your patient is losing your time because you cannot do anything on that. Once you have this x-ray, you need to have a routine. What I'm doing today, I'm planning with the patient first. I'm doing my drawing lines. I will, I will explain you how to do planning. It's not a subject today because you have tons of, uh, of, of uh, available information on plannings, but the question is how to build practice, not to how to do plannings. But anyway, you do, you redo, you redo. I'm doing one in front of the patient, one after the, the, the clinic to be sure that the measure I've done are correct to put the patient on the schedule. And I'm doing a last one just before the surgery to verify my numbers and to get into the R with the volume of resection or vol a, wage, a wedge height in my mind to be perfectly okay just before the surgery. And if you don't rely on yourself, on your x-rays, or anything, you have a good way to have automated control now. Now this is the a software we designed uh, and published. You have very good option to do completely automated measures. This one is a, a website. You just drop the image on the folder, from your folder into the website, and it's giving you the correction to be done. PicMed, uh, 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 um, trauma card uh, uh, and so on uh, uh, versus and so on and so on they do the same they are completely going to fully automated measurement of deformity so I will just uh, uh, speed up a little bit but you can see that you just ask him to, to you just drop some image into the folder and the, the software is giving you the answer what is the HKA where are the deformity what correction should be done or not done which is the best part of it, it's saying no, 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 not an indication for a Um And this is good because it's and also uh, uh, giving you the information, is it a good x-ray, patella-centered, flat condyle, flat plateau, 
feel are slightly hidden before behind the, the proximal plateau. So if you're not completely confident on your planning, do automated planning and you, you have the answers. It will probably cost you some 20 to 30 something uh, uh, every month to have the license on that. But I'm pretty sure because of the, the, the potential of IA, it will be completely free in some years. Um, and then once you have that, you need to have an algorithm. And the algorithm is so easy. I mean, you know, this is the normal value. Normal value, 85, 90. Whatever is the, so we use usually the MLDFA, me, uh, mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, which is measured uh, out on the lateral side of the femur. So it's the angle in between the mechanical axis of the femur, center of the head, center of the condyle, and the two condyles aspect, the distal aspect of the condyles, measure laterally. And we use the MPTA, medial plateau proximal angle, which is measure medially plateau mechanical axis of the tibia. So the normal values of those two angles are 85 to 90. You don't do osteotomies if you are inside of this margin. You completely forget about it. If you are outside of that, you can stop discussing. So if you have a valgus knee, a, va a varus knee, you measure your angle. If your femur is inside of your 85-90 and your tibia is less than 85, you have a varus deformity in the tibia. You go to do a medial opening wedge osteotomies. Once again, the last angle, which is not written here, is the intraarticular deformity, joint line convergence angle, GLCA. This angle should be almost normal below 6 to 5 degree. Otherwise, it's reflecting an intraarticular wear that should be taken into account and potentially that should contraindicate the neosteromes. Then you can also have a varus femur. The femur is above 90 degree, MLDFA, and the tibia is normal. Then you do a lateral closing wedge osteotomy. And if you have both, femur above 90, tibia below 85, you do a bifocal osteotomy. Otherwise, you create an obliquity of the joint line, which will be troublesome for your patient after some years, or not after some years. If there is a big joint line obliquity, after one or two years, the patient will have very bad clinical outcomes. Same goes for the valgus. If you have valgus femur and normal tibia, so the femur is B485 and the tibia is in between the margin, do a medial closing wedge DFO, and you correct the valgus where it is. If you have a physiological femur in the margin and a tibia outside more than 90, you do a high HTO and you do a closing wedge HTO to correct an side to correct the proximal aspect of the femur. And if you have both, you do what we call a sandwich, you do a double closing wedge, femoral and tibial at the side. Then, what is the numbers? 70% of the virus knees are here. 10% of the virus knees are femoral, and finally 20% are combined femoral and tibial deformity. So if you follow this on virus, 70% of your osteotomy will be isolated HTOs, 10% will be isolated DFOs, and 20% will be bifocal deformity for the virus, which is the major part of your osteotomy practice, I would say. And DLOs, yes, it's not just a fancy concept. It's just like doing two tiny osteotomies is very easy when you, when you master the neosteromies. Doing that, it was usually taking me less than one hour. And those two tiny osteotomies heal faster, patients are doing better, they don't have pain, and you avoid the obliquity of the joint line because you correct the deformity where it, hit, where it is. So we published that, tons of paper on that. It's working. You correct the deformity what it, what it is, you have good outcome. You do the opposite, you have bad outcomes. If you want to have bad outcomes, do TKA to everybody, it will be better. So there is not so many evidence on the literature, so I will give you the key points we published with the ESCA consensus on your saying by friend Matt Dawson and a lot of specialists around the world of osteotomies. The global ID, if you want to get more information on how to do or to do virus knee osteotomies, read that. Everything is inside. You have more than 48 pages of information, high-level scientific information, 
high-level expert analysis of the literature, if you want to dig into that, this is a good way to do it. Because if you want to do an HTO, you have to control three points and only three points. The obliquity of the cut compared to the mechanical axis of the tibia. Second, where you insert your wedge to open your opening wedge of sternum in virus. And finally, where the hinge is positioned. It's three points, but it's very complex at the beginning because you need to stabilize your saw blade compared to the slope and the perpendicular mechanical axis of the tibia. Second, you need to be very sure of where you put your wedge in, otherwise you change the tibial slope at the same time, and it's not good for the patient. And finally, you, have, you need to have a safe hinge for the healing and a good and a perfect positioning hinge at the same time to avoid slope changing at the same time. And this is very complex at the beginning. And if you're not confident, you have good tools to help you. PSI is one of them. We work quite a lot on that. Since Feb I started my practice on that in 2016, we do more than 200 of them today, and it's working like hell. I mean, it's the easiest surgery you can imagine. You have a system that completely controls those three points, obliquity of the cuts, position of the hinge, insertion of the wedge is completely secure by the system. How it works in five minutes, in even less than that, one minute, you have this tiny piece of uh, bone uh, of, 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 of plastic you do your opening, blunt dissection, you dissect uh, uh, your patient's serinus, you release it completely to have some space to put the, 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 the PSI inside, you get access to the MCL, you protect your MCL uh, uh, with two windows, one anterior window would be the, uh, to release the POL from the bone, one posterior window, very posterior to it, to protect the neurovascular bundle. You, I mean, there is tons of uh, literature on that if you want to get more. You position two key wire, you verify those key wire with the planning that the, the company is giving you. When you're happy, your drill holds, proximal and distal. You remove, you, you use the, the sewing uh, socket, the sewing uh, uh, window which is inside, when you secure, once your cutting guide is completely secured, and you cut through it until you reach the key wire that protects you from hurting, the, from, from cutting the wedge, the hinge, when everything is okay. You really clearly try take your time to protect the neurovascular bundle and the MCL, and you get through it get f until your saw blade is getting into this protecting pin. You remove the cutting guide, you finish your cut, and then you do your anterior biplanar cut. And then you, the, the job is very easy. You put your plate in, you use those big blunts, and when the screw hole you made are facing the plate, the correction is obtained. Here, because it was a big opening, I'm, I'm securizing my hinge with the screw. So I'm doing my, the hinge protector uh, screw too. So I'm just using the key, the key wire that was inside and securized my hinge with the screw to compress it a little bit to avoid secondary hinge fracture, which can be a good point. It's easy like hell. Every, any young kid can be a Jedi master with that. This is the good point. We published that in Kesta. Learning curve is completely easy. Anybody, any single of my fellow that use PSI is a Jedi master after 10 cases. It will take 25 minutes to get through the surgery, even in complex multiplanar cuts. Uh, they are completely decreasing the number of uh, X-ray taken, and your correction is always perfect at 0.5 something degree. Once you use it, you're completely catch by the system so you have no option but use it until the end which is the bad point of psi and the good point of psi is it will train you until you don't need any more just like the the, the 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 piper in american pipe so at the end you don't need it anymore because you're trained and the 3d planning and the concepts and everything even if you don't know them at the beginning it will be inside of you after some cases because everything is so easy to understand and you understand those cutting guide, cutting plate complexity, hinge complexity and wedge position complexity very easily and you do change your practice to something which is a freehand practice because it's easier and funnier to me in the fact. Selecting the good plate and the good retractor and a good hinge screw and a good free row is a very good, it's a very important point. There is tons of industries around the market. One is completely directed by osteotomies. 
and it's new clip. I'm very happy to work with them. I'm very happy to design plate for them, retractor for them, hinge screws for them for years, because they are the best materials on the market for Stellanis, and they will be, because they are still improving every day, because they listen surgeon and they want us to be better every day and I really want to acknowledge them for that with these slides. <clears throat> Perioperatively, you can do outpatient settings, specifically in, in tibial osteromies. You need to use tranexamic acid because it's decreasing the blood problems. Drains are not necessary at all because it's not a bleeding surgery. If you do it completely, correctly, you do holograft in openings, you do closing wedge of the femur, it's not bleeding. Zero drain. You don't need them. If you have any hinge issue, issue you fix it during the surgery. If you hear any crack, if you see any brittle hinge, you fix it with a screw or a staple, and you will, you will be safer for the next steps. If you have any gap more than 7 mm, fill it with allograft. <clears throat> Don't use silly implants and silly materials. It would just, you will just be disgusted by your sternum because of that, because you do it perfectly and you change your slope because the plate is completely stupid, completely driven with anterior positioning, which of course changes the slope. And of course, because you will listen to the industry guy that said that this resolvable post-pascal six cement will be out in two years and seven years after is still fucking a rock inside of the knee. So don't use silly materials. Don't fill the gap with shitty things. It's not working. It's a fracture. Nobody will put cement inside of a fracture just to see what happened in trauma. So don't do that. Follow up uh, a regimen. See your patient often. One month with standard x-rays just to see that nothing bad happened to hinges. Three months long as x-rays, you're happy. The patient is happy. You see, look, I'm correct. Your prob the problem is corrected now. Six months standard is okay, then you see patient every year. Um, I would say if you want to, are you, if you're ready to do osteotomies, you need to be ready for, for, this is my summary slide. Identify which are and where are the good patients in your practice. You need to identify where are the osteotomy options. Second, start easy. Do high tibial osteotomies, opening wedges at the beginning. Don't do crazy, complex, multiplanar surgery of your size. Start easy and you will be happy. Ask you and ask us, me, the bad question before getting into the OR. I receive call from friends saying, I got this guy now sleeping. I don't know what to do. This is bad. Ask you the question before. Understand that indication is the key. It's the key of good outcomes. If you have to have happy patient and if you want to be happy, select the purest indication at the beginning. Plan, plan and replan. Do that free time. It will be giving you, sometimes it's changing on the freeze plan you do, you do. So you redo it and you, you will be happy inside of your heart to be sure of what should be done. And skill, they will come with an adapted training. So if you don't feel confident with your skills, come to course and you will be better for you. Thank you guys. Hi everybody. So uh, this first talk today will be on how to build a practice from the start uh, if you want to start doing neosteromies. Um, I myself started my osteotomy practice in 2000. Our second talk is on the 10 new 10 things you don't know in neosteotomy that will improve your outcomes by Matthew Olivier. Yeah, please. This is a recorded video. Yeah, please. Hi, guys. So the second talk. This is on uh, the 10 thing you need to know when you want to do an uh, um, I will try to cover all of the specific aspects. I discover uh, through my experience and through the, 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 the volume I've did of osteotomies in the last years. But of course, like always, uh, things were very influenced by uh, our pioneers and mentors like uh, Ronald, Adrian, and Christian, of course. So most of the thing you will discover here is just uh, an interpretation of the things they taught me in the last years. The third thing is 
HKA angle is a very bad angle because it's the sum of three different angles. The femoral deformity that you can assess, for example, by MLDFA, the tibial deformity that you can assess with the MPTA, and the intraarticular deformity. This is not a new thing. This is the Mikulic line you have here with your Mikulic looking at it. Uh, uh, and if you look closely to that, you, you will understand that there is different phenotypes in both valgus and varus knees that can be explained by a single, double, or triple deformity. And this is the key point you need to understand before doing any planning, indication, and so on. Human beings can be deformed and the lower, the lower limbs can be deformed because of the three reasons, femoral deformity, intraarticular deformity, tibial deformity. And the various aspect of those things Mother Nature gave us need to be interpreted before doing crazy uh, uh, mechanical su uh, uh, acting surgery like osteonomies or TKAs or UKAs. And if you really look to the numbers, and if you really dig into massive databases like we did in this paper with Christian, the human beings usually stick inside of the 8191 values. That means that usually we are all neutrally aligned because we have some valgus in the femur and varus in the tibia. And this is very true if you look to this uh, massive uh, database exploration. Most of the people got 4 degrees to 3 degrees of valgus in the femur and 4 to 5 degrees of virus inside of the tibia. If you imagine that the 1990 MPTML DFA should be normal, that's not true. It's slightly oriented uh, uh, inside and distally. The joint line is slightly oriented distally and, and, and majorly. Because you will realign completely when you walk uh, with a uh, monopedal stance. It's slightly inclined when you're bipedal, bipedal standing, but it's getting normal and horizontal when, when you're doing monopedal stance. And it's helping you to keep the eyes completely horizontal, otherwise you walk inclining your head and it's not good to flee the predators uh, like Lucy did when she was there 3.2 million years ago with exactly the same phenotype, valgus in the femur, varus in the tibia. The second point is the joint like ubiquity that can result of a wrong understanding of anatomy is the, is the consequence of wrong analysis of the tibia, wrong analysis of the femur, and let's say conversion of an intraarticular deformity in an extraarticular correction. The mean of this equation is that first you need to correct the deformity where it is, tibia, femur, or intraarticular. That means that the good indication for a neosteromy is always a substantial extraarticular deformity. By substantial, in my hands, it's four degrees. I'm never correcting a an, an tibia or a femur if the deformity is not MBTA below 84 or MLDFA over 90, for example, for a virus, and the opposite for a valgus, MLDFA below 84 or over uh, 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 90 uh, for uh, uh, the valgus deformity. So exactly the same. You stick into the normal values. You imagine that every human being between 84 and 90 MPTA or MLDFA got a, a quite normal bone shape and should not be corrected into an co extraarticular correction. If you still have virus of valgus and those normal values, that means that the deformity is inside of the joint and an intraarticular surgery should be performed like a UKA or a TKA. And the indication and the, and the mismatch in between UKA and TKA and, and osteotomies is completely ruled out by this classic equation. If there is deformity outside of the joint, correct it where it is, femur, tibia, both. If there is not, don't do osteotomies because your result will be completely unpredictable. Like this. I mean, this is a pretty shitty surgery. This guy created a 17 millimeter opening in the normal tibia resulting in both hinge fractures and 
shitty oblique joint line in the posterior pix rays. This is a nonsense, very bad surgeon surgery. We don't do in extraarticular correction of arthritis. We are correcting the mechanical problems occurring inside of the joint because of an extraarticular deformity. And our journal ubiquity is very bad. I mean, this, this is my favorite Korean paper published in AGSM 2020. If you have more than three degree, three degree of general ubiquity, you will have bad clinical outcomes. If you are more than six degree, you have impact on survivorship of your osteotomy. So st stick to the classics. But once again, this GLO problem is a problem of wrong indication. If you follow my rule number one, analyze extraarticular deformity and correct it only if there is one, you don't have this issue. Not at all. In my experience, GLO is not a problem. Not at all. The golden number. This is the everything surrounding neosteromies is always 110 degree. 110 degree. When we define cutting planes, it's always 110 degree. The biplanar cut should be angulate by 110 degree. The descending cut of the DFO should be 110 degree compared to the vertical aspect of the femur. The ascending cut of the HTO should be 110 degree compared to the lateral shape of the, of, the, of the tibia. Why is this 110 so important? It's because it's the best way to design plates. And why we are cutting 110 degree is always because it's the best way to spare enough space below the cut to put screws or above cut to screws, put screws and not, not a high cut that will be a diaphysal cut with a low chance of healing. So this 110 thing that you have on every planning, Mignacci planning, Duckdale and noise plannings, this 110 thing is a result of the plate we use. Those angular stable plates are defined to do cut as 110 degree, so you have enough space above and below the osteotomy site to securize with screws. And more than that, to do distal cuts, metaphysal cuts that heal better. Point four, Fujizawa is 62.5% of the tibial plateau length. This is an insane thing. Even Fujizawa himself do not, did not acknowledge this number. So this is the point. This is uh, what, what you have if you treat people like that. Massive intraarticular deformity. If I have a patient like that, this guy will have a TKA. Because TKA is the only option you have in massive uh, 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 bone on bone uh, 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 collapsed medial plateau because of arthritis. Osteotomy should not be performed on those patients. It's not a good indication. It's borderline young, salvage maybe, but completely unpredictable outcomes. So this 62.5% result of two paper, this which is a white paper and the Doug Lennois paper, saying that 62.5 is the ideal zone to move the, the weight-bearing line from pre-op to post-op in various knees. But we are not doing that anymore. What we do, we do tiny corrections and we do focal correction, sometimes bifocal correction. So today, this 62.5 should be 55 and maybe 50 because this 55%, which is exactly the top of the tibial spine eminence, is the best way to correct your patient with tiny corrections, unloading the medial compartment without cutting the opportunity to do UKA if your osteotomy is failing after 10 to 15 years because the viruses will restart because of intraarticular wear. If the intraarticular wear still grow and your osteotomy is failing because of that, you will have option to do UKA. And you're pushing out the option of TKAs. TKAs is far away from you because you know that UKAs will have better outcomes 10 years after an osteotomy. If you do an osteotomy at 40 years because of meniscectomy plus virus, for example, shoot 55. You will have a failure at 10 years, fair enough you will do a UKA and your patient will be happy. <clears throat> PPTA, the tibial slope, 
is always something around the corner when we talk about opening wedges as HTO, which is 95% of the osteotomies performed nowadays in various knees. But it's always, everybody, every publication is saying, if you do opening wedges, you increase the slope. No, if you're a bad surgeon, you're increasing the slope. Because we have tons, tons of options to control that. The slope is controlled by the obliquity of the cut compared to the mechanical axis of the tibia and the tibial plateau aspect, the position of your hinge, and the position where you put your wedge in. If you do oblique cuts, distally, uh, posteriorly and, and uh, descending, plus a very posterior hinge, for example, the tip fib position, the proximal tip fib position, and you put your bone block straight close to the TT anteriorly, of course you change the slope because you're just creating something that could open anteriorly and you create a complete, uh, complete wrong slope. But if you are able to, co to do your, your cut completely parallel to the slope, plus putting your wedge very posterior inside of your opening, very close to the posterior context of the tibia, where the MCL is, and this is why you need to learn the double approach of Christian Clay. Otherwise, you cannot do that. And you put your wedge position very anteriorly, close to the Gurdy tubercle or the ALL insertion. You have no option of changing the slope because you will be controlled by this wedge cut hinge thing, which is the three pillars of the slope uh, maintaining during the surgery. And why do you do? How do you do that? You just put a hinge. You put your, you put your key wire to protect your hinge at a good position, proximal to distal or distal to proximal, very easily. And you know that your so cannot go through. It will go anteriorly, it will go posteriorly, but this round hinge safe point will be protected by your key wire. And it's, very, it's a five second trick. It's enhancing your hinge to resist to fracture when you open, but it also positioning it posterior, uh, very anteriorly to protect the slope for changing during your surgery. GLCA, I mean GLCA is like GLO. Those two things are the bad indication things or the borderline indication things. Because if you follow my track, GLCA is never over six if you don't have intraarticular deformity or soft tissue laxity, which is an evolution of arthritis intraarticularly. So if you only operate people with very low volume of intraarticular wear, you don't you can forget this sentence because it's not you will not have any GLCA problems. But if you still want to do osteotomies in intraarticular deformity, you need to take care of that. This intraarticular deformity will react of the from the osteotomies. It can be completely corrected like in the right uh, picture here or not corrected at all like in the left picture here. And we you you probably cannot know how it reacts. You can use stress views, a complex X-rays, but you can also just remove some degrees of the intraarticular deformity to take it to consideration that you don't know how it will evolve. Potentially, you will have a complete correction. Potentially, you will have nothing. So GLCA minus 2 divided by 2, this is Christian equation. If you have a 6-degree GLCA, you remove 2, you have 4, you divide by 2, you have 2. Those 2 degrees, you remove them from the correction to avoid overcorrection by two degrees at the end. And if you do a valgus correction by plus two degrees, you 10 degrees of valgus become two degrees of valgus, you're very happy if you have four or six degrees of valgus at the end. And your patient will come back and say, my leg is, is like an X now. It was a round shape, curved thing, now it's an X. Why? I don't understand. And just because you didn't take into consideration and you put your, def your deformity correction inside of the bone, where Initially, it was inside of the joint, and the reaction of the joint to your correction will add, you will double your correction, the one you put in the bone by opening the tibia or closing the femur, and the one that will be the reaction of the intraarticular wear. We cannot know if you go to full correction or not at all correction, so remove some of the degrees intraarticular deformity when you do your planning, and it will help you to have at least very tiny of a correction at the end. Point seven, if you want to control the slope, you need to know how to put your key wires. And your key wires need to be very parallel to the tibial plateau. How to do that? 
This is a very easy, easy trick. This is my tibial slope. You can see here it's a round shaped tibial slope. That means that my X rays are coming not completely parallel to the slope, but rather with an angle, with a, 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 an acute angle to, to those things. But look at this. So I'm just flexing the knee a little bit by 15 degrees. And now the slope is a flat shape. That means that because I flex the knee, my X rays are very parallel. Then when I put my key wire, if my key wire are very parallel, you cannot see them, completely superimposed anterior and posterior key wire to do my cuts, like here in those uh, drawings. If the key wire are, are superimposed, they are parallel to the X rays, which are parallel to the slope. That means that your cutting plane is exactly perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia and exactly parallel to the tibial slope. And you can cut and protect your slope from increasing during your surgery. One millimeter equal one degree, eight points. That's insane. I mean, not a single engineer can imagine something silly like that. The metric system is very perfect. We are very proud as French to, in, to have invented it. Like, not like those scale thing like the English, but you know, they switched to metric systems at a point because there was not clever enough to invent it at this time, but it's okay. But there is no transformation from millimeter to degree that do not exist in the metric system. So do not believe that the millimeter can be one degree. Measure, do digital analogic scaled X-rays and you will be better. Because you must, you're on the only way to have one millimeter equal one degree is to have a wide of your osteonomy cut, which is around uh, 6.5 centimeter. It's a very close and very narrow window. So measure is not true. If you really want to dig into that, do trigonometrics analysis, but it's not mandatory. Just do good X-rays with scaled X-rays and it will be okay. E equal MC2, number 10, number nine, the last before the, 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 we almost reached the end. Don't believe crazy things such as it will resorb cement, phosphocalcix, bioglass, Shit, the only thing that we're resorbing in the bone is bone. Put allograft if you can. Don't put shitty materials inside of the knees. Look at this, four years, three years, two years, four months. Which one got bones, do you think? Which one is an allograft? The one on the right, of course. But the guys from the lab, from the industry, told me that in two years it will be resolved. Here too, and here too. Shit, is not working. Finally, if you want to get, have good outcomes, you need to have good indication. And this is a patient of mine. He ran a marathon after having 200 kilometers of bike and eight, eight kilometers of swim at 55, eight months after an astronomy in 15 hours. It works like hell if you have the good indication. And the good indication is extraticular deformity. So the results in terms of Q scores or any scores will be better if the indication is good. And the, the sole indication, purest indication of neosteronics is extraticular deformity. Finally, your training is lacking. I mean, my training was lacking. I spent a lot of time watching those guys doing surgeries before being able to understand all the tips and tricks that will give you the ability to do a DFO in 20 minutes and an HCO in 20 minutes very easily with tons of people watching me. This is not something that you will have tomorrow. It's something that you will have in two, three years if you, if you succeed doing 50 to 100 assignments every year. Train, come to course, we are happy to receive. Thank you guys. Hello, now the questionnaire session. Next speech, should I go to next speech? Yeah, next speech on surgical techniques on DFO. My Dr. Ronald.
Um, so let's start first with some tips and tricks, some gems of the technique. So here we go. This is on valgus. Remember what we uh, discussed about in the question session after the planning uh, or indication talk of this morning. Valgus can be hidden. Look at the lag. This is the lag in slight valgus. This is the AP knee x-ray. This is the lateral x-ray. But this is the Rosenberg x-ray. And that shows uh, the importance of Rosenberg views when you have valgus legs and lateral knee joint pain. Let's go back to the planning. This was taught to you this morning. Closing wedge distal femoral osteotomy is what we're going to talk about in this presentation. The aimed weight bearing line is on the medial eminence to unload the lateral compartment. Then you have the angle you want to measure. But first you have to decide, do you want to do an open wedge or a closing wedge correction? We are now planning for a closing wedge distal femoral osteotomy correction. The hinge point of that is just proximal of the lateral femoral condyle. This is detailed planning and this is projection of the planned correction angle of 10 degrees to the medial cortex. If you have a calibrated x-ray then, you will find a 10 millimeter wedge to take out to correct to the aimed weight bearing line. And that's what you hear intraoperatively. So this is a detail intraoperatively, a drawing of that. And the K wires are inserted in the bone here, medial. And this is the checking of your planning, calibrated planning before the x-ray, intraoperatively, just with a simple ruler. Now you know that the distance between the K wires is enough to give you the correction you aimed for. All type fixation with angle stable plate of AO. That fixation method has been used for many years and probably you still use it. However, it's not an easy task to put in that seating chisel in the right direction relative to the joint and then to do your osteotomy relative uh, with, an in, with intact hinge at the end of the procedure. It's very difficult. I was trained with this method and it was always very difficult to have an accurate correction and to have a good fixation with a stable hinge on the other side. Current techniques are much easier. One of the reasons is also that at that time we did a horizontal cut and then you have a step off when you take off the wedge. So this is the width of the shaft, this is the width of the condyle. Wedge is removed, it doesn't fit. Instead of that, if you make a oblique cut and you close afterwards, you will have inherent stability of your osteotomy already. And that adds to the fixation stability of your whole construct. Here again, there is no overlap when you do an over, uh, an oblique cut for your distal femoral osteotomy. So that is why we use these oblique cuts. So that after the correction, you close the wedge and then the cortex doesn't overlap. You have a very stable situation then. Inherently, by just using another direction of the cuts. Then you have all kind of fixations. A malleable plate with screws over the osteotomy. We do not particularly like screws over the osteotomy, but you can use it. You have the angle blade plate. You have uh, this first generation kind of plates that were used, for angle stable. Then you have Tomofix like plates or the new clip plates, which is an advancement out of the Tomofix plates, I think. Then the technique of osteotomy itself. You've inserted the K wires, and then you can choose to do a uniplanar technique. So 
the cut from posterior to anterior is full, you have to take care then of the upper edge of the trochlea. You cannot go very low there distally, otherwise you will get into the patellofemoral joint. For that reason, and because the bone healing is better the lower you go, we developed the biplanar technique. So, same K-wire position, however, lower in the metaphysis. And the hinge point can be lower. And then you make your cut, but not fully to the anterior part. So the anterior part is still intact. And then you make a second cut. That's the second osteotomy cut, is proximal. This is a biplanar technique. When you do a biplanar technique, the, uh, that has several advantages. First of all, you will not hurt the patellofemoral joint, whereas you still are very low with your cuts, lower than the uniplanar technique. So you protect that part of the joint. It is inherently stable because of the anterior flounce. If your hinge would break on the lateral side, rotation can be easily noted taking place and then you can correct it. If you do a uniplanar, often with hinge breakage you have a floating situation which is difficult to handle with. Biplanar, easy to handle with that. And finally, this whole surface, the back of this whole surface is sponges bone that heals very easily after closure and fixation. So and we proved that in the literature that you have a fast bone healing of these connecting planes. Then neurovascular damage. If you look at that picture with all the small vessels and the big vessels, you probably will not start doing any surgery at all around the knee. However, people think that on the medial side, it is unsafe. We know of the perforantes vessels on the lateral side, which is dangerous. On the medial side, actually, the vessels you see here are behind the septum. This is the septum. And there is nothing big before the septum. So there aren't many big vessels there. If you keep the septum intact, during your surgery, only make a small incision and go with a blunt Hohmann retractor or any protecting retractor behind the septum, only in that small area, you are in a very safe situation during your surgery, protecting all the vessels in the back. Your action is here in front and you will not find big vessels. So it is an easy approach, to be honest. And this is what you do, this is at the time when we still did an, a longitudinal incision in the median plane, we now do incisions more on the, over the medial vastus, but you go around the vastus medialis to the bone. Small vessels here, septum level, big vessels are posterolaterally, actually very close to where you go when you do lateral open wedge, so beware of that. And this is, of course, a very extended approach in a very muscular patient. Then you can go mini-invasive. You will see that in the video of uh, Dr. Klei. This is out of an article we did on trying to make a mini-invasive approach with some markers we use. We call it the three sisters on the bone, periosteal vessels. And you can go with a small incision to allow for plate fixation, but before that also for osteotomy and biplanar. And the rest of the plate fixation, you can go proximal. Whether you use this type of plate or other types of plate. And we prove that it is a safe approach. Now the operative technique itself. Some of the details before you watch the video. You are standing on this side. So the leg is on the other side, contralateral side. Your fluoroscope is also on that side. So you have ample access to the medial distal femur to do your surgery. Just lower the, the leg that is close to you in this position or 
extended with lowering of the whole leg to give you enough access also for side view fluoroscopy views. Now this is what we're aiming for. So if you now look here in the red, this is the contour of the lateral femoral condyle. We want to have our hinge point just above that area. And we rather like to have equal length of the uh, cuts that form this triangle. If these are equal length, you are guaranteed having uh, a closure. After the closure, you have full bone contact of the cortex here, and that prevents you from uh, fracturing. So we insert that K wire in the direction of this hinge point. And then, of course, as I mentioned, when you have positioned K wires in, you check the distance again and you, you, you aim your second pair of K wires. You can put in four K wires that guide your saw blade or two K wires, whatever you want. But this distance is the distance of your planning. So you make sure that you copy your planning in the patient and then you're uh, having the best correction you can get. So this is what it should look like then. You have enough room for the plate, whether it's this type of plate or nuclear plate or other type of plate, to have your screws um, outside or just at the top of the notch area. And you have long screw uh, ability to have maximum stability of your fixation. Also important is that the entry point gives you enough distal hold of any device you use to fix. If the plate and the screws are too close to the osteotomy, it becomes less stable, irrespective of how you have fixed the screws at the shaft part of the plate. Here we go. This is uh, the operative technique, closing wedge, biplanar within the K wires, biplanar cut, you take the wedge out and then you close the wedge and again this anterior part gives you stability while closure and intraoperatively and if the hinge would break then you and there would be a, uh, uh, a rotation you can easily observe that and correct that immediately so that you at the end of your surgery will have a correction in one plane and not in multiple planes because of hinge fracture. I think now it's time to start the video to see a mini-invasive uh, biplanar medial closing wedge distal femoral osteotomy. I thank you for your attention. Should we just uh, ask Ronald some questions on the technique? So any questions on DFO technique? Everyone's, everyone's, everyone knows everything now, Ronald. So, um, Ronald, do you think we need? Do you think we need four K wires? Or we have, on, we have a we have a question, Russia. Uh, thanks, Ronald. That was a wonderful talk on DFO. Uh, my question to you is regarding the uh, assessment of medial joint, tibiofemoral joint, like what we do for a lateral tibiofemoral joint when you do a medial open wedge osteotomy for medial OA. Do you do a similar assessment on medial tibial femoral joint when you do a lateral arthritis or lateral uh, uh, the DFO for the lateral osteoarthritis? And how do you assess the medial tibiofemoral joint? Because that's critical. Um, if I understand well, you're asking um, what you do except as cartilage damage in the medial tibiofemoral joint when you correct in a DFO. Is that, yes. have I understand yes. your question well? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So well, what do you do when you have cartilage and meniscal damage? Uh, if you're an arthroscopy surgeon, if you're a non-arthroscopy surgeon, we'll not do arthroscopy. We'll directly proceed with the uh, osteotomy, right? So how do, you, yeah. how, how do you assess that situation? 
Yeah, first of all, it's a very good question. It's really out of a practice, so I can see you're doing these kind of surgeries. Um, sometimes you have an unsure situation about the meniscal status, or you have actually a meniscal injury in the compartment where you want to correct to. So you better be aware of that. If you correct in a varization of shotomy, whether it's the tibia medial closing wedge or the femur, distal, uh, distal femur medial closing wedge, um, then you make your planning, which probably aims to 50% for medial to lateral or 45% for medial to lateral. So that's the medial eminence area. That's your original planning. If I would know from MRI scan or previous arthroscopy pictures that that medial compartment is not pristine, there is some degree of osteoarthritis, grade one, two, grade two, I would accept, or a partial meniscectomy status, I would not correct beyond 50 mechanical axis. And you can even doubt whether or not it's acceptable to go from a large valgus into a slight valgus, still positioning the weight-bearing line, not in the medial compartment. So that's how I try to tailor it. And in my experience, that works. So even if the valgus is large to begin with because of lateral compartment osteoarthritis and a previous uh, extra-articular deformity, then reaching not 50, but 55% having less valgus to begin with lessens the burden of pain in such a patient. So you, you can tailor it. Yeah, no, this is regarding the uh, double level osteotomy. Suppose if you have a correction angle of 13 degrees and if MLDFA is less than 90 degrees, so if you want to do larger correction, but still MLDFA is 90, less than 90. So you go proceed for uh, double level or just to a HTO, the various knees. Yeah, I, think, I think this is a question that really belongs to the session on double level osteotomies, but just a quick one on that to, uh, for an answer. Um, I always pre-plan uh, with regards to the preoperative angles and then check the postoperative angles. And again, if you do your deformity analysis right and then go from there regarding your planning, my aim in double osteotomies is to reach a femoral situation which is 88 MLDFA. I'm not going to overcorrect in the femur by itself. I'm not going to do that. So um, 90 to varus size is acceptable, but I'm not going to go much further than that. It's not necessary to go uh, further in the femur. So if you have more to correct, then probably it would be a double osteotomy uh, indication, and I would also go and involve the tibia in that. But that's really a different kind of planning. I hope that answers your question. So, uh, while doing the closing with distal femoral osteotomy, what happens is we cannot get, very often, we cannot get that good ways as you have shown in your pictures and video. So most of the times the posterior cortex are remaining at the bones are not closing. The upper part and lower part is not closing as required. So any tips how to get it right? Yeah, well, I have actually. So first thing is um, have an approach that you can really see whether or not there are still spikes of the dorsal cortex there, because it, most of the time it's the dorsal cortex. However, sometimes it is sponges bone um, still there 
after, so at the, the, directly at the back of the biplanar cut. So um, there can be two areas where there is still bone preventing from closure. And then, of course, the third area is near the hinge itself, so that the hinge itself is not flexible enough. So first, if you want to remove the spikes in between of the dorsal cortex, because we are all afraid to cut that dorsal cortex, me, myself included. So in my practice, each and every time, I check whether or not every aspect of the dorsal cortex is gone. I use conventional saws. I do not use the precision saw of Stryker, which seems to make it easier. But the conventional saw, and you have a, a good protection in the dorsal side, you rinse out the gap, you then can palpate with a forceps or a simple ruler. If you have a simple metal ruler, you just shift it along the edge of the cut, proximal and distal, and it should go smoothly up until the hinge. If it's not, put in your uh, saw, put in your osteotome, whatever tool, and remove the spikes of cortex that are there, because otherwise when you close and they are still there, your hinge is going to break as a fulcrum, it works then the spike. So be careful with that. If you have succeeded in that and still the closure is not smooth and easy, check whether you have a full cut of your biplanar cut and remove some remaining bone, which is probably there just behind the biplanar cut anteriorly. And then finally, if then it's not uh, easy or to elastically deform, check with fluoroscopy where your hinge point is, whether anything is still in the gap before closure, and you can make small uh, K-wire cuts, uh, uh, drill holes in your hinge to lessen um, the force on the hinge and to make it elastically bent easier. When you are preventing hinge fracture, then you use the hinge wire, of course. But before that, you want to have an elastic hinge and that you can reach by uh, having your hinge point exactly at the lateral cortex, not too wide a hinge uh, uh, inside the bone, and to lessen, uh, to make it more elastic, for example, by small K-wire drill holes in that cortical bone on the lateral side. I hope that answers your questions. That's great, Ronald. Okay, so I think we're going to go to the live surgery now. Thank you so much, Ronald. That was a brilliant presentation. And then it's time to, time to see Bushan and Christian in action. I'll speak to you later. Cheers, Cheers Ronald. Okay, can you hear us, Christian? Bushan? Yeah. Should we see the case? Have you got the slide for the case? Can you hear us, Adrian? Now you may be. Yeah, we got you. Okay, so now I hear the echo, so therefore I know that you're on. So still I need some... Uh, Christian, one second. We're just going to run through the case. One second. Yeah, perfect. Go for it. Present it from there on. So this is a 45-year-old uh, male. I think he's the main pain on the right side with the bil uh, bilateral varus deformity. Uh, median joint line a little bit tender on the right side and the range of motion was 5 to 90 degree and left side on the 0 to the 130 degree. I mean uh, the right side also the range of motion was quite good. I think there was something wrong with this. So I think this is the uh, x-ray on weight bearing uh, view. AP and lateral view looks arthritic uh, predominantly on the medial side only. But the absence to see is very young. So this is the weight bearing uh, view. I think the probably the, as you can see the calibrated view are not properly. So there was another uh, view, 
which was there and this is the christians i mean uh, i mean angle of correction so 45 year old female so as you can see that the mldfa which is 94 preoperatively so after correction it will be around 87 and mpta which was 81 preoperatively so it will be around after correction will be 90 so i think uh, we'll go ahead with the uh, his measurement i think the uh, measurement it's uh, difficult to 8.5 uh, millimeter correction on the female side and a 9 millimeter correction on the tibial side so probably both side he said he will correct 9 millimeter fantastic yeah great case perfect so back to theater can you can you hear us guys we do and we hope that you hear us perfect okay so now so we're just about in the process of finalizing everything so um can can we go lower with the table no we can't huh can the table go a bit lower okay guys so um i don't know what you can see i still once again where is the oh uh, yeah it's we have, can you place that television probably a bit further there so that i can see I can see what you guys see. That makes it easier for me. So oh, you always start with the femur, yes? Yes, because the femur, perfect. The height of the table is good now. Femur is obviously the closing wedge osteotomy. The height of the table is great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the femur is the closing wedge osteotomy. And as the closing wedge is obviously um, dedicated in what it can deliver, uh, we cannot control it later afterwards. We take this surgery first and then we skip to the uh, surgery that gives us the opportunity for at least some fine tuning okay so i try now to palpate at the outer of the knee joint um, how the knee looks alike try to palpate all the anatomical landmarks here and draw it okay So that's the first thing we are doing. Are you with us, guys? Gotcha, Christian. So again, just because it's a really nice point to make, what about the other leg? Because you're obviously standing on the inside of the patient there, um, standing on the outside of the patient there. What, what, what? Any, any set, any setup tips for us? Yeah. So the other side, in this case, as I uh, have to swing the um, um, the intensifier during the surgery to the other side. For the other side, for these cases, I don't tend to do anything. We can think about changing that when we go to the uh, to the um, to the uh, high tibial osteotomy in a bit, but up and so far, I wouldn't change anything. Okay. And just so, just broadly speaking, Christian, um, the approach for the lateral side of the femur is very similar to the approach for the medial side, isn't it? In terms of. It is. Yet there is some differences because of this little structure that I'm about to draw right now, and that is called ITB. So this is the upper border of the ITB, okay? So what I'm now having is, can I have the implant, please? Um, do you have a view onto what I'm doing? Yes, you have. See that? Perfect. So this is the implant that is about to sit here later on. This is where it happily lives. And we want to avoid that this inferior part is interacting uh, with the epicondyle. So that's the epicondyle, and this is the flare of the osteotomy where this, uh, where this little piece then comes to sit. So in order to know where that is, I constantly think that the, the last interligatal part of my thumb, so this last, um, last part of the thumb resembles exactly to me this area so i just place the interdigital joint my thumb over the epicondyle roll down grab over with my index and in between from here to there that's my incision got it nice okay so if this is the incision then we can start with this one <clears throat> and obviously we have to fight on this side the IT band. So what we do is we make a curved hockey stick release of the IT band 
and suture that later on. Because other, we cannot gain access to the back of the femur, and this is where we want to be at the very end. Okay, let's have the blade and start the show. So the first thing, obviously, is incision. Let's go broad enough so that you see everything. Nicely done, my son. Okay, so now we are down to the IT bend, and I just go for, once again, a blunt dissection. Very simple. Now we take the retractors and place them, and let's not do too much of, uh, uh, here we have to, here we have to, let's take the forceps. Not too much of blood management. So we incised the upper border of the IT band here already because we knew where it was. So this is the flimsy part. This is the the the, the tight part and the uh, and the more solid. So once you are at the upper border, you just put your finger inside and rip it to the top so that you have a blunt dissection. And now for the distal side, we go here. Let's hope that they can see that. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it well. You see it? Yeah. I take the bovi and in an oblique way, best with the blue bovi button to cauterize it all the time on your way, in very very gentle steps. You just get rid of this nasty IT bend. See what we're doing? See it very nicely. Perfect. So then, once we're here, we can just lift up the lateral vastus, as you can see here. It was all bluntly dissected, just lift it up, and you can see the whole distal femur. So now, the only difficulty from the lateral side is to come to, come to the back. Because what we have here is recurrent fibers coming from the IT bend. And these are called Kaplan fibers. So you need to get rid of them in order, in order to gain access to the back. So once again, in a very careful way, because there is lots of blood vessels coming here, we try to go to the very back of the femur and here we add that curve nicely done so not too much bleeding here in her case now you can either take your finger or some sharp instrument or you can take the back of the forceps and go over to the other side or some curved some curved um, some curved uh, periosteal elevator like this one okay so now going to the contralateral side, we are already here at the tip of the condyle. So we, I can lift up my fingers in the back of the femur and I can lift up the whole thing. Okay? So that's what we're having. Now as we have that, we just go to full extension. I put my finger, my index to the back still, table a little bit lower again, like three or four centimeters. So you've, made a, you've made a window at the back of the soft tissues there and you've placed you placed your finger, once you've placed your periosteum, you put your finger in the back of the femur, place right, my ac right across the back. Let's have the first K wire now. Can you see that, what we are here doing? No, you can't. Can you come further from, from there? The camera has to be here, actually. The camera has to be here. Over my shoulder and inside. So, guys, um, we we invest a bit of time into a better image for you because that's important. Sure. Back a little bit. So, just whilst Christian's getting the X-ray sorted as, uh, and gets the camera sorted. The, one of the things that Ronald spoke about are these three vessels, and you see them on the yeah. medial side, 
you yeah, right. also the quite often see them on the lateral side. Yeah. Oh, no, don't go there. No, don't go in the pouch. I don't like these retractors because they stick out so long. There is rule retractors. They are way better. Adrian is now laughing because I constantly speak about my rule retractors. He's got a real thing about rule retractors. So what's your start point and what are you aiming for with the wire, Christian? Well, what we aim for is, as we heard already a couple of times, an isosceles triangle, whatever that might be. So let's first shoot one K wire and look at the X-ray, okay? So that's the first thing we are doing. So now obviously, yeah, uh, change the, um, uh, just mirror it. Perfect, yeah, we see it now. Do you have an image of that, yeah? Yeah. Perfect, so what you see is that probably the starting point is not too bad, but you equally see that the aiming point is not on top of the contralateral condyle, no. okay? But I can feel that there is some osteophyte in the back. Take your finger and stick it inside to the back. Let's rotate that image, uh, 180. Coming it's from the condyle. The mass on our head. Yeah? Just big ro one. rotate the x-ray image, please. Thank you. You see it even on the x-ray. You can see it on the x-ray. On the lateral side from the condyle, there is an osteophyte coming. So we need to cut this either now with a chisel and extract it, or we have to inc include it into our osteotomy, and this is what we will do, okay? Now I take this one again, but this might misled me. I thought this is the upper border of the condyle, and it's an osteophyte. So now lift this up again. Come here. Perfect. So now I reposition my K-wire and aim a bit more southwards. Give it to me once again. This is not too bad now. So the only issue I'm having with this now is that if you look at this K-wire and you look at the angle from the cortex, the starting cortex to the K-wire above and below, Above, we are over 90 degrees, and below, we are a bit under. But roughly, it's not far, and we need to cut out a wedge of 9 mils. So I would say, if we add 9 southwards now, because this is obviously our upper K-wire, yeah. then we don't have any space left to place the, the plate. So what we are doing now is, we love this position in terms of the, of the point where we end up, but the position for the starting point was too low, a little too bit low. Yep. resembling the upper wire. Nothing is happening here. So what we do now is we go a bit northward and shoot the wire again. Okay, let's check where we are. Once again, as we were parallel shifting Yeah, good start point, but a little bit high. So you're just going to increase your angulation a bit. And that's nice now. Perfect. That's great, Christian. So this is for the upper one. Obviously quite high, but nine for her is quite a lot. And as she's small, we need some space at least for the plate. Okay, so this is a compromise. So now let's go nine millimeters downwards. And for nine millimeters, that's quite simple. We just need something that is nine millimeters thick. We could take a drill being nine mils. I think for the people that are just getting familiar with any new plate, put the plate against the bone and just mark it, just so you can get familiar with, uh, with the anatomy. But Christian has used it a fair few times, so that looks great, Christian. So what are you going to use as your cutting block for the nine millimeters? So I now have your something guide. which is very sophisticated. Yes a technique which is very expensive, may not be available in your country. We call this ruler. And now we need another K-wire. So nine millimeters actually uh, can be measured, I guess. Huh? For other distances that are smaller, I, I like to just use something from the tray that I measure before, and I know how thick it is, and that is what you can place here. There is equally wedges on the tray, that would be nine millimeters. 
So that is going too low. So I need to reorient it. And this is what Adrian already said. There is drill tip K wires. And obviously they are way better to direct because they go where you want and not where they want. Okay? And they're, and they're breakable. I think the Arthrex ones are really good for this because they just break off. So you can get nice and close to the patient with the saw. Hmm. Don't like that, but let's, for the moment, leave it that way, because we pretend that the saw blade will diverge from them anyhow, and it's just a millimeter, okay? That looks great. Looks perfect. So the next thing we do is, yeah, that looks quite big, but it's okay because it's nine. We measured it. The next thing we take is another K-wire. And once again, one smart idea is just to take the upper one, drive it further, and palpate the outer to know where the exiting point is. And then, once we have this, we just go in. Can we zo again. zoom out a little bit so we can see what you're doing on the outside? Just want to see what's happening on the medial side of the knee now. Okay. So he's pushed the, the top wire through the skin so you can feel it it's act, acting as a guide to guide in the hinge wire. A bit more. Bring it further in. We can remove the hinge wire temporarily with tra uh, or uh, bring it back a bit to actually allow our cut to be further to the lateral side, but for the time I want to keep it in that cage. Okay? So the next thing I'm doing is, I just have my finger to the back, I feel the osteophyte which is here in the back, and obviously I have my two K wires there. Can you see that? I can, yeah, we can see it very nicely. Okay, so what we expect now is two parallel cuts, one here and one there, that we can close, and then we want to have a biplanar cut ex exiting our femur some three or four centimeters proximal to this. So that's what I'm doing with my bobby tip now. I exit it. And, what's, and the, what's the rule, Christian, in terms of how far from the back to the front do you go? Is it 60 percent, 70 percent? It's rather 75, 66 till 75. So we say the two, uh, two thirds till three quarter uh, for the uh, osteotomy in the back and the rest is then reserved for the ascending, the first uh, no, let, let's not take that. Let's just illustrate how I do it. Christian, okay? one, one final trick. Can you just talk about the back of the femur as a guide for that as well, in terms of the angulation of the... Right, that's great, because the femur and this, at, this, uh, um, at this level has uh, uh, described the curve. And as it's a curve and you have the posterior shape of that curve guiding a bit anteriorly, you can just be parallel to this surface with your biplanar ascending cut. It gives you a very nice angulation. Excellent. To exit the femur. Okay, so the next thing I'm doing is I take the saw, put it there. We just don't do anything. I just, oops, let's take, let's take the next one. No, it's no, no issue. We just abandon one of these nice Langenbecks. No, just, just don't do that. So I, I just place it here. This is now X-ray triggered. Christian? Just, yeah. just don't do this too quickly. Take, take your time because we really want to see this. Now, one thing that I think would be really nice to show the delegates here is because they need to make two completely parallel cuts. And something, something that you showed me, which we do in London when you're not around, is we go a little bit with the first one and then we do the second one. So we've got two right. tracks. We do them at the same time. So we'd make a little so mark so and then we, we go the other one. The same thing like on the tibia, we just rotate it, and when it's just one thin line parallel to the beam, you withdraw it two mils, let it run quickly, and enter the cortex. Just enter the cortex, okay? And don't go far, so you don't have to be too afraid of neurovascular damage at that level, I guess. Yeah? yeah. So don't be afraid there. And then the next thing is you just take this move it upwards, make one more x-ray, okay, still one line, parallel lines, and once again replicate this. So they're both going to be exactly the same now. Make a little one, and then we move, and then we make a definitive one. And that's a really nice way of making it so that the two are going to converge together.
So what I now do is, as you see, I don't have any retractor inside. Don't cut your finger. I, don't cut your finger. And it's great to have my finger in this particular case because there is this, there is this nasty osteophyte that I mentioned. And I'm now on this osteophyte, and it's such a shame that you cannot, cannot feel it, but obviously it would be a massive disturbance for the whole osteotomy because I'd be forced to cut all the way to the back, and this without protection is nuts. We can feel, we can feel your emotion on this osteophyte. Yeah, it's really, I'm, I'm very emotional. So excited. <laughs> the excitement is is what it is. That's so nice. So we are down now all the way to there and we sure, surely cut this osteophyte. And I will hopefully be able to present you this osteophyte when we cut it out. So now we do the same on the other side. All joking aside, this is a very good way of ensuring that nothing gets damaged. Your finger can't be cut by the saw and it, it, it acts as a brilliant neurovascular protector. Outside. I will drive it through to the other side. And we'll this is pull it out. Safe, yeah. Question was, what about the care retractor on the on the femur, the new retractor from Nuclip? Do you think that will be helpful? It's uh, definitely helpful because when you're not trained cutting your hand like I am, then you uh, will have something there that helps you out. So that's really great. Um, you've, got some arthrit you've got some arthritis, you've got distal interphalangeal joint of your finger there, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> because of the x-ray, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. You really upset Bushan. He says, all these x-rays, he's just, he always, I bet he's shaking his head right now. He's really sad about you x-raying your hand the whole time. So let's take a look at that again. Uh, let's take the, what we have created so far. Let's not be too quick here for you. So that's what we have so far. Can you see that? Mm, zoom in a little bit. We're getting a bit of reflection. Oh, that's bad because it looks nice. Oh, uh, yeah, perfect. Right. That's great. We see it really yeah. nicely. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, it's great. Okay. So this is where we started. This is exactly where we are. So this is our ascending cut. We are already there. Okay. So the next thing we'd be doing is to perform this ascending cut. But then I think maybe we have not cut far enough to the lateral side. We will see, we can see whether it's uh, moving or not because we've uh, kind of uh, made ourselves an obstacle with this hinge wire a little too far maybe uh, at the lateral to the start, lateral starting vortex. But we can see, okay? So the next thing we do is we perform the biplanar and for this now, I have to go back one step to positioning. We have not spoken about that as we were busy. So in the back of this here, we have a pole star. So that the femur, the thigh bone, rests nice and easy on this pole star and the, and the uh, lower limb hangs freely down. So we can lift this up five degrees, right? Five degrees without anything happening here at the distal femur. So, okay? so, so the, the ankle is supported by a foot bolster? Not the ankle, the thigh. The thigh. So and if the thigh is supported, it cannot fall back by its own weight. So and I strongly advocate you to do that, to support it, and you can prove it by lifting this one up, so that there is uh, the hypomocleon is not sitting here, but here. Okay? If you do that, you prevent your thigh from falling back. And sometimes the weight of the bone an alone is enough to break your hinge. Okay? So now let's take the saw again. And once again, like in the, in the tibia, in, true, in the true frontal plane, you just go inside, aim for the ascending cut, and what, 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 is your, what, are you, what are you doing with the foot at the moment to make sure you're in the frontal pain? In complete neutral rotation, so the way that it was before. So we know that our x-ray is still AP. Straight up. So I'm starting at the lateral cortex here, moving all my way upwards to make sure that I know that I exited the femur. And here I, I exited it now. I have this drive through. We saw that. And now I move to the other side and gently go 
all the way down on the contralateral side, on the starting cortex, so to say, on the medial cortex, sorry. So it's like, it's like a river goes in meanders, so around the corner, upwards, downwards. So now, by definition, I should have completed the cut of the femur, and we can just, just uh, see by only fixing the foot, just hold the foot in, in position now, um, can we have a little bit more light on the on the field here? Perfect. So what I'm now doing is I take a clamp, some surgical clamp. You see, I'm I'm moving this now. Yeah, we can see it's nice and mobile. The osteotomy. Just a, a clip, a tiny clip. I placed one clip here. Yeah, right. So there are lots of different tricks to get the bone out. You can put two of the chisels in and just tease it out right. with two chisels. Right. I, like to, I like to just open it a bit and then move it out. And here you see, uh, uh, we have to lift this up, please, and place it somewhere where they can see it. Because it's a nice wedge, such a shame because we wanted to graft it. Is it gone? Uh, it's gone. Oh, well. It's gone. It's not the clip that we wanted. <laughs> it's it's gone. It's not what we, I, what we are used to. Anyhow, I wanted to present to you the osteophyte in the back. And there is quite some osteophyte, but we cut it nicely. And so we can, can, I guess we can try to close it. Talk us through the tricks, Christian, of, of you, you probably can close this already, but imagine you're starting out, you're a little bit nervous, and it doesn't close immediately. What do we do? What steps do you take then to get the osteotomy to close nicely? We need to reassure that we have a complete cut for the biplanar. Right. We need to reassure that we have come far enough uh, to, the, to the hinge. Yeah. And we need to reassure that no obstacle is in the gap. And, and what about milling? What about show, showing the milling technique? And then closure. So let, let us take, this is something that we have now achieved without major issues. Yeah, and, well, I know. I mean, you've closed it. But what, what about showing the saw trick with the milling? Because I think... I do. I do yeah. in a bit. Okay. So this is where we are without any hassle. Okay? It looks great. So now hold it like this. Only just fix the foot at the very distal side. Don't, don't touch it in the, in the, uh, on the top. Now we attack the saw again. And there may be now, or there might be, some, some remnants that we have not really milled away. So what I'm doing is, I take the saw, and from the starting cortex on... Let's get some video, live video of that. Live screening so, uh, on the C-arm. Take your finger out so you don't destroy your finger. But uh, no, but it's, I have to show you. Yeah. So I go in and out, in and out, in and out, and whilst doing that, I press with my finger onto the cortex. Okay, so and this, I try to clean away everything which is inside. This is a really, really fantastic trick. So he's getting rid of all of the remnant of the bone that's sitting in the osteotomy gap by milling it with the saw. And it'll just gradually, I mean, obviously, if you've done so many that it works this well every time, you don't need to worry too much. But most of you will find that it just will be struggling. So you just mill it nice and slowly with the saw. So and what we now have is this. The saws in the so look at the starting cortex, it fits. Look at the, at the other opposite cortex, nice, safe. And this is where we came from. See that? And this is where we are now. So, so now, Christian, can we, can, can we see the biplane at all? Is the biplane nicely yep. closed? Wait, give me a second, because this is now a delicate phase of the surgery. And we don't want to really pull it too much, but we can show it to you. So this is what you see now. Can you look inside here? How mobile is that osteotomy? Is it opening and closing nicely? Sorry, just it taking... Is. It is, it is. If we do too much, it breaks. Yeah, don't do too much. So, so but you see or you don't see any, any gap here. Great. So it nicely fell and came all together. Perfect. Okay? Perfect. Next thing is we need another wire driver, please. Okay. 
And if you have been very precise, then the two holes of the K-wire form the figure of eight. Okay, let's try to make that, to, sh to, to instruct you here and show you how that looks. But you cannot see that, unfortunately, huh? It all looks very nicely closed. We can just about... Yeah, anyhow. So let's take the... Wait, they, these two holes form a little eight. Oh, so yeah. um, give me the plate now. So let's just take the plate and slide it under the lateral vastus. And I'm starting with this screw because this screw is critical. So this is closest to Blumsart's line, and we don't want to have that inside of the notch. So let's start with this screw first and check for the height, number one. So this is the first height check. Too low, so we bring it higher now. Wait. Christian, the question is, is that a dedicated lateral plate or is that the contralateral medial plate? It's a plate that is designed for both sides, for lateral and medial. We are too far posterior. So it's a dedicated lateral plate. It's dedicated lateral and dedicated medial. So how do you like this position? I think that looks fantastic. Wants to live there, huh? It looks very so happy. Take once again another tube and go to the shaft part of this plate. Which is critical, but here we have it. Okay, so uh, next, uh, uh, hold it close, please. We take the next sleeve limiter. What I now need is the next K wire. So, and now we can toggle around this distal position to the to the front and to the back. Okay, um, um, just extend it a bit further so we have more compression and not so much bend. So we try to really now pre-compress it. This is too far in the back. This is to find the front. That is somewhere in the middle. And I try to fix that now. In. Let's once again have a nice x-ray. Yeah, well, we are one millimeter now apart. We did not manage to, uh, to compress it well, but there comes a trick. I live with that because that's less than a millimeter. Okay? Perfect. So now what is the lateral x-ray? Okay, we need some space here. Can we uh, move away this uh, camera for a while? Just spin it to the side. I need to stand here. Spin, bring the camera to there. Turn it over my head. Turn it over my head. And don't touch the... No. No, no, just rotate it away. It has to go off. Turn it, 90 degrees. Turn the camera, 90 degrees. So that th this camera has to be there. Okay. So now we need a lateral x-ray. Let me come here. Stop. And now we need the cover. So someone asked a question for the first live uh, HTO that we did this morning, and we don't, get, we don't get a lateral for the HTO, but we do get a lateral for the DFO. Right. That's and nice. we need to have that. It's good. Otherwise, we don't know how it, how it stands towards the, the femur. So this is critical. A bit more upwards. Perfect. I have my finger in the back. That's great. So this is the position that we have. That's great. And I think that's nice. In the back you can see that everything is touched nicely. You can see this osteophyte is cut off, but you see the rest of this curly flower shaped thing. And I guess that's really nice. Huh? Yeah, it looks great, Christian. 
Okay, so now we go to AP again. Is it possible to zip, once you get a couple of screws in and you've got it nice and stable, can we see the ascending biplane? Just see how nicely we do that. Let us Or can you, show us on, can you show us on the x-ray? Can you uh, rotate externally and show us the oh, I biplane? I can't anymore now. Oh, oh yeah, you mean uh, uh, on the AP? Well, on that lateral view, can we see the biplane? Uh, we are not on, on lateral anymore. Okay, don't worry. We move to... So give me the first drill piece. I hate these towers. These towers are crap. Whichever system that you use, Tomafix, whatever, you should do this. How far we can go? So question is, what's the biggest correction that you feel is safe uh, in the femur? Oh, that's tricky to answer. Yeah. Depends on bone quality, on on sclerosis, on on plenty of things. So, um, but everything over nine is really something that I don't like. Give me the two fifties that we have, please. This is this is big. I mean, nine's quite big, and this is a small patient. Nine's quite a big correction. Um, but in the good old days, if you think it's eight in the tibia, nine, this patient would be getting a. 16 millimeter opening wedge high tibial osteotomy and that would create loads of joint line obliquity so just sharing it out between the two so this is this is i mean we do do uh high and um, bigger osteotomies in fact i think ronald has a case in a in a in a female 22 millimeters closing in the femur so it is possible um but but, but the bigger it gets the, the more careful you need to be next one so you're just not doing anything particularly exciting now. You're just, you're just drilling and locking in the screws. Yeah, telling, but these locking, uh, these drill towers are critical because they kind of prevent you from really putting, putting your other ones in position because they are too bulky. Yeah. So, so there, are, there are some new, nice new towers that, that, um, that we've helped to design that are slimmer yeah. and they're longer and they even go in yeah. on a screwdriver. So you can push them in but on the screwdriver. It's really a, not a nice experience. Okay, next one. No, no, uh, give me the next screw. So because these towers don't fit into the, uh, into the whole screw, please. Uh, 50 once again. That's because Sunit's doing so many osteotomies. He's wearing out the uh, equipment. Okay, next drill, please. So I have to uh, um, freehand do it does not fit inside. Uh, wire driver, please. Okay. Nice one. So the two times, what do we have? 55 or 60? What have we opened? 60, please give me those 60s, the two 60s. Nice one. So that's the 4.5 millimeter drill, isn't it? Um, it is, yeah, but it's not, it's unfortunately the towers are not matching the, the plate because it's an old set. So one really has to look there, okay. Let's check this now. Rotate it, please. Now come in. Uh, the camera is a bit in my way, I would say, here. Can we do something to the camera? Because this is exactly where I sit. <clears throat> So you see, I ran short with some of these screws, but well, I don't mind really uh, stable enough. And we had enough issues here with uh, the fact that the towers weren't right. But that's okay. 
we can proceed and I want to show you now what we do with this little gap of a millimeter that we have there. So can we have another lung back please? So question was uh, why use the retractor for the tibia not for the femur? Um, wh why didn't you just use your finger on the tibia? Um, well you can but there is a fewer space on the tibia than on the femur. It's much tighter. So there's a big window at the back of the femur. So Maybe it works. Um, okay, the drill, the small drill that we have here, this drill. So what are you doing now, Christian? What's that device that you've got in your uh, hand? What you see here is an oblong hole. Yeah. So this hole is oval. And in fact, it uh, is designed a way that you, when you introduce it through this preformed hole here, it gives you one millimeter of compression. And now we need a gray, a, a gray screw. And what, we si have what, what size is that drill? Because it's a different drill, isn't it? Uh, it's smaller. It's uh, wait. usually 2.8, but it, in this case here, it's all different because this also is some drill that we found on some other tray. The dedicated drill wasn't available. Okay, so I unfortunately have to measure this again with a depth gauge. Yeah, perfect. Nice. So this is your compression screw, yeah? This is 35, a compression screw 35. That's a gray screw. That's a, a gray screw. Packed. What do we have? Thirty-six. In the box, don't we have a gray screw there? Uh, uh, in the screw uh, box. Show me the box where all the screws are. If not, then we take this one there that sticks out. Can you, can you give me the screws? Can you, can you give me the box there? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The question was about one of the screws is in the osteotomy or near to it. Pardon? top screw is close to your osteotomy or just sitting uh, in it. Are you yeah. worried about I, that? I would not know. Not at all. These are too small. Too small. Yeah, all too small. No, no is the answer. It doesn't matter. No. So we are waiting for the dedicated screw now here because we need some compression. Huh? So these ones are too small. We need rather 4.5 than 3.5. Okay, so the right screw is not here. We need a, we organize a 4.536 now, in order to compress this. Yeah. So when this one screw is close to your osteotomy, you should not be too concerned. It's just a, as a matter of fact, the alternative to that would have been to bring the plate further distally. And yep. now look where the distal part of the plate is on this X-ray. What would you say? Would it fit to put it further to the distal side? No, no, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very nice height. I think... It just um, has to... If once you get the screw and you feel things are nicely bat tightened down, they've battened down the hatches, can we get a homing in and have a look at the biplane? For sure. For sure. Let's first do this one compression screw because this is now what brings it all home. Absolutely. And uh, and then once the the screw is inside, um, the seat. We need to check whether oh that's better. It's not quite the normal screw that we have here, but it's it's okay. No, it's not turning. And the next thing, probably the drill was too, uh, too small. Give me the, for the this screw hole, please give me uh, the other, this one. Give me this one first. We need to work on this a bit. It's a bit freestyle, buddy, so it's... That's it. Now we take this screw. It's a bit freestyle. Oh. 
Just get the camera back on target. Now we need a hand uh, drill for this, but not the one in the, on the kit, but the one that is there. So let's take a look what the compression is doing now under the fluoroscopy. So we just need the screwdriver now. And before, I, I just uh, approach now with the screw the plate, okay? Yeah. So if I don't want to compress against my own uh, K-wire that I placed, I need to remove this Inset centering safe. part. Can I have a, a screwdriver? Normal large fragment screwdriver. It should be one on the active motion tray. If you search there, it's on the active motion tray. I've seen another one. Okay. Nice one. So now we try to compress this. So let's go big on the uh, on the X-ray image. Yeah, uh, there is no X-ray anymore. Once again, X-ray doesn't work. Oh, okay. Now it does again. So it just enlarge it. Okay, great. So now I really compressed it and bring the shaft part together, and this brings down everything to the uh, to the osteotomy. And this is now really compressed. Okay. So great. the next thing we do is we um, we remove. The K-wire, wire driver, please. Yeah, wire driver. And then we need the drill, please. How many cortices for the um, proximal end of this plate? For well, the proximal one, uh, two, uh, one, if it, if it fits here, uh, we don't know, because we don't have, uh, don't have short screws available. And for these ones here, one, I go bicortical. That's a nightmare. Good so bone. Go is the the uh, no. Uh, I just just need the drill again, please. The drill is has seen better days. Okay, so now we need to measure this. So that's a 35, and that's a 35. And so two times 35, please. Two short, yeah. two short ones at the top. And two short ones at the top, right. One, 35. So we are soon there. Give us a bit. Okay, now we take the long sleeves, please. No, it's okay. It's okay. Feel that it's a pity that they don't fit. They don't work here, and these other ones are too bulky, so uh, they don't work. They don't fit. Only these ones that work. Okay, drill, please. Yeah. So we try to bring in these screws now. I don't know if a 20 would fit. I don't dare to. 35, 20 may fit. Uh, I don't know why he's. We don't need an X ray. Um, absolutely. So, what, what a question was uh, the thing that we, you know, we don't like to see the most when we're doing well. The thing we, might, we don't like to see the most is uh, is obviously something at the back getting damaged. But uh, something that can happen is a hinge fracture. A hinge fracture, if it occurs. As Ronald explained in his talk, the biplane opens. You can just see it opening. So it's just no longer um, flush. 
and you can reduce it, put your plate on, everything looks perfect, but you have to plate the other side. Just a small yeah. distal radius plate, something. It doesn't have to be a big plate, but you have to put a plate on the other side. That's it, quite true. So in the distal femur, this is non-forgiving. So, um, Don't chance it, it. Another one, yeah, please. So uh, we are in the process of finalizing here. The last screw is just on its way. And if, and, in fact, um, in, in super big patients, heavy patients, we plate both sides prophylactically in DFOs, in, in big athletes. Yeah, just a small locking plate on the other side. doesn't need to be a heavy plate. Okay, now let's take the <laughs> take the hand drill to tie it all and screw it home. Get that hinge wire out, Bush. Bush takes the hinge wire. That's it. So, um, yeah, femur is done. We can now make the final X-ray, and then we rearrange everything to see the tibia. Give us one more second here. Okay, now we need an x-ray. Wait, I have it. That's okay. Let's go a bit further south so you see the whole thing. That's yeah, where looks, we are. Looks great, buddy. Absolutely fantastic. Well done. Okay. Good guys. So I guess uh, you wanted to see the uh, you wanted to see the ascending cut. If you could show us how close the biplane is at the front, yeah. Let's take a whole man here, because otherwise they will not be able to see that. I don't like to go there, because uh, you go into this anterior pouch. So, um, can you see this? Yeah. This part here, can you see it? Yeah, it looks Give me pretty, space, pretty good. Can you see it there? You've not got your sucker inside the biplane, have you? Well, actually here, this is where the biplane is. So Perfect. the blade is inside, but more wouldn't. Perfect. Very good. Well done. The one, he made a comment there that we just, it was a bit of a throwaway comment, but just sitting on the top of the femur is, a, is, a, is a, 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 an area of fat that is very important for the gliding of the quads. Um, so we, we don't like yeah, to disturb it. Quickly. I take that. I take that. That's okay. Just take, um, just give me a lung back so that Bush can hold that. I'm sitting here so nicely, so I close that quickly. And then we take the x-ray, please, and we have to uh, go to the other side. So the uh, next surgery is from the other side. So if we think about the sort of logical steps for this, it was the skin incision down to the ITB. The incision of the ITB, slight hockey stick down. Identifying um, the bone and making an incision at the back of the femur. The finger goes in so you can feel the back of the femur. You place the first wire according to the, the different pl the plates that you're using. So when you use this plate or Tomafix, whatever, put it against the bone, work out where the osteotomy needs to be. You then place your wire, you place your second wire, they need to converge. And obviously, you make those two saw cuts so that the saw blade is in, is in the line of the joint. Small one and then go all the way, complete the cut. You do the biplane, remove the wedge, and then use that milling technique to close the osteotomy and then um, apply the plate and use the compression system to get that final bit of compression. We think a lateral x-ray actually is a very good thing to do because we don't want the whole plate too posterior and we don't want the top of the plate too anterior, too posterior. So it's worth getting a lateral x-ray as you saw. Um, and uh, anything that I missed there, Christian, key steps? Oh, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have said that better. I, anyhow, um, uh, as you were pointing out, I do these lateral x-rays because I, I think it's, it's really bad in a femur when you have placed all your screws and then you see that you have to unmount it uh, and, and you don't really have lots of shots there at the femur because the femur is really thin at that level. It's, it's smaller than at this particular level it's smaller than the tibia. So um, I don't like to compromise there. I want to know where my plate is. I want to have 100% mechanical stability at the distal femur. Um, otherwise, it's really, uh, it's really hasselsome. And uh, 
I've had my learning curve there, I can tell you. So the, to master this schema takes quite some time. Um, but one thing I learned during this learning curve is you must not compromise here. In, the, in, in a case like this where you've got it beautifully closed, you know your hinge is good, you know your plate position is optimal, how much weight would you allow this patient to take post-op? I uh, can show you. Uh, some of them are on full weight bearing. Yeah. Some, some not. So, so, you, it's, so you'd it's really be happy in this, for this lady, if she wants to wash when she's standing at the sink, it's absolutely fine for her to take sure. full weight through this without a brace. Yeah. That she's going to need crutches because she's not going to want to walk on it because it's going to be sore. Well, yeah, some, some of them even walk. Yeah. I mean, some yeah. of them is really just full weight bearing even in, in, in walking, not just like standing half the body weight yeah. bipedal. Uh, it's, it's really walking. So would I recommend that in each and every case? For sure not. So this is delicate surgery. It has a way higher failure rate than, than, the, uh, than the tibia. So I, I would not recommend that. But if you, if you wanted to, you could. So... Okay. Good guys. Let's take that. Three to four centimeters. How long is the ascending biplane cut, Christian? It is three to four. Uh, depending, obviously, on uh, the configuration of your patient. So it's uh, it's the size of the patient that dictates everything. Questions. The, the biplanar cut, when we close the osteotomy, it will, the, it will overlap normal cortex proximally, won't it? Yeah, and we right, leave it there. We need to be a bit one, more quiet. We cannot so hear the... One of the nice things about doing this biplane procedure is Alex Stavli did a, a really nice CT study, and it's healed at three to four weeks in a lot of patients. So you get very early healing of the biplane. And it, it's, there is a shift, so it is cortex on cortex. If you're doing massive osteotomies, then sometimes you see the biplane obviously does uh, not line up perfectly cortex to cortex, but you want it to be nice and flat. And this piece of bone, this area, should heal within the first month. And, and, and that's so nicely closed, that osteotomy should be, closed in, should be healed in six weeks, that femur. Yeah, yeah. So, so we would, have yeah, go on anterior osteotomy is with this ascending is that you naturally think you cut away at least the thickness of the saw blade one millimeter so when you just close that there is a millimeter missing but due to the fact that it's not like perpendicular 100 percent what you what you do in fact is by closing uh, the wedge that you cut out you you bring the uh, you bring the the, the gap that you created closer. So um, you approximate this ascending cut. And that's obviously a nice thing to, to have, to know that the further you close the gap, the further you close the ascending cut. Just yeah. one point. So, and although it's not, not part of what you've just demonstrated, Bushan's got a very nice technique for his rotational femoral osteotomy where he uses the biplane to actually dial in um, where, we, where he does a um, varizing osteotomy, he uses the biplane to actually dial in his rotation by making a, a second cut and, and actually cutting out a wedge of bone at the front. And then by then making the, the biplane closed, you can dial in. How much push and Seven degrees? How much rotation? Yeah, about seven hmm? degrees. Is there a question? Uh, do we have the option of uh, oblong hole in the high tibial osteotomy plate so that we can direct the screw a little bit inferiorly for the lateral uh, compression of the hinge? Uh, I'm talking about NCT plate. Like in femur, we got an oblong hole, similarly in uh, tibial side. Well, do we get a compression option in the tibial side? Yeah, there, there isn't an oblong compression option in the tibia, but what there is is a compression jig that they've built, which will be commercially available soon. So you can actually, you can use this jig to actually translocate the tibia if you want. But what we teach is just be careful with the hinge so that you don't go through and you don't have that problem. 
but um, no, there isn't on the, uh, they have a series of different plates, but they haven't com um, created a compression plate um, for an opening wedge. For the closing wedge on the tibia, which is a quite a common operation for us, um, then yeah, you, there is a compression hole so that you can compress. So there is a compression option for closing, but not for opening. And in a patient with a very high BMI, uh, say 30 to 35, between 30 to 35, and you're doing a high tibial osteotomy, so we'll go for autogenous iliac crest graft in such cases because patients have no. high BMI? No, it's just a terrible thing to do to the patient. I mean, they hate it. You don't need to put anything in these gaps. So in Germany, it's forbidden to put anything in the gap. You can go for iliac crest, but you can't, they can't use allograft in Germany. They do 20,000 osteotomies a year or something, absolutely enormous numbers. Nothing gets put in the gap. Um, so you can completely leave it. You don't need to put autograft or allograft or synthetic. But if you have allograft, of course, we think it's a good thing to do. And my question was why we are worried about doing uh, HTO on a high BMI no, patient. So what, is, what is our concern? I mean, high BMI, the chances of failure is more, non-union is more. I mean so, so that type 1 plate, if, if you get it in your hand, it's absolutely tiny. And you think, how can this support body weight? Because it's so small. But in France, it, they only had that one until 2016, where they brought in the type 2 plate. And, they, the, and the failure rate was virtually zero. And in, I've been exclusively using that plate since 2011. 2012, I've been using the, um, the type 1 plate. The type 2 plate we made for the Americans, mainly because we didn't think they would believe that the type 1 plate would work. The type 2 plate is, is strength is off the charts. When Dietrich Pape assessed all of the plating systems, Tomafix, uh, the Arthrex plates, the Nuclip plates, this is by far the strongest plate. And you go for a type 2, not a type 1. So the one we saw today, three hole, yes. we use that for the small osteotomies. Anything above a 10 or even a, you know, for someone who's chunky, we would use a type 2 plate. The strength is off the charts. Once you've got the plate on. Once the plate's fixed, you can take the hinge wire out. Okay, guys. When do you take them out? When it's he healed. So in the closed oh. So these plates can irritate, particularly on the on the lateral side with the ITB. So that plate will be eight, you'll be able to remove that plate in about two months, three months, because it's gonna heal up in no time. Obviously an opening wedge osteotomy can take eighteen months to heal. So it's not surprising to, to leave it that long. But for closing wedge, we tend to, to say, you know, take them out after four okay, months. Now go to the ankle joint, please. And out, generally out. Yeah, open this, keep this open. Keep this open all the time. Because otherwise we press against it and it kills us. Okay, now to the knee, please. Come closer to here. Yeah. The, the problem is that the rod is, sits, on the, sits on the knee. So it, it's not free. Now it is. I have to bend it a bit. So we are still on the, on the medial side, obviously. And we hold it straight. You can see that we opened the joint on the medial side. Yeah. It's not collapsing there. When we would be holding it like this, it's collapsing. So it would look different then. Huh? So we are even holding it open and, and applying some valgus. Uh, we are medial to the medial spine. Yeah. Okay? I so think you need to do another operation. Of course. Yeah. We have come half the way. So now this one goes up, please, to the, to the hip again. Yeah, now we just do the same what we've done before. So probably now, do we have a surgical marker? Okay, because we've learned this all here already, I guess this one goes quicker now. So this is the joint line. This is the tibial tubercle. This is the posteromedial corner. And we start somewhere here in the middle. And we start one centimeter below the joint line. So let's go here. 
Okay, that looks reasonable. Let's see if we can swing the camera a little bit further around towards the foot. So, yeah, we, we have one camera there. Can you, can you come a little bit more from here so that they see it? Or we need this camera from there. That would be ideal. Don't worry, Christian, you crack on. Oh, you will be, we will be there in a bit. Okay. Okay, we will try to deliver a second camera view for you. I mean, these guys are really doing a good job because the problem is that we change the position. You have to imagine we change the position of the uh, intensifier during the surgery in a sterile field with three cameras at place, plus the uh, stand for a monitor, plus the stand for the, um, for the uh, image of the intensifier. So um, that's massive. And uh, in most of the ORs, uh, where they are trained to do this, they don't even manage uh, to shift the intensifier from one side to another. Adrian, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. The frustrations of surgical life, but you're doing brilliantly. That is really, uh, and the staff is doing great, so that's what I was... Well, that's what I was commenting on as well, the staff, not you. Of course. The wonderful nurses. Let's start, let's the cameramen. start. We go in, we do the incision, once again, like we did it for the other case, just so that the blade gently scratches over the fascia. Then from there on, we start with our blunt dissection, go to the uh, uh, tibial tubercle, try to palpate the snapping of the tendons of the pairs already, all this in one go. So then we come here to the very front, Once we are there, I try to palpate where the patella tendon is and dive behind. That's here. Now I feel that ridge where the ascending cut will be. Kind, but I guess they don't see them. Huh? Can you see it? Uh, we're a little bit too focused on the thigh at the moment, on the femur. And okay. also we got some on the shoulder. So the next thing is then... We'll take Oh, you, you cannot because you have one hand. Okay. The next thing is once again we take our curve clip or scissor or whatever. Once again identify our our tendons. Can the camera just come a little bit further down towards the foot? Now we opened everything. Christian, why are you doing the incision inflection? Yeah, because then the uh, tendons of the pairs. Uh, are not tense. So I can go behind the, the pairs way easier if I can hold these tendons back. See that? We see you're so making the cameraman very nervous. <laughs> hmm. A bit more to here, a bit more to there. Oh, that's better, that's better. So the pairs is behind my retractor now. Yeah. Beautiful view onto the medial collateral ligament. See that? Yeah. So, and you cannot get there without the, um, without the flexion in a nice way. So, the next thing is to cauterize this bleeding here. You've already made your posterior window, have you? No, not quite. Right. What's the blood pressure of a... So I just start now, because we see it so nicely, with a release from here, from the front. Go all the way to the back, just dive with my activator. And, and the next thing is, we create our posterior window. So let's just, so let's just palpate that. Do you think it's, do you think it's worth using a, a clip just to very gently palpate the back of the tibia, or do you think... You can, you can, but you can equally start to palpate it with your elevator, like I did now. Yeah. Next thing is, 
that once again this device comes in to protect everything and then we go to extension hold this one up a bit go in that little pocket that we created and here we go so once again so just he just put the second small retractor from the foot and ankle set and now he's got them but in fact we should develop the thing with new clips so the two clip together I think that would be nice we try to but you know how these things are sometimes try to develop something and then things take ages and then you lose your motivation and then someone else has to do it. Okay, so let's drive over the stitches with the... And again, Christian's placed that wire just anterior to the superficial MCL. So it's marked, it's using it, it's in the middle of the tibia. Can we go lower a bit? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so no x-ray so far, not too bad. Um, you would probably say that doesn't look too bad. I don't quite like it. I want, this is good that we have this image here now. I like the tip of the, of the, um, of the K-wire to be a bit higher. Can be a bit higher. I would not mind. So Christian, why have we gone to one wire from two wires? Because it's completely hassle sometimes to place two K-wires in a parallel way. So you would probably think that this is too high, and I would agree. I think that's too high. Let's diverge from that a bit. Yeah. Um, or let's try to replace that. But it's really without a, a K-wire that you can drill with a drill tip. So there's such it's a small, see small things that make such a big difference. So these t drill tipped wires, you can really, sh they can really be direct inside the bone. You can't do it with a conventional um, wire. Now let's try that we ha find the right slope. That's not bad here. So we need some support uh, uh, that doesn't have to hold it all the time. That's for you. That's so nice. Great. And now we take another K wire. Once again, to always do it the same way. Palpate the head of the fibula, poke have you, in. Have you measured the width of that tibia yet, Christian? Not yet. Okay. Too far there. Not too bad. Looks great. Okay, so now we um, measure the length of the tibia with this overhang with four K wires of the same of the same length here on board, and she's equally not too big. Uh, Sixty once again, so fifty-five. It's the standard size. It's the dish of the day. Okay, now we take the saw. Where's he starting? Where's the start point? Yeah, yeah. please. So question is, where, where, where do we place that wire uh, on the medial cortex? How do we know we're low enough? What's the ideal location for that? Oh, we've had that. That is uh, uh, basically where convexity meets concavity. Yeah. So let's have a... A, a really good guide is the PEZ itself. So the, so the PEZ... The very top of the pez is, is where the wire goes. It's a really yeah. good anatomical landmark. Unfortunately, we hold it now out of sight, so we don't we don't have this as a reference right now. Has anyone been able to clean up that piece of bone that you dropped on the floor? Okay. So I guess the saw blade has come to that point. But to be honest, I would love to have that a bit further. So why don't we just pull a bit on our hinge wire? I have it. And open our cage. Now, very guided, I just gently rattle at the saw. To see we come further to the side and now we are 
really a millimeter to that cortex. See that? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, this one is, is it in? Perfect, very good. Okay, so we've cut, I guess, everything to the back. The only thing to find out is to, or the only way to find out is to take once again a little ruler. This is not half as sturdy as the one before, yet good enough. It's all soft, all soft, nice. So it's all cut, nicely cut. And now let's check how far we've come to the front. And as these patients are tiny, I guess we've almost once again already reached the ascending biplanar. What would you say? Yeah. We're there, huh? And again, it's a, it's a really subtle point, but there's a ridge just underneath the tubercle where he's, where he's run the diathermy. And that's the line of the biplane. And it's there in everybody. You see, this is the biplane where we came from. Yeah. Can you see that or not? I, because I cannot see. This is the biplane. OK. And this is our osteotomy so far. So they really match and meet here. OK? Yeah. yeah. So the next thing, once again, is we take our saw. Orient it the right way. Dive in. So, so front of so plane. now he's he's working with the assistant to make sure the foot is. He knows which way where the where the leg is according to where the toes are pointing. So it's much easier to do this in slight external rotation to make the cut. But but you must be aware of where the foot is so that your saw blade is in the frontal plane. Should be okay, huh? So now once again, let's just take something to open our osteotomy. Why not the scissors that we've had before, in order not to lose, use too much stuff? It looks nice and mobile again, Christian. Yeah, it's not as mobile as the one before, but still it is. And now the only point is that we need to come to the back so we need to dive in between two structures. One is the medial collateral ligament, and the other one is the pass tendons. And as we have managed to do so, we can take a look at it, try to go to full extension. And do the assessment. And what what was it again? Was it eight millimeters on the tibia? Yeah, we need to introduce that a bit further this time. So she's, she seems quite petite. Are you going to go for a type one or type two plate? Take a type one like yeah. on the other. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Uh, very small here. And wouldn't it now be great to have a hint, uh, 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 something to fill, like a wedge to take from the femur? That really looks nice. Perfect. So what you see there is really just on the X-ray is just the uh, the forceps. So now let's just take this, try to fix it. Let's take the first K wire. Sorry, not I don't want to X ray your hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I don't want to go higher actually because of the because of the alignment of the screws and uh, yet I cannot go lower. This is the, uh, I think the orientation is okay. So let's take the first screw then. Let's check the 
Let's check the direction. So that's typically going out. A bit higher wouldn't be too bad. Take this one. We can, can just individually place them. These, these, uh, this is a, uh, a bent design of the, uh, of the drill towers. Give me the uh, wire driver, please, once again. Oh, that's okay. I just go up a bit. Okay. So let's take the long towers. Hmm. Give me a give me a, a a drill, please. That's okay. Christian, just see if a screwdriver in the end of that helps you put it in. Okay, let's do an X-ray and see how the alignment is. Too high. This is once again a bit of freestyle, unfortunately because the towers don't fit to the plate and obviously we don't like that so uh, let's use the let's use it once again for the back and do it really all freestyle that we ha do it under under x-ray control mm, not bad so let's first measure this one Mm, give me a uh, 40, please. Okay. And the next one is a 50 and then a 55, please. Okay, perfect. Wait, uh, we need to drill first, obviously. Wire driver, we need to drill it first. It's just that we want to take these screws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I know. We toggle around this now. Except for the compression screw, except for the compression screw which we use for the closing, on the all of the other screws are locking. That's where we are. That's okay. I like that. So let me take the 55 piece. There's some more live surgeries. I think what we'll do, Christian, is we'll get it as far as the first distal screw and then we might peel off a coffee. That's uh, good. Um, you've done an absolutely amazing job there. Tiny incisions, double level, really, really beautiful surgery. And also, we've been able to take everyone through the steps nice and slowly. And, uh, you know, it's um, been a wonderful demonstration. So congratulate the, the theater team and the anesthetist. And uh, well done, buddy. But we'll see. We want to see a final picture. So uh, that's the 50 then, please. Now let's take the towel again, drill. Hold it. Next. No, no, uh, drill again. So we came back to a rehab question about weight bearing. Obviously, the, the thing that dictates is the femur. The tibia is always full weight bearing and, and, and unless there's some very strange problem. The, so the femur is, is protected weight bearing for four weeks, then an x-ray. But when the hinge is that good and everything is closed and you're confident, we allow them to take weight immediately. But really it's four weeks of 10 kilos, 20 kilos maximum. But when they stand and they're in complete control, they can take full weight. One more minute. 
perfect. And that should be saved now at least. Now we have the 35. The next thing is 24. You can open the 24, please. The drill. Try to measure it. Maybe it worked. Maybe we have to drill again. That's good. Perfect. Now we need a lung deck. So, good question here about chisels. So chisels are fine, but chisels should go in with your hand. Knocking the chisels in with a mallet has a high chance of a fracture. So you want the osteotomy to be mobile. So he went all the way to the other side practically. He was very precise. He's very confident. I think a, a centimeter is a good place to stop. You make sure you cut the back cortex, you make sure you clear the biplane, and um, you, you, in that situation, hopefully then, you have a mobile osteotomy before you've placed any chisels. If necessary, you put them in, but you put them in by hand. That's the way we've moved to, so we've stopped with hitting the chisels. Okay. That's where we are. Let's have a big picture x-ray now so we can see what the final result looks like. Big picture outside? Big picture of the x-ray. Okay, of the x-ray. The, the image of the x-ray. Oh, it looks great. Really, really nice. Okay. Fantastic, buddy. Absolutely fantastic. Well Perfect. done. That looks good as well. Okay, so let's go intensify. We can, I mean, if you wanted to, we can once again go to the hip and check the overall limp alignment. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll get you to do it and take a picture. And so when everyone comes in, that's what we'll look at as we come. We're going to take 10 minutes for coffee now. Okay, so let's take 10 minutes, guys. Well done. Well done in the theater. Okay, down, down, down to the ankle again. Let's remove this one. Can we have a, some, some phlegm? Perfect. Okay, now to the knee. That's what we take. Perfect. Guys, I know that was stress. Sorry for that. Okay, the intensifier can go out, so we win some space. Is this? Can cut this one. Yeah.
হ্যালো 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 হ্যাঁ দেখ ঠিক আছে একদম ভিডিও অন কর अगर क्या चल रहा है वहां पे इफ दे वांट टू गो लाइव इट्स फाइन ओ वी सजेट दे ओके ठीक है राइट एंगल Moving forward to our third live surgery, I would request the moderators, Dr. Arna Palodhi and Dr. Moinak Chandra to please join the dais. Hello, good afternoon delegates and uh, my seniors. Here is, uh, we are going to live surgery 3, that is ACL reconstruction. And uh, the profile of the patient is 30, 23 year, 23 year old male patient having pain and he has also uh, leg giving away with history of right knee injury three weeks back. Now on examination, uh, swelling is reduced and there is tenderness on the medial joint side, joint line. Range of motion is terminally painful and various vulgar stress is negative. Anterior drawer positive and latchman is also positive, but grade is not mentioned here. Here is the clinical examination that is, we can see the latchman is positive and This is the MRI of the patient and see evident ACL tear and buckling of the PCL.
Now plan is the arthroscopic single bundle ACL reconstruction. Thank you. So are we live here? Hmm. Sir. Uh, yes, you are audible. Okay, so can you see the pictures here? Uh, have we started the transmission? Hello, come on. Transmission started. Hello, here. Uh, here is the. Uh, we can see the graft is. Uh, okay. We are. Uh, we can see that the graft the uh, is, is a young taken from the um, uh, quadriceps. Uh, I mean, uh, hamstring tendon. And that uh, went positive. Reverse shift was also positive. On MRI, the ACL injury is quite clear. He's having buckling of PCL. And there seems to be a tear in the middle meniscus. So that we should confirm when we go inside. Uh, we have done the marking. And that's how I take my graft. So we have taken this sartorial fascia. We have given a reverse L-shaped incision. So that's the sartorial fascia. Can you see that? Yes. So this is the sartorial fascia and once you lift the sartorial fascia then in the underneath you can see both the tendons. Can you see that? It is not, uh, we are not able to hear from the auditorium. So your so, voice is completely audible and we can see everything upon the screen as okay. well. So this is the gracilis tendon and this is the semitendinosus. We have isolated both the tendons and this is the sartorial fascia. So we are going to separate the graft from the sartorial fascia and we'll harvest it. So we'll make sure that our sartorial fascia remains intact, which we are going to stitch it back. Don't pull it too hard. Now, most of the time, when you harvest the Please fix your camera. You very clear that you have released all the bands, or else, as we know, that there can be amputation of the graft. So, I just feel it all around with my finger to make sure that there are no bands there. And, second trick is that if all the bands have been released and you pull the graft, it will come out of the wound by at least 4 to 5 centimeter. Then you are sure that all the bands have been released. So I can still feel one band here. Hold this one. Hold this one. So the important trick there is to look for the excursion of the graft itself. It will give you an idea of whether all the additions have been cleared or not. So now this graft seems to be free. 
Now beneath that you can see that third layer which is the MCL. This is the superficial MCL which we have been talking in the morning, how yes. it has been released during the osteotomy. So sometimes what happens that if you are not aware, if you are not in the proper plane, you can damage the MCL. But the direction of the MCL fiber is vertical. So we are using a closed tendon stripper. We'll be taking both the grafts, gracilis as well as semiti, and we'll try to make it five strand thicker. In gracilis, usually you don't find much strands. So we have harvested both the graft and you can see that our sartorial fascia is still intact which we are going to stitch it back once we have done the ACL reconstruction. So now we go inside the joint. Now can we have the outside picture please, the focus on the graft. Can someone focus on the graft preparation? Eleven number blade. So far, kind of. So the bigger picture of the arthroscopic picture and lights is the light on? Can we have the inside picture as a picture in picture inset, please? Yes. Can you see now? We can see the outside picture only. So, the oh, yes, now we can picture. see the second camera. No, no, it's any direct okay. connection though. Okay, now we can see the inside picture. Are you getting the arthroscopic picture? Yes, now we are getting the arthroscopic picture, but it's again gone. I don't know. Uh, I don't the arthroscopic so. picture was visible for a while, but now it is gone. Just wait for a while, we are trying that. We can see, now this is perfect. Now you can see the inside picture of the knee. This okay, is can you see the inside pictures now? Okay, so that's the diagnostic round. So that's how we start. We first go to the suprapatellar pouch. This seems clean. This is the patella. So no foundal injury. 
So we go to the lateral uh, uh, pouch, and there usually the loose bodies are seen here. This is the popliteal hiatus. That also seems quite clear. Then we come back, go to the medial joint, flex the knee, and now you can see the medial compartment of the knee joint. He's a young patient. The cartilage is totally fantastic. He's having a very good cartilage. And now we make the viewing portal. So the viewing portal is under vision. You put your needle inside and decide the appropriate position of the portal. The joint is very clean. So the medial compartment looks fine. We are going to probe in a while. That's the ACL. It seems to be broken. The notch is empty. So you can see that the notch is totally empty. Usually the ACL should be going from here and getting attached to this uh, lateral part of the uh, medial part of the lateral compartment, the medial wall of the lateral uh, condyle. Here you can see the torn ACL. We make figure of four position to see the lateral compartment. So there seems to be a tear there. Let's see whether it requires any repair or not. So usually if with along with ACL we see a tear which is less than one centimeter in length and the excursion is less than two millimeter, we leave them. But this tear seems to be more than that, and we'll surely repair it. So this is a longitudinal tear through and through. And as I pull it, though it is not getting separated, but still we are going to repair it. The rest of the meniscus lateral side looks OK. That's the popliteus going behind. We probe, we'll again probe the medial meniscus. Uh, get a true span ready. So that's the medial compartment. The root Excuse seems to be fine. Excuse me, Dr. Srivastava, your voice is not so clear. I mean, uh, would you please be a, a bit uh, louder? OK. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Shekhar. Yes. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you very properly. Yeah. Shekhar, the, uh, uh, I have one question for you. Uh, yeah. When you're doing this lateral as well as medial joint inspection, I think uh -huh. there is a disproportionately high uh, medial and lateral joint opening. Yes. Uh, did, did it had uh, uh, the uh, pre-operative clinical examination, did you find something wrong with his knee joint? Maybe a high grade pivot shift or something so which he, is, he, because he you can see the medial joint space shift. is very, very highly opening. He is having high grade pivot shift. Okay. And uh, if he was a sports person, even if recreational activity, I would have surely considered a LET in, his, in this case. Okay. But otherwise, the opening on both the sides is similar. Yeah. Shake it. Just was there. It's, it's, it's aging. Joint. Even, even on the opposite side, there is a bit of hyperextension. Can I just ask, is, do you look for a RAM lesion in these, in these cases? So the meniscus seems to be okay. We would look for ramp lesion. So there is this tiny ramp lesion. This is something which we are going to leave because it's going to heal. It's not a very uh, long lesion. The rest of the meniscus So the rest of the medial meniscus seems to be okay. So we'll first the lat uh, we'll repair the lateral meniscus and then we'll go for ACL.
So I change my portal. I am now viewing from medial portal. Now you can see the tear quite clearly. Yeah, it's clear. It's quite clear. Meniscal rasp. Shaver. So we'll try to freshen the edges. So you want to improve the biology. You want to improve the growth potential and the healing potential of this tissue. Shaver. We'll use the shaver very gently here, very carefully. We'll be using it without suction. Wait a minute. Okay. I have totally switched off the suction. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Whether my direction taken. Do vertical. Enough. One here, one there. So we are going to use the all inside device. Uh, this is the true span device, and it can be worked single handedly. So we are planning to do two vertical mattress sutures. So how do you uh, make the decision whether to go for a horizontal first or a vertical? So usually the mechanical studies have shown that the vertical mattresses are stronger construct than the horizontal mattress. Only thing is that here you have to be quite careful because this is the area where the neurovascular bundle so we go slowly into the capsule and you go from posterior to anterior pardon and then we take the bite in the anterior flap in these are sort of situations at depth uh, where I think the neurovascular bundle is quite close. How do you yeah. adjust the depth? So I think it's working. Sir. It's working, I think. So Six. it is almost 16. Um, now, yeah. when, I, when I'm taking the bite through the posterior flap, yeah. then I'm not going very deep. I don't push it too much. Uh. But with the anterior flap, we are okay. Okay. Yeah, but I think, uh, I mean, does the tactile feeling have any role? I mean, once you see that uh, you have crossed the capsule, you stop there? Uh, huh? 
I, I couldn't get your answer. Uh, yeah, does the tactile feel have any role? I think once you see, feel that yes, uh, you have crossed yes, the yes, capsule, you stop. You see, uh, anyway, we are we are doing it under proper vision. Okay. So once my needle has passed through the capsule, then I don't push it too much. Okay. Take Hello. Hello. Okay. Wait, just wait. Sunit, there is a way to uh, avoid the neurovascular injury, especially in this side. In fact, uh, if you go by the uh, critical diagram which was shown by Dr. Rob Lapra, the angle at which you are pushing your uh, device is going towards the vessels. So, you know, this is very dangerous place. In such situations, you should always use the other kind of devices, like you can use Scorpion or some other indirect switch passing devices. If it is unavoidable, you should reduce the number of uh, length, depth. Uh, you should keep it to 14 or uh, 12 or 14. It's difficult, you know. The I, I, I totally agree vessel, with you. Vessel is just Absolutely. 7 millimeter away from the capsule. It's very difficult to know which uh, layer of the capsule you are piercing and which where. Uh, who? <laughs> yes, PS just capsules. <laughs> so more than the feel, we are doing it under vision. And once I see that my needle has gone beyond the capsule, I just fire it there. Yeah. Next. There are now certain devices which has come, especially Novo Stitch and the Scorpion. Both of the devices can be used without endangering the neurovascular bundle, and you can get equally better a better fixation than this. What would be your ideal distance between consecutive suture repairs, like five millimeters? Five millimeters. So we take the part of meniscal tissue also because this is a good quality tissue. We just cross it and I pull it towards myself and then we fire it. We go through the other flap. the question was, what should be the dis distance between two devices? So we keep a distance of at least five to six millimeter between both the devices. Okay. Probe. Go. Go. Okay, easy. Thoda sa aur tight karo. Bas theek hai. Uh, Shekhar, uh, this meniscus is getting everted, so won't you like to put a stitch on the under surface? Yes. And, and perhaps between the two also there is some space, so perhaps two more st stitches at least. So this fixation is quite good. We can put one more. Yeah, 
से डालना पड़ेगा ना I had a question. Uh, the probe again. The the probe. synovium uh, looks a bit weary. It looks like uh, PVNS. Would you take a biopsy in this case? Uh, well, I have. So, Doctor Shekhar, the question from the yes fluid is that: Do you would you want to take a biopsy from the synovium in this case? I can, but. To me, it looks quite okay, but as we are in, we can take. See, though we have opened the device, uh, but I won't be putting it. You see, it's quite easy to put it there. Okay, it's quite uh, in front of us. But I feel that the fixation is quite good, and with the neurovascular structures behind there, I don't want to take a chance. Okay. So we go to the ACL now. Pokar. So you have changed your scope again. So uh, yes, I've gone back to my antilateral portal now. Okay. Okay. I hope you understand my rationale of not putting the third to span. Yes, uh, so what, what is your usual post-operative protocol, weight-bearing protocol for these patients where you go for meniscal so in repair? In this case, so if it's an ACL, then it is weight-bearing as tolerated. Now, once we have done the meniscal repair, then we are slightly slow in our rehab. Though in these kind of tear, I don't think it matters because even if the patient is bearing weight on this, it is only going to compress my repair. It is not going to cause any sheer stress. Only thing which I will not allow to my patient is deep flexion. So if there is loading while deep flexion or getting up from or extending from deep flexion, then it may cause sheer stress on my repair. Otherwise, normal walking with brace, weight bearing doesn't matter. Okay. So what is your take on the uh, preserving the footprint, the TBL footprint of the ACL? Do you take it out, take it down completely or keep it? I don't take it down completely, but if it is interfering with my ACL reconstruction, I won't hesitate in taking it out because for me it is very important to do my ACL correctly. If it is viewing, if, if it is obstructing my view and if I feel that it is going to cause problem in making my tunnels, then I'll take it off. So, this is the intercondylar eminence, the medial one and the lateral one. This is the whole footprint of the ACL, okay? This is the anterior horn of lateral meniscus and this is the posterior border. I would like my, so I am doing a single bundle, so 
so I would like my Y to come somewhere here, which will be in line with the posterior border of the lateral meniscus. Slightly more on the medial aspect, not in the center, because I want my graph to go obliquely from anteromedial aspect to postolateral. Okay. So the graph length is adequate. Uh, is it a elbow aimer or a tip aimer? How much is the length? Graph length is around 9 centimeter. Uh, Shekhar, Sheetal here. Yes. Uh, Shekhar, would you like to change the position of TBI if patient is having a generalized leg CT with some hyperextension or you will do a standard uh, TBL tunnel placement? Uh, we can err towards a bit posterior aspect so that there is non, uh, no impingement. What we'll do, when we put the wire, we'll extend the knee completely and see that we have space. Okay, go. Go. So this is exactly where I want it to be. So this is on the lateral slope of the medial tibial eminence and in line with the posterior border of the lateral meniscus. Do you always do the tibial tunnel first in before the femoral tunnel? Uh, well, yes, nowadays I do it that way. Okay. I have Any done particular everything. reason for that? So this patient, if you see, is also having a quite narrow notch. So I think we'll have adequate space. Uh, if the camera person can show the picture outside, the knee is slightly hyperextended only, and still we have enough space around the wire. Can you? Can yes, you we can appreciate picture? both the outside and the inside picture. Yes. Okay. Yes. Artery. So we'll start with the six millimeter reamer, and then if you if you want to do any minor correction, we'll do it. Doctor uh, Sikar, what is your take on on the TBL tunnel placement? I mean, uh, yeah, how could we avoid the uh, to most anterior? I mean, anterior placement of the tunnel or posterior? What is the I mean angle you should maintain or, or I should maintain? Oh, sir, uh, can you repeat the question again? I mean, the TBL tunnel. The uh -huh. how could we avoid the uh, anterior placement or the most I mean posterior placement of the graft? Okay. So when we are doing this single bundle anatomical uh, ACL reconstruction, then we want to be in the middle of both the pen, uh, the foot uh, footprints of both the bundle. So my landmark is. In the coronal plane, it is between both the tibial eminence, but more towards the medial side. So I make sure that my wire exits on the lateral slope of the medial tibial condyle. So that is the one axis. And the other axis is this one. So this is my landmark. This is the anterior border of the, this is the antehon of the lateral meniscus. This is the posterior border of the antehon of the lateral meniscus, and we come in line of that, and that's where our wire exits. Now, what I will do, we have already drilled with 6 millimeter drill. I will slightly pull the wire more laterally so that we don't damage the medial tibial condyle. 
What is the diameter of the graft on the TBL side? It is 8.5. Okay. Okay. So that finishes our TBL tunnel. Now there is some merit in doing femoral tunnel first because that with the fluid doesn't flow out and you can do your femoral tunnel properly. Now we go to the femoral tunnel. The femoral tunnel size is, uh, the, the graft size on the femoral aspect is 8 millimeter. Okay. It's a 5 stand graft. The semi tendinous graft is tripled and the grassless graft is doubled. Uh, table ki height niche kar dijiye. Do you make an accessory intermedial portal or a far medial portal? No, we'll manage through the same antremedial portal, the standard antremedial portal. Or okay. Niche. okay. But after we put the wire, we'll show it through the antremedial portal. Shiver. Bastika, that's fine. Thank you. So if you can see the position of the knee now, it is almost 120 to 130 degree. Once you do that, then the volume of the joint decreases. The viewing does become a problem. So you have to clear all this fat, which is fat and synovium, which is falling over the camera. Yes. We are not using any pump. It's the standard fluid management with the normal tubing. Paper. Your hand or foot? So here you can see this is a footprint of the ACL, that's a remnant of the tissue. Or else the landmark is you should be below or behind the residence ridge, depending on the position of the knee. Like in flexion, it is below the residence ridge. And then you have to find out the bifurcate ridge. Usually my wire is at the bifurcate ridge or just behind it and below the residence ridge. Okay. Do you plan to use an offset? Yes. So it's a 7 millimeter offset or 7.5? Uh, no. We'll be using a 6 millimeter offset because the graft is 8 millimeter. Okay. So we'll use an offset of 6 millimeter. That will give us a posterior wall of 2 millimeter. Okay. So, this seems to be the residence ridge. We'll put the wire, then we'll shift our camera to the anteromedial portal and we'll assess the position of our wire. Just a minute. Yes, now flex. That's good. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait not now. Okay, go. Uh, where the, you feel the vortex, huh? Thirty. Thirty-five. Okay. Nikalo this. Or, or, or. So any questions from the audience on the placement of the femoral tunnel?
now the position of the knee is in almost 130 to 140 degree of flexion. Shaver. Okay, from this portal, the position of the wire seems to be okay. Earlier, when we used to do the clock position, then this used to be 12 o'clock position. And based on that, our wire is at almost 9 o'clock position, maybe 9, 9.30. Prokar? Now, because of this acute flexion, the skin has moved, so it becomes a bit difficult to introduce the scope through this. Scope. You are now, you are now going in through the central portal? No, no, same portal, okay. and remedial portal. We will just check that the wire is in position, then we'll come back to the same hour and to lateral portal. Okay. Can you give me the uh, first shaver and then probe? Okay. So, are we clear that we are beneath the residence ridge? I'll just show you, I'll point it out. Yes. Okay. So, here is the res... So, here is the residence ridge. And... We are, I think, on the bifurcate ridge only. So are you okay with the position of the wire? Yes, looks absolutely fine. Okay. So we go back to the antilateral portal. Just a stick here. Don't change the position frequently, you know? Hook up. Shiva. Pani change kar this ka? Fluid. Huh? Hey, dono mein hai? Okay. Take a take a rough fine. Okay, well, art lover. So we plan to fix with rigid lube on the femoral aspect. That's a suspensory fixation. And in tibia, we plan to fix with the interference screw, which will be a Milagro advanced screw, a biocomposite screw with differential uh, threads. Okay. Uh, fun, hey, fun, fun, fun. So, uh, I try to avoid one step, and we usually try to feel the lateral cortex here only. So this is 30, 32 going in, 34, 36, yes. So the length of the tunnel is 36. If we take a loop of 
20, that means we'll have 16 millimeter of graft in the bone. Eight. Sixteen millimeter coffee, you know? So for thirty six, we'll drill a tunnel of around twenty seven to twenty eight. Yes. So 25 goes in, okay, and we come back. Once we are into the joint, we'll stop the drill and we'll just take it out with our hand. Reverse one. Okay. Shaver. We just want to check that there's no posterior blowout. Huh. So can you see? Yes, the posterior cortex seems to be okay. One millimeter, yes. one to two millimeter. So that's our tunnel, seems to be fine. Yes. It is quite posterior and inferior. So we'll pass the loop through the femoral tunnel, we'll, put the, we'll pull it through the tibial tunnel, and then we'll pull the graft. Yes. As we have done the meniscal repair here, so we won't do much of cycling. We'll just pull the graft, give adequate tension, and we'll fix it. Okay, pull. Sucha retriever. Okay. Graft. Do you usually mark it on the graft with a uh, marking yes. pen as to uh, the length to which the graft Can will go into the, the tunnel? So, first mark. If uh, our kitna graph is 36, you know? so 46 and then 36. So we'll mark the graph at 46 and 36. Okay. Okay. Because we have to pull the graph first 10 millimeter more than the desired socket length because of because the button has to flip. And then we'll again pull it back. Yes, of course. And this uh, this distance I am talking from the button, not from the loop. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you show them the marking? Yeah, please show them. Can you make the outside picture bigger, please, cameraman, please? Yeah, pair, pair, pakarna. So, yes. uh, this marking is at 36 from the button, okay. and this is at 46. So, we'll first pull the graft up to 46, okay. we'll, then we'll flip the button, and when we pull it back, 
Hopefully, this will come up to this point. Okay. Full. Uh, uh, 10.30. Yeah, 9.30. We'll see. No, no, hath marakpo. 9.30 and 10.30. Karo, pull, pull. Yeah, what? White pull, karo. Aap pull to karo, ho jayega, na? Huh. Green, green, chhod do. Only white. So, okay. what switcher do you use oh. to make the graft? Is it uh, Ethibond or only Vicryl? Here we have used Ethibond, but normally we use the orthocord. Okay, so you can see the graft going into the tunnel. Pull slowly. More. Uh. Please make the inside picture larger. So as it's a fixed loop, so we are not bothered about the force which we are using. So, Dr. Ankit is using all his force. Okay. Flip. We cannot see any of the markings, so probably it has gone to the length to which it flipping would I not be possible, so, but, I think. But the, but the button has not yet flipped. Okay, okay. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah, one egg. Yes. It was right there at the mouth and it has flipped now. Okay. Yes. So we'll just confirm it. We'll, will it pull it from the down? Okay. So you can see the orientation of the graph. It looks quite good. It's oblique, going from anterior to posterior and extend curve. And you can see that there is no impingement anywhere. Yes. Neither on the wall nor on the roof. It looks absolutely fine. Yes. Now we are going to fix it on the tibia. So as we are going to use biocomposite screws, so here we are a bit uh, more careful. We don't want to damage the graft. These screws are slightly stiffer than the bioabsorbable screws. So first I'll check the tightness of the graft in the tunnel, then I'll decide whether we are going to take size 9 or 10. Okay. If it was just bioabsorbable, I would have taken size 10 straightway. The tunnel size was 8.5 and I would have easily gone a size or two more. But we had difficulty in pulling the graft through the tunnel also. So I'll take size 9 only, 9.30, wire. 
So where do you put this wire? Is it posterior or anterior or? It, it is usually posterior. Okay. And what would be the position of but the if knee? You, if you put the wire anteriorly, then the tunnel becomes quite small. <coughs> There's a chance that the screw may penetrate inside the joint. Yes. And what is the position of the knee at this moment? At this point, it is approximately 20 degree of flexion. Dr. Ankit is giving a poster drawer. Okay. I am pulling the graph and going in. So sure. this is a bicomposite screw with variable thread. The purchase in the bone is fantastic. What is the length of the screw? I mean the bias screw? Length of the screw is 30 millimeter. Shekhar. Yes. Uh, I think preoperatively this patient has presented to us with a pivot shift instability, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Now we have done a ACL reconstruction. So will you check his pivot shift to confirm that Definitely pivot shift? I would is have checked. Only uh -huh. my only issue is the meniscal repair. Okay. But still, I'll try to do it gently. Now the latchman looks fine. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see the outside picture? Outside picture larger? Okay. Yes, we are able to see. Can, ha. Uh -huh. So, there is absolutely no translation. I will try to gently do the pivot shift. Valgus stress, <coughs> axial strain, and can you see that? Yes. Absolutely smooth movement and no pivoting. You want the camera from side? No, we can appreciate it's it from here no very well. Let's see the inside picture now. Nice. Camera. थोड़ा सा टेबल का हेड बढ़ा देना शेवर बस ठीक है थैंक यू Just going to remove the debris a bit. Probe. So a fine demonstration there and absolutely smooth surgery so there, Dr. Sivastav. This is the graph, you can see the tension of the graph. Yes. It is uniformly tense throughout. The orientation of the graph looks fantastic. And it is quite tight. So uh, before uh, you switch to the other uh, OT, uh, I would really like to thank the organizers. It has been a fantastic conference. The arrangements are excellent. The venue is great. And I would also like to thank the hospital staff here. Uh, it has been very supportive kind of staff, and uh, especially the NSS, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Ankit Vashne. Well, I am just doing the, you are just seeing me in the picture, but it is the work going behind me which is really, which has really made this job be quite easy. Would you please demonstrate, is there any notching? Okay, that's perfect. So this is extension. This is full extension. And there is no notching. Now I am doing hyper extension. Still the graft is, there is no impinging on the graft. 
Is it fine? So, I also would like to thank uh, MyTech who has supported us with the implants and the logistics for this on for this case. So, Dr. Sivasta, we'll uh, take your leave now. A fantastic demonstration there. Thank you. And you can you hear the all. audience appreciating. So now we'll move on. May I invite Dr. Sudipta Bondopadhyay and Dr. Bhuvan Singh to ch chair the next session, please. And may I invite Dr. Bhushan to give his talk on complications following osteotomy surgery. surgeries and this brilliant ACL. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk a bit <coughs> about femoral and tibial derotation osteotomies. Uh, my complications of osteotomy talk will be given by Professor Wilson tomorrow morning. Um, so here goes uh, a bit about rotation osteotomies. Now, it's important to realize that rotation plays a very important role in patellofemoral abnormalities as well as uh, anterior knee pain. And we need to find out exactly what's happening in the rotational profile. So you need to assess the patient clinically as well as radiologically. The classical presentation is a typical intoing gait, uh, what we call a squinty patelle where the patella are facing inside with the feet pointing forward. Uh, patients or kids who sit in Taylor's position, that means they sit with the W position, are more prone to have uh, 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 excessive femoral neck antiversion and uh, uh, distal femoral intorsion. So these patients normally present with either a patellar instability of of some nature. Stay straightforward again. You make the patient prone and look at the rotation of the hip joint, and thigh foot angle decides or shows you what the rotational profile of the TBI is. And these are the rough angles which are very important to know. So. Femoral torsion angle is normally in positive 15 degrees plus minus 5 degrees. And what you would find is that in patients with recurrent patellar dislocation, where severe patellar dislocation, it is in negative. So it is in torsion of over 30 degrees or something. So you need to be aware of uh, the severity of the profile before deciding what treatment needs to be done. Now, this is a typical picture of a uh, teenager or adolescent with recurrent patellar dislocation. She, she is a 18-year-old <coughs> girl with bilateral patellar uh, recurrent dislocation issues. You can see the excessive femoral, uh, uh, excessive hip and uh, internal rotation that she has. And this is a patient who was, uh, who's on table. You can see the tourniquet attached there. And uh, the reason is she's on table is that she's getting a derotation osteotomy. And you cannot uh, assess this when she's awake because it's too painful for her. The patella just keeps on popping out. Look at the internal rotation of the hip. It's more than 90 degrees. So these are the typical patients in which you need a CT rotational profile to find out how bad the problem is. And you can actually measure the angle of the distal femur along with the hip angle and find out how much rotation component is there in the thigh bone and the shin bone to decide what treatment needs to be done. I'll just show a quick quiz uh, which hopefully will make sense. So she is a 23-year-old girl. She is a habitual dislocator of patella. So when I say habitual dislocator, every time uh, the knee bends, the patella comes out. She has a fairly advanced or fairly excessive femoral neck antiversion, which is <coughs> associated with femoral intorsion. Lot of patellar tightness and lot of patellar uh, height issues as well. So that's her 
examination. I'll see if it opens up. Yeah. So, slightly healthy girl, but if you look at the I'm sorry, it's loose connection of some nature. So, if you look at the internal rotation on the hip, you can see how much internal rotation she has. So, she's a typical patient who will need a a derotation osteotomy. It's a big undertaking, so don't take it lightly. It's a big scar. She needs a lateral lengthening. She needs a tibial tubercle proximalization. She needs medialization of the tibial tubercle. It's a big incision. You need to release everything on the lateral side. So the first thing uh, to be done is take the graph for MPFL, followed by releasing the tibial tubercle and deciding where to fit the tibial tubercle at uh, uh, where it needs to be. You need a C-arm guidance throughout the surgery. Now her trochlea wasn't bad, so she's not a patient for trochleoplasty, but what she needs is a derotation osteotomy. Now when I say derotation osteotomy, I do a lateral femoral osteotomy as you saw today, but the only thing different is that I do a double biplane as here, and that double biplane piece comes out, and that allows me to rotate the So that allows me to rotate the distal fragment externally, which gets an excellent uh, correction of the rotational deformity. This is followed by uh, the tibial tubercle transfer, as I showed. Come on. So once again, that's the double biplane osteotomy that is done. This is a transverse femoral osteotomy. And once, so these are two pins or guide wires, which are at a 20 degree angle to each other. And once you've done the correction, they come parallel to each other. That shows the correction of the deformity. You can see the amount of medialization that has been done, proximalization by about a centimeter. And that's how it looks at the end. And this is a very rewarding surgery. Normally, you get excellent results in these patients. So she's now six months post-op, and that's her function. From someone who's a habitual dislocator, she still has a bit of knee swelling, as you can see. But she's able to do her normal activities, including jogging as such. So from there, the femur has been rotated to neutral. You never try and do the uh, uh, correct rotation into positive. You always bring them to neutral or less than that. I think I'll stop here. That's generally how I do a derotation osteotomy. So every patient that comes to you with a significant deformity in the patellofemoral uh, plane, where there is rotational deformity and patellofemoral maltracking, you should consider rotational uh, uh, surgery as a very good way of sorting these problems. Thank you. Uh, Bushan, yeah. uh, very nice lecture. So in cases of such rotational deformity where there are two component, one is increased femoral antiversion along with the increased femoral internal rotation, so, if the pathology is more of the proximal pathology, uh, what is your opinion to correct it distally? So, the patient has presented with uh, a patellofemoral issue. So, we need to treat it towards the patellofemoral joint. The only time I would do a derotation osteotomy in the proximal femur is if the patient is skeletally immature. So, someone who is, let's say, 8 or 10 years old with significant issues in the hip and knee, it's easier to do a subtrochantric osteotomy and fix it with a blade plate proximally than doing a distal rotation, derotation. But generally speaking, patients present to you at the age of 14 or 15, just after skeletal maturity, and they're ideally suited for a, a distal derotation. And we're all knee surgeons, so it becomes the area where we are accustomed to do these surgeries. I've done a decent number of these and with really good results. And fortunately, it's metaphyseal bone has good blood supply. So I haven't seen a single non-union yet. There are a couple of delayed unions, but that that's about three months uh, delayed union so generally all of them heal very well and once you correct the internal femoral rotation at the same time tttg should also correct by itself so it should it should so but uh, still you would like to add a, uh, you would so this patient that i showed i had to proximalize the tibial tubercle so unlike a pat unlike the normal patient who comes to you with patella alta with recurrent dislocation habitual dislocators have patella baha so you need to proximalize the tibial tubercle in these patients so 
when you're doing that, you can middleize slightly to make it perfect when you're, uh, you're tracking. Once again, we are not correcting the complete deformity in the femur. We're just bringing it neutral. So the remaining part can be compensated by yeah. the tibial tubercle. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhushan. Now we move to the life surgery where Dr. Kanchan Bhattacharya is waiting for us. Can we shift to the theater, please? Sir, we can see you. Can you hear us? Kanchan, sir? Here is the live surgery for 32 years. The patient profile is 32 year male patients. History of uh, giving away left knee, knee injury one year back. And there is uh, reduced swelling, and I mean no swelling. Tenderness is also uh, no tenderness, I mean, and uh, ROM is full. Virus valgus stress is uh, negative, and anterior door and latchman is positive. MACMA test is, test is also positive for uh, medial and lateral meniscus. It's quite obvious as pivot shift is positive. Probe. This is the X-ray and uh, this is the MRI. Kanchan sir, this is Moinak here. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes sir, loud and clear. All right, so this guy, you heard that you had an injury about your back, uh, but the only issue is he had a fairly tribal injury, just fell down, he got up on his own, he did not have a large swelling, he walked home. But subsequently he has been complaining of episodes of instability. He also has hypermobile joints, so you'll find that we can see him, see everything very quickly and very easily. Uh, he has a little bit of tenderness on the medial side. His Lockman is positive. He's got pivot shift positive. And uh, I was wondering if uh, we are going in at something which uh, probably does not have a major injury. But the MRI shows he has an ACL injury. The meniscus, there's some signal changes in the posterior horn uh, where clinically we have not been able to find anything. So. <clears throat> His ACL, as we see here. Can we have the outside picture bigger, please? Sorry, the inside picture bigger. Anyway, all right. So you can see the ACL is all lying down, all here. And the lateral wall is pretty much empty. So these are the remnants of. ACL and my aim is to go as far back as possible. I want to see the back of the knee before I commit on making my femoral tunnel. I make my femoral tunnel first and I will use an accessory medial portal for that. We'll come to that later. First let me find out where I want to put my what you see here is a little bit of PL bundle still attached. We would like to keep it that way. The AM bundle is all gone. With a <clears throat> I've only harvested the uh, hamstring of uh, the semitendinosis. I've got the 
identified the gracilis. Uh, I want a minimum of about eight millimeter. He's a tall young guy. So I think we will get a four fold of at least 75 or 80 millimeters here. 75 millimeters. If it's any less, then we'll take the gracilis also. And if the diameter is any less, then we'll also take the gracilis and make a five fold maybe. My cutoff is eight. Sounds good. And this is what I meant by saying back of the knee. Uh, you have the two ridges, the arc weight and the residence ridge. You want to go behind and below them. And I want to go as far back. So even if I'm going to use a femoral guide, I'm not going to drive it. Uh, blind. I want to drive it as I see it. And I'll also take a quick look from the AM portal to verify where I'm going. So this is pretty much where I'll be going, which is not too far from the articular cartilage, about seven millimeters supposed to be. I'd probably go a little higher than that. Now this is the general area. You can see the articular surface of the back, but I'll also take a quick look from the AM portal. And you see that that's exactly what it is. So we come back here. I'll make a accessory portal with a needle. always need to come above the meniscus and not too far medial because we might otherwise damage the articular cartilage of the medial femoral condyle when we ream the femur. Uh, Thank you. So I'll make the femoral tunnel first. But do you have a aiming guide? Offset? What do we do? Sir, it's out of here. Kanchan, sir, it's out of here. Sorry, yes. Uh, please change the position of the camera. It's not clear on the, uh, I mean, uh, can't we see the um, uh, accessory medial portal clearly? What is the position of the accessory medial portal? You want to see the accessory medial portal? Yeah. Like as I come in from the external or an external? From view? outside, from outside. Right. Sometimes, your, for sometimes your head is obstructing the, I mean, the position. Uh, Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does this help? Yes, it helps somewhat. That, okay. Five or six will also do. So do we have any update on the graft size? All right. We have a graft of 8 millimeter and a length of? Length of? How much? 85. So I guess we are not so, wrong. So that means the gracilis can breathe easy. We won't need the gracilis at all. Yes, yes. So he's a tall guy, like I said, could be at least 80 millimeter and the graph look good. So 8 into 8 is 85, a good one. Yes. So is that Moina? This guy is probably as tall as you. Yes, sir. This is Moina here. So I think this guy is as tall as you. Hey, 
So surgery cannot be made easier when you have people like Rajiv assisting me or being at my side to tell me, make sure that I don't go in too wrong. <laughs> so see, that's the back. You've got a offset of six millimeter. And so Rajiv is drilling. The more we flex, the more anteriorly we'll have the uh, exit of the feet. So what is the position of the knee in this uh, scenario right now? About 120, 130? We have it about maybe 120. Okay. So it also helps when, yeah, so it also helps when you have a long leg, the leverage makes it easier for them to, for, to flex it. If you have a short, obese person, uh, you cannot always flex the knee to the desired amount and you have the uh, We've been exiting quite posteriorly and ending up in a very short graph, which is not much of a problem nowadays yes. with all the uh, adjustable loops available. Also, sir, with a short, stout person, uh, I've also felt that after you apply the tunicate, there is always some sort of, you know, there is shortage of the working length available. Uh, yes, well, I think the tunicate does compromise. <laughs> so, We'll drill with a 4.5 now. So how I like there. So now we'll size it. We have about 38, it seems. Yep. 38, 36. 36. But then it's, again, not much of an issue. We're using the adjustable loop, which is marketed as biotech. So we'll drill a little twenty five, eight millimeters. That minute be like now. Eight of Havadana. So that's a big bit of a problem when you hyperplex it, it crowds up and you know there's not much space in there. So we'll be drilling till about 32, sir? No, we'll drill up to 25. That's the length we want, but we can't see the sizing at all. Is it right? Now it's good. Yeah, I think so. We've gone up to 35. No, this is 25, sorry. This is not like the horizontal over it. Horizontal over it. We'll go a little bit more. Perfect.
So what is the size of the offset that you used? The offset that we used was 6 millimeter. Okay. So draft is 8 millimeter. So 2 millimeter posterior cortex. Back wall of about 2 millimeter left. We can take a look from the and see. And we can take a look from here and see how it looks. There's a very thin bone left behind. That's exactly what we wanted. We want bone behind. We want bone behind, but very, very little of it. And now we make the tibial drill hole. So there's a little less confusion about the placement of the tibial drill hole as opposed to the femoral one. And most people agree that it should be just a little in front of the anterior horn, the posterior edge of the anterior horn, and between the two tibial eminences. Here, you can see a bit of ESC and left hand. We want to keep it there because. So the angle you keep at 55 degrees for the ACL jig? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and the angle, sir, uh, with the sagittal plane? Of the TBLG? Maybe about 50 degrees or so. No, sir, along the long axis of the tibia. Along the long axis of the tibia on the what? Coronal or sagittal plane? Sagittal, sir. Well, I can give you just eyeball thing, and I think it's about 30 to 40 degrees or thereabout. Okay, perfect, sir. But I really don't think that is of great importance. And while we are there, see, this is something we would like to save a little bit because it's part of the uh, PL bundle that was there. And we'll go back to seven. Okay. Hello. No skin. You going with the straight artery? No. So, can do it better. So, Rajiv is going to retrieve the lead wire now. So, we have the direction here, and now Rajiv is freeing the soft tissue so that we do not run into any trouble with the graft passes through. Yes, that hockey stick shaped 
instrument that you use to withdraw the sutures, it is very handy. Yes. Normally, uh, we lesser mortals have to do with the probe and sometimes with the measuring depth gauge. Uh, Koshio, who is, you know, Koshio is always very useful. Now, we'll, just one minute. Uh, just to look at the graph, the, the, the device that we're using. This is the one, and here we have a mark at 36 millimeter. Yes. And this device has a lead suture to help us peel the flip. And then the tiger wire will pull it, uh, uh, tiger air will uh, shorten the suspensory loop. Okay. So, what is the mark on the graph that you have given, sir? 20. Okay. Okay, so now you see it being pulled up. Put your back on the sweet up. Keep pulling, so there it goes. Stop production again. Hmm. Now we can feel the gap, so it's gone through the cortex, and now we'll try and flip it. Yes. Flip it, how that? Okay. So this is like most other, let me do this. Most of these uh, suspensory, that flip sensation never is great. So you have to rely on the fact that, well, yeah, it's locked. So even with Rajiv's strength, it's not coming down, so it's locked. So now we'll have. So now as he cinches the two, yeah. go. That's just the cost of the big production, right? Ah. Assess the court. Akatan. By the go to the
trabalho com uma atitude de sticking out. Too tight in here. You can have a little. So the mark that you see now is at 20. Yes, can we have the inside picture bigger, please? Are you not seeing the inside picture now? Yes, we are seeing it. Okay, now it's bigger. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So the mark has gone in now. Now we have a tunnel there of 25. So we have an allowance of 5 millimeter. And if when uh, we feel after the tensioning and after the uh, insertion of the TPL screw, that we have pushed the graft back a little bit inside, then this can give us an option of further pulling it up and uh, tensioning it by five millimeter more. Okay. So now, let's see, after some robust cycling by, cyclic loading by Rajiv, let's see if we managed to... No, it stood the test of loading. We can't see the blue mark anymore. It was inside. It's still inside. Yes. The biotech is good. We're actually proud of Biotech. It's one of the few global companies from India which has this market all over the world. I think it's perfect. So once you've tensioned it, we'll fix the tibia. in about 15 to 20 degrees of flexion. So we had an eight millimeter tunnel. And Sir, screw size. Let's go. Let's go with nine, nine. We are okay. a very tight. He's a young guy, so I'll go with just one up. And besides, I'll go one up because I'm not familiar with this, this screw. And the length of the screw? We are 930. Okay, fine. 930. This is a bioabsorbable HA screw uh, marketed by Biotech. And this is, this is made in France. Yeah, now that I see the, the screw, I probably could have used two sides up because I think I won't have so much trouble going with this. So should we correct the drawer? Yes, we have a posterior drawer. We are struggling with this. Yeah. Take it out and see. Back me. Wait a minute. You're right, actually.
we've got the guide wire out. Well, the sound is good. Yes. Yeah. And you know, we had a little bit of the graph peeping out. So I think. This is a good hold. Canula. And now, probe, probe. Can we see the inside picture, please? Yes. So Rajiv is trying again to see if we can retighten it a little bit more. Take up a little bit of slack if it has been there. <laughs> okay. It feels tight, it feels good. And there is no impingement. A fantastic demonstration there, sir. Thank you, I think that's about it. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Rajiv Dhan, the entire team of JBCH. Thank you, everybody. The team in the operation theater, bio biotech, the audiovisual, Omlan. <coughs> I have a question. Of course, yeah. the OT staff, the nurses, the technicians, yeah, everybody. Sir. Yes, Rohit, please go ahead. Sir, we have one question from the audience. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, sorry? Yes, sir. Uh, you uh, did not remove the TBL stump, the remnant TBL stump. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? Sorry, what was the question again? You did not remove the TBL stump, the remnant TBL stump. No, no, I try and keep them, keep as much of it as possible, hoping that some of it will, uh, you know, get attached to the uh, reconstructed AC and give it some kind of proprioception. If I find, if I find a tuft of which which can cause uh, 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 some amount of impingement, I'll take it off. But otherwise, I'll try and leave the TBL attachment as much of it as possible. And in this case. There was a little bit of PL bundle still there. So I wanted it to keep it there. And probably a little bit of it is, is still back there. So can we have a arthroscopic um, extension view of the knee? No, arthroscopic view in extension. I have stopped out, so I'll put down then. Now okay, extension Rajiv and I have both strapped out. See that girl? Under to the car. I think the best we can do with neither Rajiv nor me in the, uh, in the OR now. Okay. So now we need a, a thorough cleansing. Huh. Is my extent cut off? No, no, no. ACL dikhake. ACL graph dikhake. I think this is the best we can do because you know we're both out already de scrubbed. So I'm sorry if I couldn't show you that one. Now we need a very thorough cleansing of the joint. We don't want any any uh, this I think is more important, a lot more important than we give credence to. We don't want 
uh, one of our patients coming back after a year or so with a small loose body there. That's because we did not clean up the muck after the surgery. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Cannula. Cannula. Thank you, sir. It's a quite uh, perfect presentation and uh, live surgery of ACL reconstruction. Thanks a lot very much. Sir, join and don't forget to join us for dinner, sir. We are waiting for you. I think uh, uh, now we can uh, uh, move to the dinner for the, at the zone by the park, third floor, uh, there is a dinner. So we can have, uh, enjoy, and don't forget to come early today, tomorrow morning, because tomorrow morning, uh, the first case, live surgery will be the PCL and PLC. It will be done by Dr. Uh, Devasi Chandri, sir. Huh? So don't join us at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I, 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 I,